Norse Mythology Guide Set sail on a journey into the realms of Viking lore and magic, 2 edition. Copyright 2024 by Nolan Lested. 1. Introduction the myths of the ancient Norsemen have seen a renaissance in the rise of popular culture. As you read through the pages of these books, you will hear familiar stories, such as the mythical slayer of giants, Mjolnir, wielded by the thunder god Thor, or even the rainbow bridge Bifrost, which links the realms of gods and men. Norse mythology is more than just the enduring battles that the gods of the Norsemen face. There is a story in every rock formation, a tale to be told from the seas that are sailed. A whisper of a saga told over a stormy night. Norse mythology revolves around life and death. Unlike the classical stories of the Greek gods who live immortal lives and are content to feast eternally on ambrosia and nectar in their hallowed halls, the gods of the Vikings are faced with the tribulations of old age remedied with the consumption of a golden apple from the gardens of Idun. In the face of their mortality, Norseman mythology contains stories and the glorious exploits that their gods have faced. From these they take to heart that their gods have lived like them, with their ultimate fate at the end of times. With these legends told, men and women of the Viking Age embarked on their own stories and heroic exploits to face odds that would make lesser men quake in fear. Throughout this book, you can journey through the fantastical halls of Asgard and the other eight realms and embark on an adventure throughout the cosmos, and read about stories that have traveled through time, and how these have shaped modern society in ways that were right in front of your very eyes. Book 1 The Viking Perspective, Culture, Customs, and COSMOGENY 2. Midgard Through the Eyes of the Norse The Vikings were historically known to be a backward society, engaged in the practice of warfare and piracy, where more civilized societies universally feared their groups. Though the Roman Empire was large and encompassed what was then the known world, the Vikings took it a step further and ventured out into the vast expanse of seas. 2.1. The Lands of the Norsemen The Atlantic Ocean was a challenge to the adventurous spirit of the Vikings, who sought to discover the lands beyond while the traditional perspective of more advanced societies at the time believed that Vikings were no more than seafaring marauders. They believed they did nothing more than loot and pillage communities along the waterways that they became the masters of. The Vikings were at par with them with the exploration of the known world at that time, with their eyes going westwards toward worlds unknown rather than toward the antiquities from the eastern kingdoms. Present-day Norway, Sweden, and Denmark were the lands of the Norsemen in the Viking Age, and it is here that many relics identify the extent to which the Vikings have taken their explorations. From these explorations, they have crafted their stories about the denizens of the deep, as well as the deities that have gifted the Vikings with gold and amber from the depths of the sea. In mythology, what we know as our Earth is referred to by the Vikings as the realm of Midgard, Middle-earth, the realm given to humans by the Allfather, Odin. 2.2. Boundaries, Frontiers, and What Lies Beyond The Vikings were later seen more as seafarers rather than the antiquated version of barbaric pirates, and were able to travel as far south as the city of Baghdad in the Middle East, by way of the rivers that traverse the steppes of Russia, a journey across the Black Sea, and the fabled city of Byzantium. Within the empires of Western Europe, the Vikings were able to establish colonies in Scotland, England, Ireland, and France, and indeed have traversed the Strait of Gibraltar to brave the Mediterranean Sea and the domains of the Roman Empire and North Africa. It is no surprise that the greatest contribution of the Vikings to the Age of Exploration was that of the discovery of the New World when they settled in Vinland and in the islands that they have passed along the way. Greenland, the Faroe Islands, and more notably, Iceland, carry the signs Viking settlements in their sojourns across the Atlantic. 2.3. Societal Structures of the Norsemen There is more to the Vikings than what was chronicled by the historians of the past. It is important to note that most of the frequent victims of the Viking raids were the monks of the monasteries in Western Europe. These monks were among the few people in the land who were able to read and write. Their accounts have focused less on the structures of Viking society, and have instead contributed, if not originated, the portrayal of the Norsemen as a lawless, barbaric society, 
intent on their need to loot and pillage communities unfortunate enough to be in their path. A closer look into the relics unearthed by the long-buried remnants of Viking communities revealed that they were more progressive than other civilizations have given them credit for. Vikings were not only known to be seafarers, but were also known to be craftsmen and even traders who have brought the products of the north into Western European civilizations. Thus the images that the Vikings had in the past as barbaric marauders were most likely colored by the more pacifist outlook of the monks, who did not consider the conquest of other lands as an activity that befits more civilized societies. 2.4. Gender conformities were not a thing of the past. One of the more common misconceptions about Vikings is that society in that age was purely patriarchal in nature and that women had a lesser voice when it came to how communities were able to function. It is generally assumed that the Viking voyages that took them to Vinland and Iceland, among others, consisted of a predominantly male composition. Archaeological discoveries have identified the presence of both male and female participants in the migratory journeys of the population through the discovery of burial mounds. Male Vikings were interred with their instruments of war, a sword and a shield. Female Vikings were interred with their jewelry, indicative of their genders. Further analysis of the percentages of these Viking populations believes that more women than men embarked on the migratory journeys. Though this theory may prove inconclusive, it shows that women had a greater role in Viking society. Women in Viking society were described as free and independent, rather than suppressed and relegated to menial tasks. Viking women were even portrayed as wives to chieftains and queens, or even as the fearsome shield maidens who rode into battle and fended off other warlords intent on acquiring their lands. A dichotomy, however, exists in that Viking women were also portrayed as subservient to men and were rarely allowed to speak at assemblies. Consider this, when Viking men returned from what is referred to as going a Viking, they had to return to lands and communities that were kept safe and warm for their return. This visualization showcases two realizations, that Vikings lived in an organized community and the fact that women had an important role in the maintenance of home and hearth. The elderly females, in particular, held great respect among the Vikings, as they were given burial rites that were equivalent to that of the male chieftains. The interpretation of rune markers throughout Scandinavia tells stories of women carving these runes for other women so that their stories may be passed on. Viking women were then shown to be worthy of respect by the men of their society, and thus were accorded the same rights that the men had in how their communities were run. One of the foremost concerns of women, regardless of their origin, was their ability to own property. Even in the contemporary age, there are still practices that forbid women from the ability to possess their own property. Norsemen were progressive in that the women were able to own their properties, as was observed with Icelandic Vikings. The myth of Gefjon and how she created the island of Zealand is a testament that women were allowed to own land for themselves. Though women were allowed to own land, and were allowed to mediate feuds that existed between families, their participation in politics and assemblies remained limited. The mark of equality between Viking men and women is seen in how they deal with their marriages. Historically, the issue of marriage is seen to favor the side of the groom rather than that of the bride. However, in Viking society, women were permitted to seek out divorce, with specific grounds that must be complied with before her divorce could be granted. 2.5. The Tiers of Societal Classes Vikings organized their communities into three societal classes, the Thralls, the Karls, and the Jarls. This tiered classification originates from the myth The Song of Rig, related to the god Heimdall. More on this poem will be provided under the entry for Heimdall. However, from the poem, we can see how the Vikings organized their society, almost similar to that of the caste system found in India. The thralls were the slaves, the carls were the freemen and the tradesmen, and the jarls were those destined to be sea lords and chieftains, in essence, the nobility of the Viking age. The thralls were assigned the most menial tasks in Viking community as they were assigned to obtain peat, a source of fuel for the Vikings, and then fertilize the fields in preparation for sowing and to feed the livestock. As can be gleaned from the poem itself, the fate of the thrall was to toil constantly. 
The Carls or the Freeman were those who were engaged in agricultural and trade activities, which permitted the Jarls, in turn, to live a lifestyle that they had been born to. It can be seen through this that the society was hierarchical in its organization. The thralls are menial class, who slave away in the fields to ensure that the carls can create products from the harvested items in service to the jarls for allowing them to stay in their lands. 2.6. Viking Acculturation The basis by which the Norsemen had been able to pass on their traditions and folklore is not only through word of mouth, but also through the use of runic inscriptions carved onto stones throughout the Scandinavian landscape. It is widely believed that the runes were a gift from the Norse pantheon chief, Odin, who acquired his knowledge of them by sacrificing himself, hanging from the branches of Yggdrasil for nine days and nine nights. 2.6.1 Runes, a long-lasting basis of communication. Runes were among the earliest signs that the Norsemen had achieved a semblance of literacy. The earliest forms of runes were arrangements of lines and angles, collectively referred to as the Futhark alphabet, its name obtained from the first six letters of the alphabet. Each symbol was believed to imbue various objects with specific mystical properties, gained from the mystical knowledge Odin had received from his earlier sacrifice. Most of these runes were used in limited items and were traditionally found inscribed onto swords, shields, lances, arrowheads, and scabbards. The use of runes was only prevalent among the nobility, which indicated that their use was a symbol of status. Some runes were merely inscribed on weapons to indicate who wielded the said item. 2.7. Symbols of the Futhark alphabet and their interpretation. The oldest form of runes used by the Vikings is the Elder Futhark commonly used throughout Scandinavia. Each rune carried a phonetic equivalent, a name, and their interpretation. The symbols used by the Elder Futhark were later replaced by a newer form of the alphabet, known as the Younger Futhark. The main difference lies in that the Younger Futhark uses more curved lines rather than the straight lines and angles that are identifiable in the older generation of the Futhark. 2.8. How runes translate into sagas. It was mentioned that runes were utilized to provide magical properties to weapons and armors, similar to how you would use them in a video game. However, because runes were, in essence, symbols, they became the most convenient means by which the Norsemen could begin to record the sagas that have been traditionally passed to another generation by word of mouth. The use of runes was as widespread as the voyages of the Vikings. Evidence of their use has been unearthed in Greenland and in the Mediterranean region, among other places. Runes became the means by which the sagas of the Norsemen were recorded, as due to their mystical properties, the runes were believed to impart some arcane cosmic knowledge by which ideas are easily conveyed. However, due to their mystical nature, the use of the runes was required to be handled by specially trained rune masters, who could correctly channel the magical properties of these runes and ensure that fortune, and not misfortune, favored the wielder of the weapon. 2.9. Common Sources of Norse Mythology Because of the runic writing system used by the Norsemen, they were able to record the stories that were passed on to them, from generation to generation. From this, the information about Norse mythology is to be found from several sources. The poems crafted by the Skalds, which by tradition, were passed by word of mouth until the end of the Viking era. A collection of verses called the Poetic Edda, written by various authors, spanning the 8th and 13th centuries. The Prose Edda, a well-known source of the myths, written by Snorri Sturluson, an Icelandic poet and scholar, in 1220. The Gesta Denorum, written in 1215 by Saxo Grammaticus, a Danish historian. Observations obtained from various travelers to the Norselands, including Tacitus the Roman, who wrote Germania, approximately at the end of the first century. The Book of Settlements, which dated back to the 13th century. 13th century sagas from Iceland, which number 700. These sagas provide the information that identifies the practices of the Norsemen before their Christianization. 2.10. Conclusion. The Norsemen were fueled by a spirit that led them to explore the reaches of the known world, and subsequently, the creation of stories that were passed on from generation to generation. The Norsemen believed in equality, 
which was a more progressive thought in contrast with other civilizations. It can be seen in myths that women were visualized as strong, capable leaders and important members of society. This precept can be seen in later chapters as we delve further into the myths of the Norsemen. Particular importance will be devoted to the attainment of knowledge by Odin and the role of sacrifice in the rites of the Norsemen. Thanks again for purchasing my book. This really stimulates me and makes me grow. Please leave a review of my book on Jeff Bezin e-commerce before downloading the free bonuses. This helps me spread the word about my books and therefore my passion. 2. The Aspects of Norse Religion What we know about the myths of the Norsemen is derived from the Scandinavian region as well as Iceland. In the previous chapter, the Prose Edda remains as one important source of Norse mythology. Written by Snorri Sturluson, the Icelandic poet and scholar, the Prose Edda is a compendium of the Germanic or Norse gods worshipped by the Norsemen of the Viking era, 750-1050. Despite the recent discoveries that reveal that the Vikings were more than just seafarers, it is this reputation, along with their mastery of the seas, that made Odin the figure of their worship. 2.1. How the Vikings saw the universe. The Vikings believed the world known to them was just part of a greater whole, which they thought was part of a realm that remained invisible to the eyes of mortals. It is therefore understandable why there was the need for the Vikings to explore the great unknown, in the hopes of expanding the scope of what they knew to be the edges of the known universe. Unsurprisingly, the myths of the Vikings contained other realms that were accessible through various means. 2.2. An Overview of the Nine Realms Cosmology is a term that refers to the study of the known universe when applied scientifically. In the context of Norse mythology, it encompasses the existence of the various realms believed to reside in the universe as perceived by the Norse. There are nine realms in total, each of which is believed to reside in a particular area of Yggdrasil, the cosmic ash tree that links the nine realms. The Norse believed that access to these worlds was entirely possible and that passage worked both ways. Their gods can visit Midgard or other realms, and humans too can visit the realms of the gods, or perhaps the other eight realms spaced throughout Yggdrasil. This section describes each of the nine realms known to the Norse. 2.2.1 Asgard Asgard is the realm of the Aesir, where Odin, the chieftain of the Norse gods, rules over. Asgard is described to be at the top of Yggdrasil, and the topmost of all the nine realms. Within Asgard are the mansions and palaces of the Aesir, collectively referred to as halls. Asgard is surrounded by a large perimeter wall constructed by a giant. The myth surrounding the walls will be elaborated on later. In the middle of Asgard was a verdant field known as Idaval, and around Idaval were the halls of the various gods that resided in Asgard. Aside from these halls is Valhalla, home of the heroic dead, collectively known as the Ain Harriar. The Ain Harriar were composed of the heroic slain chosen by Odin and ferried to Valhalla by the Valkyries. Of the halls located in Asgard, Valhalla is described as a vast hall that had 500 doors, enough for 800 men to march side by side. The construction of the hall was made to ensure that when Ragnarok dawns, the Ain Harriar can rush forth at the first sign of the battle. More about Valhalla will be provided later in this chapter. 2.3. Vanaheim. There are few descriptions of what Vanaheim is, save for the gods who resided in the realm. The Vanaheim is the home realm of the Vanir, more peaceful gods who presided over the earth and were responsible for its fertility and abundance. Vanaheim was described to be the neighbor of Asgard, and it can be presumed that the realm too sits close to the top of Yggdrasil. Vanaheim is also mentioned in the myth that narrates the story of the war between the Aesir and the Vanir, resulting in an exchange of hostages. 2.4. Midgard. Midgard when translated means Middle Earth and is the realm of humans, meaning our Earth. It was believed that Midgard was located between this realm of the Aesir, Asgard, and Jutunheim, the realm of the Frost Giants. The passage between Asgard and Midgard is secured through the use of the Bifrost Bridge, and the realm of Midgard is bordered by an ocean, where Jormungand, the Midgard serpent and son of Loki, lies encircling the realm. 
Midgard was created after the death of Ymir, and was the place where the first man and woman, Ask and Embla, lived in. The belief was that one of Yggdrasil's roots was placed in Midgard. 2.5. Alfheim Alfheim was one of the three realms located at the top of Yggdrasil, alongside Asgard and Vanaheim. This realm was the home of the elves and was the domain of the god Freyr, who was given the epithet, Lord of the Elves. Little is known about the realm of Alfheim, save that it is a realm of light and warmth. 2.6. Svartalheim In contrast to the realm of Alfheim is the realm of Svartalheim, the homeland of the Dark Elves, and also, according to some sources, of the Dwarves. Svartalheim was believed to be located in the middle portion of Yggdrasil, at the same level of Midgard and Jutenheim, beneath the roots of Yggdrasil. Svartalheim was believed to contain the treasures of the earth such as precious metals and jewels, where the dwarves were able to utilize their skills to create wondrous treasures. 2.7. Jutenheim Jutenheim is the realm of the frost giants, and when translated it means giant land. There are varying descriptions of Jutenheim. Some scholars believe that Jutenheim was the realm that lay outside Midgard, at the edges of the world. Other scholars believe that Jutenheim was a different realm altogether, distinct from Midgard and Svartalheim. One of the roots of Yggdrasil is anchored in this realm. The city of Utgard was the capital of Jutenheim, and was ruled by the giant Utgard Loki. An important location in Jutenheim, beneath the root of Yggdrasil anchored in this region, is the Well of Mimir, whose disembodied head lies next to the well. The waters of the Well of Mimir were said to bestow wisdom and knowledge onto the person who drinks from it. 2.8. Nidavellir The term Nidavellir translates to dark crags and is believed to be the homeworld of the dwarves. Not much is known about Nidavellir, as it is believed to be part of Svartalheim. 2.9. Muspelheim Muspelheim, when translated, means the realm of destruction, and it is described as the realm of fire, ruled over by the fire giant Searcher. Muspelheim was one of the realms that formed part of the creation myth of Norse mythology, when its heat and fire met the ice from Niflheim. After the death of Ymir, Odin and his brothers took sparks from this realm to form the sun, moon, and stars. 2.10. Niflheim. Niflheim, translated, means the world of fog. Described as a barren wasteland of ice, fog, frost, and endless darkness, Niflheim was the lowest of the nine realms and contained the underworld domain of hell. Located north of the gaping void, Jinungagap, Niflheim was home to Hiverjelmer, a poisonous spring from which the twelve rivers collectively known as the Elevagar sprang from. The outpour of these rivers plunged into the void and subsequently froze. Aside from the domain of hell, Niflheim was the home of the serpent Nidhogg, who gnawed endlessly at the root of Yggdrasil that anchored itself in the realm. Eljetnir, the hall of the goddess Hel, was located in the realm, surrounded by high walls and enormous gates. 2.11. The Interconnectedness of All Life From the relative positions and the descriptions of the nine realms in the previous section, it can be observed how the interactions between the realms created the sagas the Norsemen passed on. The central figure for all these realms is rooted in the cosmic ash tree, Yggdrasil. 2.12. Why Yggdrasil is a central figure in the universe of the Norsemen. Yggdrasil is an ash tree that links all the nine realms of Norse mythology. Because of its central role, Yggdrasil is often referred to as the world tree. Its geography has been touched upon in the previous section, but summarily, it has three levels. The uppermost level is home to Asgard, Vanaheim, and Alfheim. The middlemost level is home to Midgard, Jutenheim, Svartalheim, and Nidavellir. The bottommost level of Yggdrasil contains the realms of Niflheim and Muspelheim. Yggdrasil is watered by three wells. The first well that irrigates the roots of Yggdrasil in the domain of Erderbrun, the home of the three Norns, is the Well of Erd. The second well is the Well of Mimir, located in Jutenheim. The third well is Hiverjelmer, in the realm of Niflheim. Several creatures populate the tree itself. The eagle Verdfalnir roosts in its branches, along with the rooster Vidofnir. Ratatosk the squirrel runs up and down the world tree, handing out curses from Nidhogg the snake, to Verdfalnir. Four deer roam the branches of Yggdrasil, 
Dane the dead one, Dvalin the unconscious one, Dunir thundering in the ear, and Durathror thriving slumber. This deer forage among the leaves of Yggdrasil, and the dew that gathers on their antlers are believed to be the source of all the rivers in the world. Nidhogg and the other serpents are located in the realm of Niflheim, where the root of Yggdrasil is anchored, continuously gnawing on the root in the hope of toppling the great cosmic tree. Damage to Yggdrasil is repaired by the Norns, who smear a mixture of water from the well of Erd with the earth to prevent the bark of the tree from further damage. As an object of worship, Yggdrasil was said to symbolize the sacrifice that Odin made to gain the arcane knowledge of the runes. This sacrifice was performed when Odin hung from the branches of the world tree for nine days and nine nights to receive the knowledge of the runes. Subsequently, ritual sacrifices that involved hanging were performed in the name of Odin. Sacred trees such as Yggdrasil were predominant in the myths of Europe and Asia, as these were believed to be the focal point of the entire universe of these various civilizations. Trees were believed to be symbolic of longevity, fertility, wisdom, and resurrection. 2.13. Time, Destiny, and Death. These three precepts remained foremost in the minds of the Norsemen throughout their lives. The passage of time and subsequently life are governed by the destinies that the Norns foretold. The means by which lives were led determined the afterlife where the deceased would head toward. 2.14. Time according to the Vikings. It is believed that the Vikings held time as a cyclical structure, in a loop of creation and destruction. This, however, is believed to be an error that stemmed from the misinterpretation of certain passages from various sources. The Vikings then believed that time was linear to them, in that with a beginning there must come a singular end. All the events that have transpired since the creation of the universe are believed to lead toward the inevitable end of the same universe. The actions that have been performed by the gods, spirits, and man have all contributed to a cosmic balance. However, the flaw in the linear structure of time is that there are three sources of Norse mythology that describe a time when the world is rebuilt after the end of Ragnarok. Though these passages describe the world after the cataclysm, other sources do not share the same perspective. The Vikings then faced the end of their times, with the inevitability that they take solace in what awaits them in the afterlife. 2.15. Were the Vikings in control of their lives? The concepts of fate and destiny were shared by the myths of the Norsemen and the ancient Greeks. A shared characteristic of fate was that all beings, even the gods themselves, were subject to the powers of fate. Fate was referred to in several terms in the Old Norse language, where the concept of fate was linked to an initial set of rules that defined how the Vikings were to abide by. Another set of definitions in the Old Norse defined fate as a structured outcome. Taken collectively, fate was believed to be a precept outlining a path that was preordained for a person or a particular event. It is believed that one does not question fate, no matter the outcome. 2.16 the Norns. The Norns were the goddesses of destiny, responsible for the creation of the thread of life that men, gods, giants, and dwarves were all subject to. The Norns lived in the domain of Erderbrun, the site of the well of Erd and the roots of Yggdrasil, where they were responsible for the care of the tree. The three Norns were believed to be more powerful than the gods themselves, as they had the power to control destiny, allot time, and control its span. Erd sometimes referred to as Word is the Norn who controlled the past, as the name is translated to mean past. Erd was the personification of past events, and was the one who foretold the death of Odin when Ragnarok came. Verdandi was the Norn who represented the present, while Skald was the Norn who represented the future. The Norns were depicted to be spinners, similar to the fates of Greek mythology. They were said to spin the thread of life of a person, and death occurred when the thread was cut. Other variations on the myths of the Norns portray them as having inscribed the destinies of a person on pieces of wood, which indicate that the Norns have mastery of the runes themselves and outline these on the wood that is inscribed by the runes. Since the Vikings believed that fate was an inevitable path that we are predestined to follow, they believed in portents that enabled them to predict the right course of action for them. 2.17. The afterlife was not always paradise. In myths throughout the world, there are variations on what happens throughout the afterlife. 
The Greeks had eternal torment in Tartarus, and eternal paradise in Elysium, as an example. Christianity firmly divides the afterlife into heaven and hell. The Norsemen had two iterations of the afterlife as well, one of which was mentioned earlier, Valhalla. The other was the domain of the goddess Hell. There is one crucial difference believed by the Vikings when contrasted with that of the Greeks, and even that of Christianity. Valor and courage are the determinants to know where the departed soul of a deceased Viking heads toward. 2.18. Courage, not morality, determines your afterlife. The best version of the Norse afterlife is often not reserved for the most virtuous of persons, but rather for the person who has died with courage in their hearts. Thus we have the heroic dead, who form part of the Ain Harriar, escorted by the Valkyries, and who reside in the Great Hall Valhalla. This was the Ain Harriar who the goddess Freya has chosen for herself among the slain, and the inglorious dead who form part of the teeming masses of Hell. 2.19. Hell Domain We first described the grimmer and darker version of the afterlife, the Domain of Hell, located within the icy reaches of Niflheim. The Domain of Hell was bordered by the river Geol, where Yallerbru, a bridge paved in gold, was the sole means of crossing the river and the sole link between the mortal realms and the realms of the dead. Modgud, a servant of Hell, guarded the bridge and the Hellgate. Inside the realm is the Hall of Hell, Elgidner, where Hell herself sat on a throne called the Sickbed. Hell had a dish called Hunger, a knife called Famine, and was served by a bondsman and bondswoman named Ganglati and Gang, which means late. The threshold of Elgidner translates as sinks to destruction, and the drapes of her bed are referred to as glimmering mischance. Hell herself is accompanied by her hound, Garm, described having blood on his fur. A nameless sooty red rooster resides in Hell. This rooster is one of the three who will crow when Ragnarok dawns, and its crow will alert the unworthy dead. The third well in the middle of Hell waters the cosmic tree Yggdrasal, Hivergelmer, where the serpent Nidhogg gnaws on the root anchored there. This domain in Hell is referred to as Nistrand, which translates to Strand of Corpses. When Nidhogg gets tired of gnawing on the root of Yggdrasil, it chews on the corpses of those who have committed the sins of murder, adultery, and the breaking of oaths, these three are the most mortal offenses that a Viking can commit. Nistrand, according to the Prose Edda, contains a hall made of weaving serpents whose heads are pointed toward the interior and spew torrents of venom toward these sinners. In Hell, the unworthy dead were those who had perished due to disease, old age and corruption. This was later expanded to include those who had perished outside of battle. However, the general belief was that those in hell were the mortals who had led wicked and corrupt lies. Such was the belief in this, that hell became the basis for hell in Christianity. 2.20. Valhalla. Valhalla translated means Hall of the Slain. The Vikings' version of paradise is built around a tree called Lared, which is located in a grove called Glacier, described as a shimmering group of trees. This area formed part of the realm of Gladsheim, Odin's realm and domain in Asgard. Valhalla was said to be a large hall, which contained 640 doors that would allow 800 men to rush forth at the first sign of battle. The roof of the hall was composed of glistening shields, with stalwart spears that serve as the rafters of the hall. On the benches of the hall were suits of armor, ready to be equipped by the Ain Harriar. Wolves guarded the doors while eagles soared above the roof of the hall. To be part of the Ain Harriar, one had to die in battle, where the Valkyries, led by the goddess Freya, ferried the spirits of those who had perished gloriously in battle. The spirits had to overcome several obstacles before their admittance to Valhalla. The door Valgrund, the sacred bard gate of the slain, was the main entrance to Valhalla, which in itself was protected by various obstacles, including a swift torrent of air. Once the warrior was able to overcome these obstacles, either the gods Hermod or Bragi would lead the warrior to Odin's throne. Should the warrior be among the bravest of men, Odin himself would meet the warrior at the gates of Valhalla. One of the doubts that arise with admittance to Valhalla, however, was the circumstance of death. The certainty of death in a battle does not necessarily mean that one gains immediate entrance to Valhalla as Odin and his Valkyries would have to choose the spirit of the warrior that they feel was worthy of entrance into the hallowed halls. Warriors whom Odin himself would choose to be part of the Ain Harriar 
had to be a glorious warrior, one who had met his death violently, possessed a high social status in his community, and had complied with the various rituals common for those warriors who had engaged in services to Odin throughout their lifetime. This meant that though the life of a Viking may have been lived virtuously, without these requirements, passage to Valhalla was unlikely, and they would be sent instead to the domain of Hell. This is the main argument with Valhalla, as with the death of Baldur, the most beloved of the Aesir, with his death, he was not sent to Valhalla, but remained in the realm of Hell until the end of Ragnarok. He set the requirements set forth by Odin, to ensure that Odin had the mightiest warriors by his side by the time Ragnarok dawned. Odin chose his warriors on the basis that the Grey Wolf watches. This revolves back to the concept of destiny, where Erd foretold Odin's demise at the hands of the Fenris Wolf. Once the spirit of the warrior was admitted into Valhalla, the wounds that were inflicted in their lifetime were healed, and they were able to feast and fight at their leisure. During feasts the Einherjar were served by white-robed maidens who poured mead, a drink made from fermented honey sourced from the she-goat Hydron. Hydron herself was nourished by the leaves of Lered, the tree around which Valhalla was once formed. This ensured an endless source of mead poured from the drinking horns of the maidens into the goblets of the Einherjar. For food, the meat of the boar Sarimner was prepared into a stew by the cook Andrimner in a cauldron that was able to supply enough stew for the warriors. Each day, the boar itself was resurrected to ensure an inexhaustible supply of meat for the warriors to feed on. Once the Einherjar were done with their feasts, the warriors headed into the practice grounds in Valhalla in the plains of Ida, where they could find horses and prepare for the fight that awaits them in Ragnarok. Should the warriors be wounded or killed, they would find themselves healed or resurrected, ready for the nightly feast. This idea of paradise contributed to Odin's popularity in the Scandinavian heartland, the source of Viking explorations. From the comparison of these two domains, it can be seen that a virtuous lifestyle does not necessarily mean that the afterlife would be pleasant, as it seems that valor was more prized, Baldur's death taken into account. 2.21. Places and Times for Worship The Vikings valued their rituals, which formed part of their formal religious practices. It is noted that in the previous section, one of the requirements set by Odin to enter Valhalla was that the warrior, in his lifetime, complied with the rituals that would pledge his sword to Odin. Other rituals and practices are observed to be performed by the Vikings, and these will be discussed in this section. 2.21.1 Ritual Sites and Temples It must be noted that the ritual sites of the Norse were located outdoors. One would rarely encounter elaborate temples similar to what the Greeks and Romans have constructed for their gods. It was believed that when the worship and rituals took place in the open air, it allowed for better communication with the realms of the gods. Groves were particularly favored as areas where the practice of worship would take place. Sites for temples were not chosen at random, as it seems that geography played an important role in where worship would take place and which god will be venerated at the site. An example is a site devoted to the worship of Freyr, where the ritual site was located on an island at the center of a lake with a mountain view. These ritual and worship sites were often indicated by the presence of a large tree, said to be representative of Yggdrasil. Sacrifices are noted to have taken place at some of these ritual sites with the presence of animal bones and at times human remains. Aside from islands and forests, Common ritual sites favored by the Norsemen included burial mounds, where the Vikings could venerate the deceased. This included bogs, where artifacts and human remains were later unearthed, indicative of a place of sacrifice and burial. This also includes bodies of water, where worshippers and objects of sacrifice were ritually drowned at times. Bodies of water, in particular, are distinct, as the Vikings believed that these waters possessed magical qualities that healed a person. Similar to how we would toss a coin into a well to make a wish, the Vikings often placed sacrifices and offertories into these bodies of water in the hopes that they may gain the favor of the spirit or God who presided over that body of water, or simply in the hopes that the water would convey their sacrifice into another realm altogether. One of the best examples of these sites is the Thingvalir in Iceland, where the Viking elders combined politics with religion in Midsummer. 
In midsummer, laws were recited, and existing disputes were mediated by the assembly, in the semblance of the assembly of the gods at the Erderbrun, the realm of the Norns. The assembly at midsummer often convened on Thursday, derived from Thor's day, as Thor was the deity most revered by the Viking settlers of Iceland. At the end of midsummer, sacrifices were often made, and feasts were offered and celebrated. As with other religious sites, the desecration of a temple or a religious site through violence was considered a heinous act. It is expected that during times of war, people would seek sanctuary at a religious site to ensure their safety and continued protection. These areas of the sanctuary were demarcated by a fence or a length of rope and maintained by a tithe collected from the worshippers, similar to Christian practices. Other than the vast outdoors of Scandinavia, religious rituals were often performed in the halls of the chieftains, but these were rare, as the Vikings themselves preferred to worship outdoors rather than worship in a specially constructed temple. 2.21.2 Ceremonies of the Norsemen The Norsemen had various ceremonies devoted to the worship of their gods. Among the more commonly observed practices is the use of a replica of Mjolnir to ensure that the oath sworn or a wedding performed is hallowed by the presence of the gods. Other practices are conducted and observed through the Viking calendar, which itself revolves around three festivals or ceremonies. Winter months was a ceremony observed by Vikings in what is now the month of October. Because this month was seen as the cusp of the end and the start of a new beginning once winter ends, the Vikings believed that the barriers between our world and the other worlds were thinned, which would cause an increased likelihood of unusual events. Often in the winter months festival, the Vikings often petitioned for all people to experience prosperity. Yule, a more familiar term, was celebrated in midwinter, in the latter part of December and the early part of January. Our familiarity with Yule stems from the conversion of this festival by Christianity into the Christmas season. The Vikings celebrated Yule through the use of offertories that were given to the gods in the hopes that they would grant a plentiful harvest for the next planting season. Summertime, also known as Sumermal, was celebrated in April, the month that the Vikings considered to be the start of summer. Petitions made by the Vikings to the gods, contrary to the past two festivals and ceremonies, involved success in raids, battles, and trade expeditions to the other lands. There was no uniformity, however, in when these ceremonies took place, save for the mouth, this varied throughout each community. Public ceremonies to seek the favor of the gods were often conducted in events that were believed to cause problems for the Viking community, such as the potential for battle or upon the death of their king. The latter part was a more crucial point in the community as the interregnum period until a new king's coronation could cause chaos in the community. As part of these ceremonies, sacrifices were often chosen. There were no uniform means by which the animal to be sacrificed was chosen, as various means were employed to ensure that the animal chosen was sanctioned by the gods. Large animals were often the ones sacrificed, and it can be seen in various archaeological sites that horses, bulls, and boars were the most favored sacrifice. These animals were symbolically significant to the Vikings. Once the animal was chosen, it was then blessed before being ritually sacrificed at the altar of the god the Vikings chose to petition. The sacrificial ritual was called blot in the Old Norse language. Once this had taken place, the meat of the sacrificed animal was cooked, and its blood, once it has colored the altar, collected in bowls and sprinkled upon the participants of the sacrifice and around the ritual site to ensure that the site was consecrated. This blood was a favored sacrificial item, and it was heard of Vikings consuming the blood when possible, even from the bowls used in the sacrifice. Blood that formed part of the sacrifice was referred to as halat. The cooked meat of the sacrificed animal was then served to the participants with mead or beer, which itself was blessed before it was dispensed individually or collectively. Libations were offered to the gods and ancestors, and those present were deemed worthy of the honor. The ceremony often concluded with a feast. The ceremonies were a form of communion among the humans, gods, and the spirits of their ancestors. Alcohol was a special drink, as it was believed to open the mind to inspiration and devotion, and allowed the drinker to come into closer contact with the world of the gods. 
Entertainment was often provided after the ceremonies, and because the barrier between worlds was thin, this was considered an apt time for prophecies to be made. These ceremonies were not led by a religious leader, such as priests and rabbis. 2.22. Sacrifices. It is established that the Vikings sacrificed animals as part of ceremonial practice to gain the favors of the gods for a good harvest or a favorable outcome in trade or battle. However, the practice of sacrifice was not limited to animals, as human sacrifices were prevalent throughout ceremonial practices. Sacrifice is a common theme echoed throughout Norse mythology, with one of the more common examples is that of Odin, who hung himself from the world tree to obtain the arcane knowledge of rune magic, and when he sacrificed his eye at the well of Mimir to gain additional knowledge. Unlike animal sacrifices, however, the sacrifice of humans was not made routinely and only performed on specific occasions. These sacrifices were warranted in instances where there was an imminent threat of famine or another impending threat that would harm the safety of the community. More often than not, the sacrificial victims were among those who served the nobles or their chieftains, and the sacrifice often took place when their masters had perished. Aside from the servants of the chieftains, Criminals were often sacrificed by the Vikings as a form of capital punishment. Prisoners, along with the spoils of war, formed part of the sacrifice when the Vikings paid tribute to the gods who brought them a favorable outcome in the battle that was fought. Some human sacrifices were elaborate in nature, and archaeological evidence found in Uppsala in Sweden found the following ritual sacrifices. Nine heads of every living creature were offered, with the blood used for the same ritual purposes as described earlier in this section. The decapitated corpses were left to hang suspended from the trees that grew close to the temple where the sacrifice took place. These trees, though they were the site of death, were rendered consecrated due to the sacrifice that was committed. The status of the victims often played a role in the determination of who was to be sacrificed. Animal sacrifices were often made first, followed by the slaves, should the sacrifice prove ineffective. In some instances, the king or chieftain himself was sacrificed to stave off the misfortune said to have befallen the kingdom. One of the more commonly known and more gruesome forms of human sacrifice is known as the blood eagle, where the ribs of the victims are separated from the back, with their lungs exposed and drawn out to resemble a bird. This form of sacrifice was often committed toward a person who was the subject of an extreme form of vendetta. Sacrifices of humans were often made to Odin, though these were also offered to other deities should the need arise. 2.23. How the Vikings communed with the magical and spiritual worlds. In the definition of the Norsemen, magic involved the ability of a person to manipulate and control otherworldly forces. Magic was different from the reverence provided in worship. In worship, a Viking sought favors from the gods. With the use of magic, however, the wielder sought to personally control these forces to achieve their own ends. One certainty is present, no magic wielder sought to control the gods themselves. It would be a futile attempt. Within the scope of magical ability was the ability to work with lesser spirits and the need to develop a relationship with these spirits, who were similar or more invincible than the sorcerer who had invoked the use of their power. What fuels the arcane abilities of the magician is the store of knowledge that they had, as the Old Norse word for magic is derived from a translation that meant great knowledge. This entailed knowledge derived from scholarly sources and the knowledge attained when the magician attuned themselves to the world around them. It is this knowledge and intuition that combined to ensure that the magician was able to skillfully wield these forces. Magic, however, was not viewed by the Vikings as an aberration, similar to how the practice of witchcraft was perceived, but was thought to be part of the natural order, which was still controlled by the concept of fate. Central to the concept of magic is the idea of ser, often spelled as side for the sake of simplicity. This concept was said to reconcile the notion of side with magic as a singular idea where magic was bound to a person who wielded it through an instrument, similar to how we conceive the idea of magic channeled through a wand or a staff. The use of the side was done through elaborate yet clandestine rituals, which cannot be fully described nor understood, but were said to draw the magical forces that can cause harm to the intended target of the spell. 
Side was often part of the practice of divination, where the magicians could perceive the future and would allow them to communicate with the other spirits and deities who were believed to take part in the predestined outcome for the petitioner. Given the preoccupation of the Vikings with destiny and fate itself, Side was employed to ensure that the outcome of whatever even the Side was used for was meant to provide them with more favorable odds through the enchantment of weapons and armor, or even the debilitation of enemies. 2.24. Conclusion The Norse often believed in the interconnectedness of events, which stems from the links of the nine realms along the cosmic ash tree to the means by which fate and destiny continuously portend the actions of each Norseman to determine what happened to them in their afterlife. The elements of Norse religion can be observed in contemporary practices, yet are unique in that they revered nature and respected its power in how it can shape the destiny of a person, the core of their religion. It is linear in that the Norse believed that their destinies had been outlined, and how they acted upon these preordained paths helped them gain the best afterlife they may have. 3. In the beginning. A shared characteristic in several mythologies, can be seen in how their deities created their respective worlds. The presence of primordial forces often clashes, and from the resultant clash came the components that later became the world known to these civilizations. Norse cosmogony itself is an interesting concept in that the creation itself carries over the theme from the forces of nature that interacted to form the components of the Norse worlds, similar to how various elements came together to cause the Big Bang in our scientific explanations. This chapter discusses the myths that led to the creation of the Norse world, as well as the other realms that came with it. 3.1. An Introduction to the Cosmogony of the Norsemen. We define cosmogony as the study of how the universe came into being. As this is a book that deals with myths, we now tell the stories of how otherworldly forces came into being to create the known universe. We know of Norse mythology from the fragments of stories collected through the various sources of Norse mythology, outlined in the last section of Chapter 1. The prose Edda of Snorri Sturluson, however, provides a more detailed explanation of how the universe was created. 3.2. How the universe looked at the beginning of time. We mentioned earlier that the creation myths of various mythologies shared some characteristics, one of these was the existence of a void before time. The Greek myths referred to this void as chaos, a void and barren nothingness. Shinto myths described the world before creation as a vast and empty ocean. The book of Genesis narrates that it is a darkness that came before the light. Regardless of the beliefs, there is a shared idea that before everything, there was nothing. The Norsemen shared the same belief and referred to this as Jinungagap. 3.3. Jinunga Gap. The name Jinunga Gap was translated as the yawning abyss, a void that was vast and encompassed the entire universe. However, some descriptions provide that Jinunga Gap was bound by two other realms that have existed at the beginning of time, Muspelheim and Niflheim, the realms of fire and ice. 3.4. Muspelheim. Muspelheim was located toward the southern edge of Jinunga Gap and was the realm of fire and if we go back to the description in Chapter 2, The Realm of Destruction. The heat sparks and fire from this realm flew over the void of Jinungagap, fanned by the flames that eternally raged in the realm until such time that it began to melt the icy discharges that poured from Niflheim. 3.5. Niflheim and the Elivagur. The realm of Niflheim was located north of Jinungagap, and was one of the earlier realms that existed in the Norse creation myth. As the description provided for in Chapter 2, Niflheim was the land of mists and fog, and is described as an icy realm before it contained the domain of hell and became the realm of the dead. The heat generated from Muspelheim was able to radiate toward Niflheim and cause the ice to begin to melt and create the rivers that poured forth from Hiverjelmer, one of the wells that would later water the root of Yggdrasil that would anchor itself in Niflheim. From Hiverjelmer, Roaring Cauldron sprang forth the eleven poisonous rivers that are collectively called the Elevagar. Each of these rivers had a name and was representative of the chaotic forces that birthed them, as their names referenced the chaotic sounds, the icy chills, and the storms were associated with them. 
Fimbulthul, Fiorm, Joel, Gunthra, Rid, Leapt, Slid, Sial, Siog, Vid, and YLG were the names of these rivers, and these flowed into Jinungagap to form the massive glaciers that later met the flames of Muspelheim in the middle of the void. 3.5.1 A Land of Fire, Ice, and Chaos the creation myths of the Norse agreed that when the sparks and heat of Muspelheim came into contact with the icy blocks of Niflheim, the beginnings of the universe came to be. There was little activity with the interaction of the ice and fire, as for millions of years these interacted to form mists and fog. The destructive nature of the fires of Muspelheim, however, was also able to create, and from this continued interaction, the first sentient lifeforms in Norse mythology came into being. 3.6. The First Beings It may sound unusual at first, but the first beings that sprang from the interactions of fire and ice were the first frost giant, Ymir, and the primeval cow, Adhumla. 3.6.1. Adhumla and Ymir Ymir, whose name translates to scream, was formed from the hissing and screaming sounds produced when the heat came into contact with ice and animated the beings. As Ymir slept his sweat generated more like him and from him, the entire race of frost giants came to be. Adhumla was the primeval cow, and from her teats came four rivers of milk, which she used to suckle the young frost giant Ymir. Adhumla was nourished from the salt licks that were scattered around Jinungagap. 3.6.2 Frost Giants, the First Races Ymir was known as the progenitor of the Jotuns, since it was from him, the entire race of frost giants sprang. As he fed on the milk from Adhumla, Ymir attained gigantic stature. While Ymir lay sleeping, his sweat was able to produce male and female giants out of his armpits and a six-headed troll out of his feet. These early frost giants were known as the Rimthurser, the race of frost giants, described with their stature and their hideous appearance. The Rimthurser were the personifications of the change in seasons and were among the first of the frost giants, though it should be noted that they were distinct from the Jotuns that later inhabited Jotunheim. The Rimthurser represented the chill and darkness that the Vikings associated with nightfall. They were Tiazi Ice, who later figured into the kidnapping of the Aesir goddess Idun, Thrym Frost, Skade Destruction, who later became the spouse of the Vanir god Nord Jokal Glacier, and Frosty Cold. Others of this generation remained unnamed. An alternate version of the Rimthurser described them as descendants, not of Ymir, but of a giant named Fornjot, Destroyer, the ancestor of the winds. The more familiar versions of the giants in Norse myth were the Jotuns, who were believed to be the sworn enemies of the Aesir. Described as beings that were made of stone and ice, they were believed to personify the forces of nature. They later took on characteristics that made them similar in appearance to humans and the Aesir. The giants themselves were able to change their size and appearance to resemble their environment. 3.6.3 From giants came the gods. From Adhumla's continuous licking of the salt licks throughout Jinungagap, she was able to free from the ice a creature different from Ymir. While Ymir was a giant and shared the crude appearances of the giants, what Adhumla uncovered with her licking was a handsome man-like creation known as Buri, father, the first ancestor of the Aesir. It is unknown as to how Buri was able to procreate, but he was later described to have a son named Bor, the father of the gods. Bor later married the giantess Besla, the daughter of the giant Boltorn, and begat three sons, Odin, Vili, and Ve. Odin was known as the Inspired One, Vili translated to willpower, and Ve was translated as holiness. 3.6.4 The Creation of the Known Realms The sons of Bor were born of divine and giant blood, and carried giant blood within their veins. The population of giants was beginning to increase in number, which led the brothers to quell the giant horde. Subsequently, the three brothers turned against the giants and slew Ymir, the first being, whose torrential blood flow drowned all the giants in the Rimthurser, except for the giant Bergelmer Mountain Bellower, who was able to escape with his wife in a hollowed-out canoe and became the ancestors of all frost giants after the three sons of Bor slew Ymir. Odin, Vili, and Ve took the corpse of Ymir and flung it into the void of Jinungagap. From the remnants of his corpse, the three brothers fashioned the realm of Midgard. The flesh from Ymir's corpse became the earth on which we stand. The mountains of the earth were formed from the bones of Ymir, which remained whole. 
The teeth and jaw of the first giant became the rocks and boulders scattered throughout the world, while the blood that ran in his body became our lakes and seas. The head of Ymir was split, with the upper portion of his skull becoming the vault of the sky. This vault was said to be held up by dwarves, whose names echoed the four cardinal directions, Nordri, Sudri, Ostri, and Vestri. In the sky, the sun, moon, and stars were created from the sparks that flew from Muspelheim. Ymir's brain was set skywards and formed the clouds of the new world. After the sun, moon, and stars were created, the three brothers made night and day. Nott, whose name translates to night, and possessed a dusky complexion and hair as dark as night, was the daughter of the frost giant Narfi. Nott, with her third husband Deling, begat Dag, whose name translated to day. The gods tasked Nott and her son Dag to ride through the heavens to create a change in time. Nott rode her steed, Rimfaxi. The sweat from Rimfaxi fell to earth and became the dewdrops. Dag rode after his mother on the steed Skinfaxi, and his brilliance illuminated the heavens and the earth. The sun and moon set alight on individual chariots drawn by horses. The sun was surrounded by a shield called Svalin to protect Saul, the daughter of Mundilfari, from the sun's harmful effects. Saul drove the chariot with her steeds Arvakur and Alsvad. Mani was the charioteer who drove the chariot with the moon, with the horse Aldsvider. To aid him, Mani had kidnapped two children from Midgard, Bill and Hajuki, who represented the waxing and waning of the moon. Both Saul and Mani could not rest from their respective journeys because they were in a never-ending chase by the wolves, Skoll and Hattie. Each month, Hattie was capable of consuming a piece of the moon, which was responsible for the lunar phases. The moon was able to escape and regenerate each time. The prophecy of Ragnarok narrates, however, that both the sun and moon will fall into the clutches of the two wolves. The three brothers gave the outermost portions of Ymir's body to the descendants of Bergelmer and his wife for the race of frost giants to live in. The maggots that infested Ymir's corpse became dwarves and gnomes, ugly, misshapen, and sentient and as they lived within Ymir's flesh, their domain was to be underneath the earth to oversee the treasures and jewels that were hidden within the soil. This later gave rise to their talent as smiths. The foliage was obtained from the hair of Ymir, and from his eyebrows, the three brothers set the boundaries of our world, to be known as Midgard. 3.6.5 The Creation of Mankind After the creation of Midgard, the three brothers walked along the shoreline of their newly created world when they saw two tree trunks that were washed ashore. They observed that the fallen trees were well formed, and from these trees they made the first man and woman. From the trunk of the ash tree the brothers formed Ask Ash, and from the trunk of the elm the first woman Embla Elm. Odin breathed life into the trunks while Vili gave the power of speech and thought. They allowed the trunks to move and gifted them with warmth and color. Ask and Embla were given the newly crafted world of Midgard to inhabit, and from them, the rest of humanity was descended. 3.7. Conclusion To reiterate what was said at the beginning of this chapter, the creation myths of the Norse can be observed to be an interaction between the primal forces of nature, which in this instance, were fire and ice. From here, it can be said that the Norse myths branch out as was the world of humanity created, and the realms where the dwarves could toil on the treasures deep within the earth, and where the giants stand on the edges of the known world. Brutal though the creation of the world of the Norse may be, it circles back to the previous chapter as it discusses the concept of time as an important aspect of creation. Throughout these three chapters, you were given an initial foray into the Vikings' world, how their practices helped shape their beliefs, and how in turn, their beliefs shaped the way the Vikings interact with their world, the otherworldly forces that they believe inhabit it. The sacredness of nature and their attempt to rationalize the forces of nature that have inhabited the world are a constant in their realm, and their respect for rituals and traditions are representative of their desire to curry fate and gain the favors of the gods to abjure a fate that would otherwise lead to their demise. It can be seen that the Vikings are a spiritual people by nature, and traditional at heart. Despite the common misconceptions that portray them as barbaric figures, the details in chapters 1 and 2 outline the pragmatic approach of the Vikings toward life itself. They continued to broaden the scope of their worlds, which resulted in the discovery of the new world. They fought endlessly in myriad battles to ensure that their deaths led them into the blessed warmth of Valhalla, 
and they sacrificed in the hopes that their communities would be blessed by the gods. This spirituality leads the Vikings to be more attuned to the forces of nature, and this has shaped their culture to adapt aspects that have been carried on to the modern day, such as the celebrations for Yule and Midsummer for one. Through these, one can appreciate the interactions the Vikings had with nature. Book 2 A Guide to the Deities of the Norsemen The conventional idea of gods to the Norsemen does not evoke a similarity to the more familiar Greek gods of classical mythology. In contrast, while the Greek gods are depicted as youthful and deathless, content to remain in the halls of Mount Olympus and at times descend into the realms of mankind to interfere with lives, the gods of the Norsemen were subject to the powers of age and death. They often took a role in shaping how mankind lived their respective lives. As the Greek gods dwelt eternally in a realm of light, the Norse gods could see their lives ended and see the darkness of the domain of hell. This chapter narrates the various stories of the gods that comprise the Norse pantheons, focusing first on the Aesir and the Vanir and the myths that accompany these two races. Stories on the other creatures of Norse mythology are to be found in this chapter as well, to deviate from the exploits of the gods of the Norsemen. 4. The Aesir the Aesir can be compared to the Olympians of Greek myth in that these gods were the predominant force in Norse mythology, and as such, were the centers of worship throughout the Scandinavian peninsula and the other Viking territories. The Aesir was the name collectively given to the group of gods who reside in the realm of Asgard, and can be used in reference to the male gods who form part of this pantheon. A separate name, the Aesingher, sometimes referred to the goddesses of Norse mythology. 4.1. The Realm of the Aesir. In Chapter 2, an overview of the realm of Asgard was provided. We described Asgard as one of the three worlds that occupied the highest spots in Yggdrasil, together with Vanaheim and Alfheim. Asgard was known as the stronghold of the gods and was surrounded by a mighty wall whose story is told in a myth. 4.2. The Myth of Asgard's Walls. One of the myths associated with Asgard relates to the construction of its walls. Though the Aesir were adept at the creation of their palaces and halls, they were unable to gain the strength needed to construct the battlements that would fortify the defenses of their stronghold. The answer to their dilemma came one day, when a large man, really a giant named Rimthurs, in disguise, rode across the Bifrost and told Heimdall, watchman of the gods, that he was a stonemason and that he would be able to construct the walls that Asgard needed. Heimdall conveyed the plans of the man to the other gods, who assembled to meet with him. Rimthurs outlined that he would be able to build the wall around Asgard in a year and a half, but for his fee, he demanded the hand of Freya as his wife, as well as the sun and the moon. The gods were dismayed by this demand, and voiced their disapproval. Odin particularly refused to relinquish Freya into the hands of Rimthurs, and objected to giving him the sun and the moon, as they provided the heat and light that the world needed. Odin demanded that the mason leave the premises. Loki, however, asked that the offer of the mason be reconsidered, and asked the mason to give him and the other gods time to deliberate. The gods and goddesses listened to Loki as he outlined his plan, save for a weeping Freya. Loki outlined a plan that involved shortening the building time of the mason to six months before the onset of spring, as it would be impossible for a single man to build an entire fortification within that amount of time. Within that period however, Loki added, the foundations would have been dug, and initial work on the wall begun and at the end of six months, would have saved the gods a lot of the initial work and saved on the price demanded by Rimthurs. Rimthurs was recalled by Odin to Asgard and was informed of the gods' decision. Though initially disheartened by the lack of time allotted to him, he nevertheless agreed, as long as his stallion Svaldilfari could help him in the construction of the walls. The gods agreed on this and so construction of the walls began. As construction began the gods themselves were surprised at the pace the man worked in the construction of the walls, as he easily cut large blocks of stone, and his horse was able to haul large loads. The walls began to take shape sooner than the gods expected, and the fortifications of Asgard began to take shape. The man even worked through the winter endlessly. As the last day of winter approached, the wall was nearly completed. This was cause for alarm, and made the gods assemble, 
as they reasoned that they would eventually lose Freya and the sun and the moon. The gods, in anger, turned to Loki, as he was the one who led them into this predicament. He should be the one to find a way out of it. As Rimthurs led Svadilfari toward the load of stones that the stallion was to haul, the stallion began to prance as he spotted a beautiful mare. The mare pranced over to the stallion and swished her tail, which caused Svadilfari to break free from his yoke and bolt after the mare. Rimthurs shouted and ran after Svadilfari, but realized it was useless. Svadilfari had to satisfy his primal urges after a long winter. The end of winter came, and the walls remained unfinished. Rimthurs was unable to meet the bargain, and met his death at the hands of Thor. As for Loki, he returned after some time with a young eight-legged colt. The father of this horse was the stallion Svadilfari, and Loki was the mother of the colt. This colt was Sleipnir, and was claimed by Odin to be his steed. The myth reiterates the blood feud between the gods and the giants, and was deemed symbolic, as the giants, through Rimthurs, sought to eliminate the four seasons and prevent the regeneration of the earth through Freya, who was fertility herself. This enmity continued, until Ragnarok when the giants and the gods faced each other in an almighty battle. 4.3. The Gods For the purposes of distinction, the gods listed in this chapter are the male Aesir, as the goddesses are listed under the Aesinger. 4.3.1. Odin. The chief of the Norse pantheon, Odin, was also known by the names Woden or Wotan, and was referred to in Norse mythology as the father of the slain in reference to his desire for battle. To contrast with this bloodthirstiness is his thirst for knowledge, as Odin was known to be one of the wiser gods, ready to sacrifice to gain wisdom. Odin was known to be the chief god of the Norse pantheon and the god of the skies, war, death, wisdom, and poetry. As the father of the gods, Odin is referred to with the title Alfader the Allfather. Odin was descended from the earlier gods, as he was the grandson of Buri, and the son of Bor and Bestla. He was the brother of Vili and Ve, other myths refer to his siblings as Honor and Lothar, and was the spouse of Frigg, Frigga. Odin was the father of several of the Aesir, by other goddesses, giantesses, and mortals. The Hall of Odin in Asgard was called Velaskilf, described as a silver-roofed hall that contained his throne, named Halidskalf, from where Odin could see throughout all the nine worlds. Halidskalf was the throne of Odin, where he sat, accompanied by his ravens Hagen and Munin, thought and memory, and his wolves, Jerry and Freki, ravenous, who ate the food that Odin dropped, as the mead was enough to satiate his hunger. Frigg was the only other person permitted to sit at Halidskalf, Though some myths add that Freyr disobeyed this rule, and from here was able to see his future wife, the frost giantess, Gerda. Hagen and Munin flew throughout the Nine Realms, and reported what they observed, throughout their flight to Odin. Odin had the eight-legged horse Sleipnir for his steed, and was armed with the spear Gingnir, said to have been carved from the wood of Yggdrasil. Odin wore the ring Dropnir, a ring crafted by the dwarves that had the magical property to create eight more rings every nine nights. Odin wore a helmet, adorned with eagles and armor when he went into battle. On instances when he chose to visit Midgard, Odin disguised himself with a cape as blue as the skies, and a hat, whose brim was broad to cover the lack of his other eye. Odin is described as a one-eyed god. The myth associated with this story references one of the sacrifices Odin had made, where he sacrificed his missing eye to Mimir, so that he may drink the water from his well. Odin's thirst for battle is equaled only by his thirst for knowledge, as not only had Odin drunk from the well of Mimir to gain wisdom, he had imbibed of the mead of poetry, and as such was an accomplished poet as well. In direct contrast to Odin as a warrior, Odin was also a magician who gave the arcane knowledge of runic magic to the mortals of Midgard. As mentioned in Chapter 2, this knowledge was obtained by Odin when he hung himself for nine days and nine nights from Yggdrasil, after wounding himself with his spear, Yngnir. Because of this event, Odin was referred to at times as the Lord of the Gallows, and prisoners were sacrificed to him by hanging them from a gallows tree. Odin did not solely reside in his palace, as he was wont to stay in Valhalla, home of the glorious dead. Here, Odin entertained the host of the Einherjar, and prepared them for their future confrontation with the Rimthurser at Ragnarok. Odin was known to have had several titles, aside from the Allfather and Lord of the Gallows. 
He was also known by the titles YGG Terrible, Ganrad One Who Grants Victory, Herjun Patron of Battles, Har One Who Is the Highest, Jonar Highest One, Thridi the Third One, Belig He Whose Eyes Evade, Bolverk Creator of Misfortune, Sigfather Patron of Victory, Gout Originator and Valfather Forefather of the Slain. 4.3.2 Vili and Ve Vili and Ve were the grandsons of Buri, the first god, and are the sons of Bor and Bestla, a giantess, and were the siblings of Odin, who helped him overthrow and slay the frost giant Ymir. With this act, these two siblings also had a hand in how the universe was formed from the corpse of Ymir, after they cast it into the void of Jinungagap. Not much is known about the myths surrounding Odin's siblings, save their role in making the realms and their role in the creation of Ask and Embla, the first man and woman to inhabit Midgard. Vili provided sentience and emotion to the trunks, while they allowed their senses to function. Some mythical sources gave Vili another name, Honer, while they was known as Lothar. As Honer, Vili was known as the god of silence, and took part in the war between the two major races of gods, and was known to have accompanied Odin and Loki in their sojourns to Midgard. Vili Honer was prophesied to survive the aftermath of Ragnarok. 4.3.3 Thor After Odin, Thor was one of the most revered Norse gods and one of the more famously known in contemporary times. Thor is the god of thunder, as was correctly portrayed in modern culture, and is also known to be the protector of laborers. Thor is the son of Odin and the earth goddess Fjorgen. Thor perhaps, in modern times, is commonly associated with the day Thursday, given when the Vikings adopted the Roman calendar, and the said day was associated with that of Jupiter, the Roman equivalent of Thor, as they both wielded the primal forces of the sky. Thor translates to Thunderer, and with his most famous weapon, Emjoner, which represented lightning, defines his domain over the thunder and lightning that flash in the skies. The worship of Thor was centered on the agricultural Vikings who cared not for Odin, as he was the patron of warriors, not they who till the ground. Thor was preferred as he was perceived to be the protector, and his single-mindedness in his fights with the giants was appreciated by the farmers and laborers who worshipped him. Thor was often described as one of immense strength and size and possessed an irascible temper, which proved too much for his mother to handle. He was given into the care of the spirits Vingir and Laura, who were spirits of lightning, to help raise him. Thor was known to have a great appetite for both food and for feats of strength where he could prove himself. Thor was known to have two wives, with Jarn Saxa whose name translates to Ironstone, Thor was the father of Modi and Magni, Courage and Mighty, and at the end of Ragnarok both siblings inherited Mjolnir, with the golden-haired Seif Thor was the father of two daughters, Laura and Thrud. In Asgard the realm that belonged to Thor was known as Thrudheim, and his hall within that realm was called Bilskirner, Lightning. The hall was described to have 540 rooms, built to accommodate Thor's love of entertaining guests and providing feasts. As Odin has Sleipnir as his mount, Thor rode on a chariot drawn by two goats, known as Tannost and Tangrisner, Tooth Nasher and Tooth Grinder. The goats themselves were magical. In that, similar to the boar that feeds the Ain Heriar in Valhalla, the goats could be slaughtered and brought back to life by Thor the next day, provided that the bones were left intact. While this section deals with Thor, it would be impossible to talk about Thor and ignore Mjolnir, his signature weapon. Mjolnir, said earlier, was said to represent the lightning that flashes across the skies. Similar to how it was portrayed in modern culture, Mjolnir always returns to Thor after he throws it. Crafted by the dwarves sons of Ivaldi, Mjolnir was described to have a large head but a short but red-hot handle that required the use of iron gloves before Thor could safely wield the weapon. Aside from being his signature weapon, Mjolnir was used to consecrate weddings and burials, and was the instrument used to resurrect his goats once slaughtered. This was not the only item in Thor's armory, as Thor himself had the iron gloves that helped him wield Mjolnir and crush boulders, and a belt of strength known as Megingardr, which augmented his already tremendous strength. The worship of Thor was popular throughout northern and central Europe, and similar to Zeus of the Greek myths, the oak trees in the forests were deemed sacred to Thor. Rituals associated with the worship of Thor involved the creation of a wooden oak chair with high backs to ensure that lightning did not strike the house where the chairs were located. Because Thor had power over the weather, Thor was known to ensure the fertility of the harvests of the farmers. 
In the hands of Thor, Njolnir was the greatest weapon the Aesir had to combat the threat of the giants. A myth narrates the events that centered around the theft of Mjolnir. 4.3.4 The Theft of Mjolnir Thor was known to be inseparable from Mjolnir, and with its disappearance, Thor flew into a rage. Loki realized that this was not the time for trickery, and sought to help Thor locate the missing weapon. After borrowing the falcon feathers that enabled Loki to fly, Loki went to Jotunheim, the realm of the giants. In Jotunheim, Loki saw the king of the frost giants Thrym, forging leashes of gold for his hounds. Thrym welcomed him, and Loki questioned if Thrym knew the whereabouts of Thor's hammer, where Thrym admitted to its theft, and revealed that it was hidden deep in the earth, and provided that to ransom the hammer he would take the hand of Freya in marriage. Loki, horrified at the prospect of sending Freya to the realm of the giants and seeing her married to Thrym, flew back to Asgard and informed Thor of what had been revealed to him. Both Thor and Loki informed Freya of what Thrym demanded as his ransom, where Freya, angered, broke the clasp of her necklace, the Brisingamen, and stated that she would not be wed to the giant. The gods communed to come up with a plan, as they would be vulnerable to attacks by the giants if they found out that Mjolnir itself was missing. Heimdall provided the solution and suggested that Thor dress himself up as Freya and meet Thrym at the place where the wedding was to take place. Though initially a source of ridicule, the sight of Thor dressed in bridal clothes enraged the god, he gradually got accustomed to the idea, as it was the most logical plan there was. Thor allowed the goddesses to enrobe him in a long dress and his head covered by a veil. Freya lent the Brisingamen necklace to clasp around Thor's neck, and jewels covered his chest while a chain of keys encircled his waist to add authenticity to the attire. Loki was to accompany Thor disguised as the bridesmaid. On Thor's chariot, the two headed toward Jotunheim. When Thrym found out that Freya was on her way, he was exultant and ordered his hall in Jotunheim to be prepared for his new bride and a feast to be celebrated. Earlier, it was mentioned that Thor had a great appetite for food, and this was seen by Thrym as he saw Freya consuming large quantities of meat and fish and numerous goblets of mead. Loki explained this behavior and said that Freya had fasted for the past eight days as she prepared herself to meet her groom. Thrym readily accepted this explanation and was excited by it. Lifting the veil to kiss his future bride, Thrym saw that his bride had red eyes and was initially dismayed. Loki explained that his bride was unable to sleep for eight nights, as she anxiously awaited her night when they could become a couple. At this proclamation, Thrym commanded that Mjolnir be summoned to him, in deference to the custom of its use in the consecration of the wedding ceremony, as it was usual for the Vikings to invoke the use of Mjolnir at a wedding. With the hammer in his grasp, Thor removed his veil and readily slew the giants. 4.3.5 the fishing trip of Thor and Hymir. Another myth associated with Thor is centered on a fishing expedition. The myth is so popular that it has even reached the shores of England, where there are depictions of Thor fishing with the head of an ox and reeling in Jormungand, the Midgard serpent. The myth begins with the narration of how the Aesir enjoyed all manners of feasts, and how they continually planned a new feast after the end of a more recent one. Through the use of the magic of the runes, it was revealed that the next location of their feast was to be in the realm of Agur, the deity of the sea, who with his wife Ran, lived beneath the seething waters of the ocean. Though Agur was known for his hospitality, he said that he had no cauldron that was capacious enough to brew sufficient quantities of ale for the Aesir. Tyr, the god of war, states that he knew where to find such a cauldron, and together with Thor, headed to Jotunheim to locate Hymir a giant who lived eastwards from the spring of Elevagar. At Hymir's home, a giantess aided them, welcoming Tyr as her son and Thor as a guest. She volunteered to give them a hand, and asked them to take up residence under the largest cauldron in Hymir's room. Hymir entered his home, and immediately detected that there were strangers in his household. The giantess explained that Tyr was visiting, and he brought a guest, adding that both were hiding beneath the largest cauldron in the hall, nervous at the sight of Hymir. Hymir's glance caused the pillars and cauldrons to shatter, however the largest cauldron remained whole, and from under it Tyr and Thor crawled out. Hymir, upon the sight of Thor, ordered that three oxen be slaughtered for their consumption. With Thor's legendary appetite, he consumed two of the three oxen. 
As Hymir was about to ask more oxen to be slain, Thor suggested that they fish for the next meal instead. Here, the versions of the myth begin to vary, as some versions narrate that there was no fish caught in the initial journey into the sea. Other versions state that Thor beheaded a large ox named Himenbriader, Skybellower, to prepare for the fishing trip, and used its head to bait his fishing hook. At sea, Hymir was able to haul out two whales. Thor then cast his line and was able to hook the Midgard serpent, Jormungand, with the ox's head in its mouth. This sight terrified Hymir. Thor however remained steadfast and continued flinging his hammer at the head of the serpent until Hymir gave in to his fear and severed the line, letting the beast return beneath the water, bleeding. Shaken by the encounter, Hymir hastened back to shore and tested Thor's strength by tasking him with the transport of the whales back into his home. Thor was able to carry the whales and the boat back to Hymir's house. Discontent, Hymir sought to test out Thor's mighty prowess and asked him to break a goblet. Though Thor hurled the goblet onto various surfaces, the giantess who aided him and Tyr earlier advised Thor to hurl the goblet onto Hymir's head, the hardest object around. Only then did the goblet shatter, but Hymir's head remained intact. Hymir agreed to let them have the cauldron, provided that it could be lifted. Tyr was unable to lift it, but Thor was able to easily lift the cauldron and prepared to carry it back to Aegir's feast. Hymir and the other giants attacked, whereby Thor easily slew Hymir and the rest of his allies. The cauldron was readily conveyed back to Aegir, who brewed enough ale for many nights onwards. Other myths that concern Thor and the giants will be discussed later in his encounters with the Jotun. 4.3.6 Thor and Alvis While Thor is often seen with the use of brute force to achieve his immediate goals, Thor was able to use trickery to save his daughter from marriage to a dwarf. Alvis, whose name translates to Allwise, was promised the hand of Thrud, daughter of Thor and Seif, in marriage, as payment for the weapons he had forged for the gods. Thor was displeased at the prospect of his daughter marrying a dwarf, and commented that Alvis was rather pale, and looked unfit to marry his daughter. Alvis contended that he lived beneath the earth, and that his pale complexion could not be helped. He repeated the agreement made between him and the gods, and requested that the agreement be honored. Thor remarked that he was not consulted about the said agreement, as it involved his daughter, and that his consent was not obtained. Thor continued by saying that Alvis had not done anything to convince Thor that he was suitable enough to marry Thrud. Alvis was pleased to ask what could be done to persuade Thor to allow him to marry his daughter. Thor knew that Alvis, like the other dwarves, liked to display great feats of knowledge and exploited this weakness. Thor questioned him as to the different names given by men, the gods, the giants, and the dwarves and elves to the thirteen most important concepts to the Norsemen, earth, heaven, moon, sun, the heavenly bodies important to the Vikings, clouds, wind, calm, main, sea, which were portents of their weather, and fire, wood, night, seed, and ale, the essential items for Viking life. All this was able to answer each question Thor posed, though he was exhausted from his efforts at the end of the test. Though admittedly impressed with the extent of all this knowledge, Thor revealed that the test was a ruse to buy him time by which the sun had risen over Asgard and turned Alvis into stone. 4.3.7 Baldur Baldur, also spelled Baldur or Baldur, was described as the most beloved of all the Aesir, as well as the bleeding god. Descended of Odin and Frigg, Baldur was the deity who embodied innocence and piety, and was often depicted as one who continually shone due to the fairness of his appearance. Baldur was not only the most beloved of the gods. He was possessed of wisdom, eloquence, gentleness, and leniency. His righteousness was such that he could not be shaken from his verdict when he passed his judgments. Baldur's Hall in Asgard is called Breidablik, described by Snorri Sturluson as the fairest of all the halls in Asgard, where nothing impure may dwell. Baldur's wife was the goddess Nanna, and they were the parents of Forseti, who inherited his father's predisposition to justice. The myths that surround Baldur are among the most consistent and detailed in their account. The death of Baldur was among the events that presaged Ragnarok, and his death will be discussed in the later chapters as part of Ragnarok. Despite his death however, it was prophesied that Baldur, together with his blind brother and killer Hodor, would be resurrected and join the survivors in the creation of a new world. Baldur's death and resurrection carry similarities to resurrection myths and traditions throughout the world 
King Arthur's return from Avalon, the resurrection of Jesus in Roman Catholicism, the arrival of Kalkin, the tenth and final avatar of Vishnu, in that he would return to reign over the world after the end of times. 4.3.8. Hoder. Hoder was simply known as the blind god, the son of Odin and Frigg, and the brother to Balder. Hoder, or Hoder, has few myths associated with him, save for his involvement in the death of Balder, through the manipulation of Loki. After Hoder unwittingly killed Balder, the gods turned on him in shock and anger and he was dispatched to hell alongside his brother. Hoder and Balder eventually reconcile, and are prophesied to walk the world after Ragnarok, having been resurrected. 4.3.9. Bragi. Bragi was known as the Norse god of poetry, expressiveness, and songs. Bragi was descended from Odin and the giantess Gunlod, born after a night of seduction, where Odin seduced Gunlod to acquire the mead of poetry. Gunlod gave birth to him in a cave with glittering stalactites and later set him adrift, where the dwarves gave him a harp to sing the song of the heavens. Bragi was married to Idun, the goddess who kept watch over the apples that restored the youth and power of the gods. Because of Bragi's affinity with poetry, the Norsemen referred to their poets and poetesses as Bragamen or Bragawomen. A more familiar application of his name would be the verb brag, which meant to boast loudly about what one has achieved. After the death of Balder, Loki returned to Asgard, where Bragi mentioned that Loki was an unwelcome visitor. Loki, angered, called Bragi a braggart, whereby an exchange of words ensued, culminating with Bragi threatening to twist Loki's head to ensure that he spoke no more lies. Despite Odin's best attempts, Loki's rage only grew. Then he prophesied the fall of the gods and left Asgard. Bragi sometimes took the place of Hermod in Valhalla to welcome the spirits of the fallen warriors, whom Odin had chosen to form part of his Ain Harriar. Bragi was depicted as an old bearded man with a harp, and oaths sworn by the Vikings were said to be sworn over the cup of Bragi. 4.3.10 Loki Loki is notably known to be the deity who deals with tricks, the god of mischief, and the originator of lies and deception. Loki is often identified with the aspect of fire, where he represents two sides, the fire of the home, both useful and potentially destructive, and the fires of nature, a potent and uncontrollable force of destruction. Unlike the rest of the Aesir, who were descended fully or partially from the gods, Loki was the child of the giants. His father was Farbauti, cruel striker, and his mother was Lafi, leaf island. Loki had two spouses, Angerboda, a frost giantess with whom he fathered three terrifying children, Hel, the guardian of death, the Fenris wolf, and Jormungand, the snake who would grow large enough to encircle the earth. Sigyn was his wife in Asgard, who was the mother of his sons, Vali and Narvi. Despite his giant ancestry, Loki remained close to Odin, for reasons unknown, though it is believed in some myths that there was a blood oath. Regardless of the reason, no harm befell Loki, despite the provocations that took place at times. Unlike his frost giant ancestors, Loki was depicted as an attractive person, and was often known for his quick wit. Earlier, it was mentioned how Loki was involved in the construction of the walls of Asgard, as well as his role in the recovery of Mjolnir from the hands of Thrym. Loki was capable of creating laughter, as he was able to amuse the frost giantess Skadi after the death of her father Tiasi. Despite his cunning, some of his solutions relied on deception, which the Aesir frowned upon, especially when Thor was forced to slay Rimthurs the wall builder in Asgard itself. Conversely, his trickster tendencies led to less amusing results, such as the theft of Freya's Brisingamen necklace and the cutting of Seif's golden hair. Loki did remedy these, however, when he went to the dwarves and bargained with them to craft treasures for the gods, several of which proved useful on later occasions. His deception remains part of his characteristics, such as his role in the rape of Idun and the death of the giant Tiasi. Loki was also known to be a shapeshifter, and could alter his appearance to resemble animals, as well as other humans, regardless of age and gender. Earlier, we have seen Loki take on the form of a mare that Svadilfari was enchanted with enough to gallop away from his master to stop the completion of Asgard's walls. This shape-shifting ability played a crucial role in the death of Balder, as he used this ability to cajole Frigga into the revelation of Balder's one weakness, 
and in another form, ensured that Hell would keep Balder until the end of time. Loki gradually turned from the mischievous and tricky god to one who was inexorably evil, and with that evolution, the Aesir sought to punish him. It was prophesied that Loki would lead the giants and the dead on a boat made of fingernails, at the end of times, to the final battle, where he and Heimdall would fall to each other. 4.3.11 Loki's Punishment After the insults delivered by Loki to the gods and goddesses of the Aesir, Loki initially sought to escape from their justice, and hid in a hut with four doors to ensure that he had a path of escape. When Odin, from his throne in Halidskalf was able to determine where Loki hid and in what shape he was under, Odin and a host of gods hastened down to capture Loki, who immediately changed into a salmon and fled. Kvasir, who was wise, noted that a net that Loki left behind would be used to capture someone disguised as a fish. The net served as an ample distraction, as it was used to trawl the riverbed, as it was Thor who captured Loki by the tail as he attempted to leap over the net. It is because of Thor's grip, that the Norsemen believed was the reason why Salmon had a slimmer tail. Now that Loki was finally captured, he was brought to a dark cave. Loki's sons by Sigyn, Vali, and Narvi were used as a means to bind him. Vali was changed into a wolf, and in this form he attacked Narvi and killed him. Narvi's intestines were taken and used by the gods to bind Loki, where his son's remains were turned into iron bonds. Skadi, the daughter of Tiasi, whom Loki had killed through his plans, fastened a snake directly overhead Loki and ensured that the poison of the snake would drip upon Loki's face. Despite all that transpired, Sigyn remained faithful to Loki and stayed in the cave with a bowl to catch the venom that dripped from the snake. However, as she turns to empty the bowl, the snake venom that did make it to Loki's face caused him to writhe in his bonds in agony. According to the Norsemen, this was the myth behind earthquakes, and there Loki would remain until Ragnarok came. Loki's involvement in the death of Baldur will be discussed later in the section of Baldur's death. 4.3.12 Heimdall Heimdall or Heimdallr was known to be the watchman of the gods and was said to be the son of Odin, and under mysterious circumstances, nine mothers believed in the waves and the daughters of Agur. Heimdall was described to be a tall and attractive god with a bright smile, believed to be a result of his golden teeth, and was given the name Gullantani. Heimdall was known to be a bright god, the shining one, the god of light, and the white god due to his brilliance. Heimdall possessed the Jallarhorn, an immense horn that when blown by Heimdall, can be heard throughout the Nine Realms and was one of the signals that heralded the start of Ragnarok. As Odin had Sleipnir and Thor had his goats, Heimdall had his steed Gultop Golden Tuft, and was armed with the sword Hofund. Heimdall's hall in Asgard was called Himinbjörg, translated to Cliffs of Heaven. What set apart Heimdall from the other Aesir were his senses. Heimdall was possessed of a keen sight that enabled him to see a hundred miles around him. Some mythical accounts say that Heimdall's gift of sight goes further, allowing him second sight and enabling him to look into the future. Heimdall's sense of hearing was so acute that it is said that he could hear the heartbeat of a butterfly in Midgard, and hear the sound of growing grass and thickening wool on a sheep. The sensory abilities of Heimdall are such that Heimdall needed little sleep, as he was constantly awake and alert, as befits his role as the watchman of the gods. Aside from his keen sensory abilities, Heimdall was also clever, as it was his idea to dress Thor as a bride to recover Mjolnir from the hands of Thrym. With his sight, Heimdall was able to detect Loki's attempt to steal the Brisingamen necklace of Freya, and exhibiting the powers of shape-shifting, changed into a seal and fought Loki to obtain the necklace. This enmity between him and Loki lasted until Ragnarok, where both would fall at each other's hands. 4.3.13 Heimdall's birth. Earlier, it was mentioned that Heimdall was born to nine maidens and Odin. The myth narrates that Odin was walking along the shoreline when he came across nine comely giantesses. These giantesses represented the waves and were the daughters of the sea Lord Agur and his wife Ran. They were known as Alta Fury, Agia, she who scatters sand, Orjifa, she who overwhelms with her pain, Egia, she who creates foam, Jalp, she who howls, Grape, she who grabs, Jarn Saxa, one of Thor's future wives, Cinder, the embodiment of twilight, and Ulfram, the she wolf. Odin was captivated by their beauty and married all nine, from whom Heimdall was born. His mothers nourished Heimdall with the use of the forces of nature. 
He derived his strength from the earth, moisture from the sea was his drink, and he grew in the heat of the sun. This diet was of a sufficient quality that Heimdall quickly grew, and was soon able to head to Asgard, where he was endowed with his keen senses, and was gifted the Jollerhorn, and made the sentinel of the bridge, Bifrost, the link between Asgard and Midgard. 4.3.14 Heimdall and the Social Classes One of the more important roles that Heimdall had played in Norse mythology, apart from his role as the Watchman of the Gods, was his role in the creation of the social classes of the Viking communities. The myth comes from the Song of Rig and details how Heimdall descended from the heavens to create the social classes. Just as Odin, Thor and Loki sometimes venture into Midgard, Heimdall did so and disguised himself as a mortal man named Rig, king. It must be noted that at the time Heimdall descended into Midgard, humanity had no direction and had no means to organize themselves properly, as they knew not what to do, whom to work for, or why they should work. Heimdall, just as he came up with the solution to recover Thor's hammer, also came up with a means to resolve these issues through the creation of societal classes, where each class is responsible for specific tasks. As Rig Heimdall walked the pathways until he came upon a small hut, where I great-grandfather and Edda great-grandmother dwelt. The couple invited Rig in to have a meal with them, and spend the night in their hovel. After a repast of coarse black bread, which was not sufficient for their needs, I and Etta went to sleep. Rig persuaded them to let him sleep between them. This arrangement lasted for three nights until Rig left them. Etta discovered that she was with child and birthed a son who was called Thrall Farmhand. Thrall was described as an ugly child with rough skin, oversized extremities, twisted fingers and toes, and a hunched back. Despite his physical appearance, Thrall was strong and readily took to manual labor. Thrall married their bondswoman, who had crooked legs, arms that were sunburned, and a nose that was set flat. The two of them had sons who were known by the names Noisy, Roughneck, and Horsefly, and daughters called Lazybones, Fatty, and Beanpole. From these children, the social class of Thralls was descended, the laborers of the community. Rig came upon the second house of a larger size and built with care and artistry. When he knocked on the door, he was welcomed by a couple named Afi, Grandfather, and Ama, Grandmother. Afi carved wood for a living and Ama spun and wove cloth. Both were groomed properly and dressed as befitted their means. A chest of their possessions was located at the end of their hall. With the same means he employed in the previous house he had visited, Rig enjoyed a repast of boiled veal, vegetables and wine, and convinced the couple to let him sleep in between them. Ama found herself pregnant, and nine months later she birthed a boy, whom they named Carl whose name meant Freeman. Carl had a ruddy complexion and bright eyes, and became a master craftsman and plowman as he grew into adulthood. Carl later married a woman named Snore, whose name meant daughter-in-law, described as a beautiful lady who dressed nicely. They begat children whose names were Strongbeard, Smith, and Husbandman, and daughters who were just as fair named Maiden, Capable, and Prettyface. From these children, the class of professionals, craftsmen and tradesmen, arose. These descendants ran their farms and were free. The last dwelling Rig came to in Midgard was described as a large hall, with broad doors marked with a ring on its posts. Within the hall, Rig found a man who was caring for his hunting bow, and a woman who was fussing with her dress. The name of the couple was Fadir Father and Modir Mother. As with the other couples, they bade Rig to join them for a meal and to spend the night in their hall. Modir laid her embroidered table linen on an exquisitely crafted table, and a meal of rare delicacies and wines were served in silver. After the meal, the couple prepared for bed, and as with the other houses, Rig convinced the couple to let him sleep between them in their bed. This was the arrangement for three nights. After nine months Modir gave birth to a son who was known as Jarl, whose name meant Earl. Jarl was described as a fair-haired and handsome boy, with eyes as intelligent as a snake. In his youth, Jarl was adept in archery, swordsmanship, and the use of polearms, and was additionally skillful in hunting, war, and other sports. Unlike with his other visits, Rig returned and called Jarl as his son, and bestowed upon him the secret runic knowledge, which gave him additional arcane abilities. With complete obedience to what his father Rig wished for him, Jarl became a warlord, who fought and slew throughout battles and partitioned the looted treasures to his followers. He later married a woman named Erna, whose name meant Lively, a noblewoman who was fair and wise. She bore him twelve sons who had names such as Noble and King, 
and from these twelve sons were descended the noblemen. One of the sons of Jarl was able to outdo the qualities his father had, and took on the name of Rig as a tribute to their grandfather. Another of these sons was learned in the magical arts that he could stave off fires, control the weather, and heal the illnesses of people. He was said to have excelled Rig himself in the knowledge of magic, and almost ascended to godhood. It is through this myth that Rig was able to create the societal structures of the Vikings. On a historical note, most societal structures carried a form of the clergy, the priests. It is noted that the Vikings had no priestly class, as mentioned in chapter 2, they preferred their worship outdoors, where the chieftain often took the role of the priest, in addition to their political duties. 4.3.15. Vali. Vali was the son of Odin and Rind, the daughter of King Billing. Vali was conceived after Odin pursued Rind in various forms, similar to how Zeus pursued his numerous mistresses. Not much is known about the domain of Vali, as the myth that concerns him pertains to his role as the avenger of Baldur. Vali was the subject of a prophecy where he grew from a baby to adulthood in a single day, and armed with a bow, set off to slay Hoder, Baldur's killer. Vali was among the gods who would survive Ragnarok. Vali was identified as the personification of the lengthening days that herald the arrival of springtime for the Norsemen. As these rays of light resembled arrows, Vali was often depicted and venerated as an archer. The month devoted to him in the Viking calendar was identified by a bow and named Leos Beri, translated to Lightbringer. This was equivalent to the period between late January and the middle of February in the modern calendar. 4.4. The Prophecy of Vali In Norse mythology, Vali was known to be the youngest son of Odin. After Baldur was plagued by nightmares, Odin went into the underworld and consulted the spirit of a seer. The seer foretold Baldur's death and how his death was to be avenged by an unborn son of Odin who was born from Rhine's womb. He would avenge Baldur within the span of a single night after he was born, with hair uncombed and hands unwashed. To confirm this, Odin dispatched Hermod to the dwelling of the wicked wizard, Rostiof, who initially fought Hermod in the form of a giant and intended to bind him with a rope. Hermod swiftly stuck the wizard with a magic staff and bound the wizard with his own rope, at which Rostiof promised his aid, provided he be freed from his bounds. Once Hermod loosened the rope, Rostiof began an enchantment where the sky darkened with visions of blood, which portended the death of Baldur. From the blood arose the figure of a woman with a child, where the child leaped to the ground and grew into a man. The fully grown child then shot an arrow to dispel the vision. Rostiof elaborated that the maiden in the prophecy was Rind, the offspring of Billing, the chieftain of the Ruthenians, and that she was the maiden of the prophecy that showed who would be Baldur's avenger. Hermod returned to inform Odin of the vision. Odin then set off in disguise to find Rind. Though her father was easily impressed, the maiden was obstinate and resisted Odin's advances until he used his runic knowledge and she agreed to marry Odin. After nine months Vali made his way to Asgard with his hands unwashed and hair uncombed, in fulfillment of the seer's prophecy, growing into a man within a single day. Odin recognized that the prophecy was fulfilled, and as Vali let loose an arrow from the bow and quiver he carried, he shot Hoder and avenged the death of Baldur. 4.4.1. Vidar. Vidar is known as the god who speaks few words and is often described as a silent figure who dwells in solitude in his domain. Vidi, a place of tranquility and silence, is described as a place of tall grasses, young trees, and flowers. Though Vidar is known more for his silence, he is known to be the second physically strongest among the Aesir, outmatched only by Thor. Vidar is descended of Odin and Grid, a kindly giantess, and was destined to avenge the death of Odin in Ragnarok. A special characteristic of Vidar is that he wore an iron shoe. The creation of this iron shoe had two different stories. First, Grid, Vidar's giantess mother, created for him the shoe. Second, the shoe was crafted from the scraps left by cobblers after they made their shoes. This shoe is important in Ragnarok, as after the Fenris wolf swallowed Odin whole, Vidar alighted from his horse and attacked his father's devourer. Vidar placed the iron shoe on the wolf's lower jaw and pushed the wolf's maw upwards until the fearsome beast was forcibly ripped in half. Just like his half-brother Vali, 
who avenged Baldur, Vidar was meant to survive Ragnarok and eventually become one of the rulers of the New World. Because of Vidar's act, his name is believed to mean the splitting of evil in half. A depiction of Vidar fighting Fenris can be found as far south as England, in Cumbria. 4.4.2 Nord Nord, sometimes spelled Niord, was the Germanic god of the sea, and originally formed part of the Vanir until the aftermath of the war between the two generations of gods. Nord was the patron of sailors and fishermen, and directly contrasted Aegir, the other lord of the sea. Where Aegir whipped up tempests and stirred up storms, Nord was the one who calmed the sea and made the journeys of the sailors and fishermen very favorable. Nord was part of an exchange of hostages between the two generations of gods and his twins, Freya and Freyr. His wife and sister, Nerthus, were prohibited from accompanying him, as the Aesir forbade marriage between siblings. The selection of Nord's second wife figured into a myth. 4.4.3 Nord's Second Marriage After the kidnapping and return of Idun and the death of her kidnapper, Tiasi, the Aesir, which now included Nord and his children, feasted merrily. In the midst of this revelry there entered a gatecrasher, Scotty, the daughter of Tiasi, who came to avenge the death of her father. The gods sympathized with her and sought to appease her through promises of compensation instead of retribution. This appeasement was achieved through three means. The eyes of Tiasi were cast by Odin into the stars so that he may watch over the realms. The next saw numerous attempts to make Skadi laugh, where most attempts of the gods failed until Loki attempted a tug-of-war match with a goat, where a rope was looped around his testicles. This resulted in a lot of screeching and bleeding, and when Loki fell onto Skadi's lap, she could not help but laugh. Lastly, Skadi was to be given a god of her choice in marriage, however she could only choose the god based on the shape of his feet. With a drape that obscured the head and torsos of the gods, Skadi picked the nicest-looking pair of legs and shapely feet that she saw in the hopes that these belonged to Baldur. She was surprised to see that she had chosen Nord. After a sumptuous wedding for the newlyweds, they were faced with the question of residences, which quickly soured the wedded bliss. The couple spent the first nine nights of their marriage in Skadi's home, Thrymheim, a place high up in the mountains where the snow never melted. After the nine nights had passed, Nord said that he did not like Thrymheim and particularly disliked the sounds of the wolves, as it was completely different from the songs of his swans. Noten was Nord's domain, a land of light and warmth, filled with the sounds of shipbuilding and the cries of his favored birds, the seagulls and the swans. Skadi disliked the noise that Nord's home generated and the cries of the seagulls. The couple parted for their respective homes, where Skadi returned to her love of hunting, while Nord went back to his bustling halls. 4.4.4 Freyr Freyr, sometimes spelled as Frey, was translated to mean Lord, and in terms of the number of worshippers, was the third most revered Norse god after Odin and Thor. Freyr was the god of fertility, as he was the one who controlled the sunlight and the rain, essential to the growth of the fruits of the earth and of peace. Freyr was given the title Skur, which translated meant shining, and was married to the giantess Gerda, whose name meant field. Other titles given to Freyr were the Vanir deity, the deity of seasons, and the provider of wealth. Freyr's domain was in the realm of Alfheim, home of the Light Elves. Freyr possessed several treasures forged by the dwarves, the most notable of which is his ship, Skidbladnir, a ship that can sail over the earth and water, and once its sails are raised, the breezes immediately become favorable to the course of the boat. A unique feature of the boat is that it can easily be folded and stored in a pocket. The boat was large enough to carry the entirety of the Acer. Another treasure is the Boar Gullenbursti, which, like his boat, can maneuver itself over the land and sea and be often hitched to a chariot. Gullenbursti meant golden bristles, and these bristles are said to scatter sunlight where Freyr travels. Gullenbursti was used to plow the earth and make it fertile. An important treasure owned by Freyr is his magic sword said to represent a beam of sunlight which could fight giants of its own accord. This weapon was sorely missed by Freyr in Ragnarok, as he was left defenseless and only fought with a horn of a stag, meeting his end at the hands of Searcher, the fire giant and ruler of Muspelheim. 4.5. Freyr and Gerda The myth that involves Freyr involves his courtship of the giantess Gerda. 
One time Freyr disobeyed Odin's rule that only he or Frigg may sit at Odin's throne, Halidskalf, where one can see all the nine worlds. Freyr chanced to look all around him once he was on the throne, and there he saw the giantess Gerda, the offspring of Jamir, as she prepared to open the entries to her home. Her beauty was such that the earth and sky shone around her. Freyr was disheartened as he descended from Halidskalf, with the knowledge that Gerda was a giant, a sworn enemy of the Aesir, and that he was part of the Aesir and Lord of the Elves, that their match would never happen. Freyr heard that the heart of Gerda was cold, and that it would not be receptive to love. His unhappiness was such that he could not eat, drink, or sleep. As he was attuned with nature, so did nature reflect his moods, as trees shed their leaves and the flowers wilted. Alarmed by the occurrence, Nord asked Skirner Freyr's servant and friend, to speak with Freyr. It did not take long for Skirner to find out the cause of Freyr's troubles, and promised to woo Gerda on his behalf, as long as Freyr would lend him his horse, Blodiofi, a steed that can withstand a journey through fire, and the aforementioned enchanted sword that fought giants on its own. With these and Freyr's agreement Skirner headed toward Jutenheim, where with the horse Skirner easily leaped through a wall of fire. Once outside the hall of Jamir, Skirner thought about how to best approach Gerda and consulted with a shepherd, who informed him that Gerda had a cold heart and that Freyr was doomed to fail in his pursuit of her. Skirner was not deterred, as he believed the Norns knew his fate and determined when he would die, and continued to persevere with his plans. Once in the presence of Gerda, she coldly apprised Skirner, who presented her with eleven of the golden apples of youth, which she declined as she had enough gold. Odin's magic ring, Dropnir, was offered too, which Gerda declined as she had enough jewelry. When the friendlier approaches had failed, Skirner resorted to threats. He threatened to decapitate Gerda. Undeterred, she remarked that her father would remove Skirner and claim the sword for himself. Skirner then proceeded with his final threat and got out a knife and a wand. He began to carve runes onto the wand, where he would strike Gerda with the wand. The runes would be a curse that would doom Gerda to eternal loneliness and unrequited longing. She would be an outcast with no friends, children, or husband. The runes would cause Rimgrimner, a horrid frost giant, to be the only one to pursue her and place her in the company of corpses. She would never enjoy food or drink in any form and eternally, she would be cold and miserable, doomed to dry out, be trampled upon, and eternally forgotten by the world. The threat shook Gerda, who swore to marry Freyr. Skirner left the enchanted sword as a gift to Jamir, Gerda's father, and came back to Freyr with the news that Gerda would marry him nine days after their settlement, symbolic of the length of a Viking winter, in Bari, a sacred barley field. Though Freyr was disappointed at the length of time, when the wedding was celebrated, Freyr and Gerda were a happy couple. Metaphorically, their marriage symbolized the light and warmth of Freyr, thawing the coldness of Gerda's heart, the warmth of the sun that thaws the soil and allows for growth. 4.5.1 Forseti Forseti was a son of Baldur and Nanna. He was known to be the Norse god of justice, as well as that of conciliation. It is reputed that those who bring their disputes to him for settlement never leave without some form of conciliation. The Hall of Forseti in Asgard is commonly known as Glitner, with its columns made of gold and a silver encrusted ceiling. Few myths are associated with Forseti, but his worship was such that Forsetelland in Ostfold, Norway, was named for the god. 4.5.2 Tyr Tyr was also known as Tiw, Tiv, and Tawaz. He is the Norse god of war, and known to be a god of justice and the sky. Tyr is descended of Odin and Frigg, and was said to be the bravest of the Aesir, and was often depicted with one hand, a result of a myth that occurred between him and the Fenris wolf. It is believed by some mythological sources that Gingnir, Odin's spear, originally belonged to Tyr, as it was customary before the start of a battle to cast a spear over the heads of the enemies, and many of these unearthed spears were dedicated to Tyr rather than Odin. The main myth associated with Tyr is his role in the binding of the Fenris wolf, one of Loki's fearsome children, with Angerboda. Fenris had grown to such an immense size that the Aesir were alarmed, and thought it was time to bind the wolf. Chains were not enough to bind Fenris, and thus it was necessary to forge Gleipnir, a chain with unique properties that resembled a silken ribbon. 
Gleipnir was formed from the sound of a cat's footsteps, the hairs of a female's beard, mountain roots, a bear's dreams, a fish's breath, and a bird's saliva. As these did not exist, there was no way for the chain to be broken. The Aesir, armed with Gleipnir, brought Fenris to an isolated island, Lingvi, in the middle of a lake called Amsfartnir. The gods asked Fenris whether he would agree to be bound, and Fenra consented, provided that a god put his hand inside Fenris' mouth and guaranteed his freedom. Tyr volunteered to place his hand. Once the Gleipnir was fastened, the Fenris wolf could not break free and bit off Tyr's hand. Gleipnir was then attached to a heavy chain called Gelja, and twined around a rock named Geol. A sword was placed inside Fenris' mouth to keep it open, and there the wolf was bound until Ragnarok. Tyr was prophesied to fall in Ragnarok when he and Garm, the hound who guards the gates of hell, die at each other's hands. Tyr's name was given to the day of Tuesday, then known as Tyr's Day. 4.5.3 Hermod Hermod is the son of Odin and Frigg, and was described to be a courageous and daring warrior, as well as resolute, which was one of the attributes given to him. Similar to Hermes of Greek myth, Hermod was responsible for various errands that took him to various realms. Hermod, like Hermes and Mercury, was a psychopomp, the one who conducted the souls of the dead to their rightful destination, and in Hermod's case, he led the souls of the glorious dead to the foot of Odin's throne in Valhalla. Hermod figured into the myth that surrounded the death of Baldur, as it was he who went down to the domain of Hell and leaped over its gates with Sleipnir and asked that Baldur be released. It was he conveyed Hell's condition that she would release Baldur, only if the entirety of creation wept for him and took with him one of the arm rings that Odin placed on Baldur's corpse in the funeral pyre. We see Hermod later, as he confirms the prophecy that Baldur's death will be avenged. 4.5.4 ULL ULL, also known as Ullr, was one of the Aesir and the son of Thor and Seif. ULL was said to be the god of winter, and was associated with skiers, hunting, the use of snowshoes, archery, and shields. ULL was often invoked by warriors who were engaged in one-on-one -on -one combat. Ull's domain is Asgard is Edelir, which meant U Dales, a place where yew trees flourish. ULL is sometimes depicted as versed with magic, who travels the nine realms with the use of a magic bone. Some statements, however, also claim that ULL often skied down the slopes of his wintry home with the use of his shield. A few myths are associated with him. Nevertheless, given his relationship with winter and its activities, ULL remained an important member of the Norse pantheon. 4.5.5 The Aesingher The Aesingher are the goddesses who form part of the Aesir, and indeed, the feminine equivalent of the Aesir. The Aesingher are limited in number, and they are enumerated by most sources of Norse mythology as Frigg, Freya, Saga, Eyr, Gefjon, Schofen, Lofen, Var, Vor, Sin, Lin, Snotra, Fulla, and Gna. Other versions of the Aesingher include Bil, Eyr, Gerda, Idun, Nana, Sigan, and Sol. Seif and Skadi were not considered as part of the Aesingher. For this section, we will discuss the more prominent members of the Aesingher. 4.5.6 Frigg Frigg or Frigga was said to be the chief of the Aesingher and was Odin's wife and daughter of Fjorgan, an ancient goddess of the earth. Because of her ancestry, Frigg was often referred to as the Earth Mother, just as Odin was referred to as the Allfather. Frigga is the nurturing aspect and was the goddess associated with love, matrimony, and maternity. She was also believed to be a fertility goddess, with the ability to have known what the Norns had ordained, but would not divulge any inkling of her knowledge. Frigg, aside from Odin, was the only one permitted to sit at Odin's throne, Helidskalf. Frigg was often depicted as a beautiful woman, dressed in a girdle from which hang the symbols of the household, keys, and is often shown as high in the sky, with her jeweled spinning wheel to create the clouds. Heron plumes on her head are symbolic of her discretion with her actions, while the keys symbolize her domain over the home. Frigg's Hall in Asgard was called Fenselir, which meant Water Hall, where she was attended by her eleven handmaidens, some of whom were part of the Aesingher, Lynn, Fulla, and Gna. Fulla was the one who carried Frigg's basket, tended to her appearance, and more importantly, kept her secrets, and was often invoked when one wished to maintain secrecy. 
Lin guarded those whom Frigg believed were worth saving, while GNA was Frigg's messenger and traveled through the Nine Realms to do various errands on her steed, Hafarpnir. As the spouse of Odin, Frigg was the mother of Baldur, Hodur, Tyr, and Hermod. To contrast with her domain over the household, Frigg was also portrayed as a sorceress who possessed a set of falcon feathers and could foresee the events of the future and shared these attributes with Freya, along with the shared desire for jewelry. The myth associated with Frigg is her desire to protect Baldur from those who could harm him, and she was known to have traveled through all the Nine Realms, exacting a promise from every object that they would not harm Baldur, save a sprig of mistletoe which she felt was insignificant. After Baldur's death, Frigg dispatched messengers throughout all creation to implore them to weep for Baldur's death that Hel may return him to her. 4.5.7 Freya Freya, sometimes spelled as Freya or Freya, was the daughter of Nord and the twin sister of Freyr, and was originally a member of the Vanir. Freya's name meant lady, and she was the goddess of love and fertility. She was described to be a beautiful, voluptuous goddess, and her beauty was such that it had attracted many admirers, among gods, men and even giants, as can be seen with Thrym. Freya resided in her domain, called Folkfanger, in a hall called Sesrumnir. Sesrumnir, which meant numerous seats, was Freya's equivalent to Valhalla, where she convened with her share of the glorious dead. Freya was married to a god named Odd, sometimes referred to as Other. However, he was a wanderer and disappeared one day. It is said that Freya roams the world looking for her lost husband, and that her constant weeping produced treasures. If her tears fell on earth they became gold, whereas if they fell on the water they turned into amber. With Odd Freya had a daughter called Nosa, whose name translated to Jewel, and in other accounts, another daughter named Gersami. Both daughters gave their names to every precious stone. In the aftermath of the Aesir and Vanir War, Freya, reputed to be a sorceress herself, instructed the Aesir on the use of the magical force called Side. Aside from her aspects as a love and fertility goddess and that of a sorceress, Freya was often depicted to be a warrior, as she also brought her share of the dead to her hall in Sesrumnir. Her boar Hildisvini, similar to Gullen Bursti, the boar of Freyr, was an insignia of war as its name translated to battle boar. Freya rode a chariot that was drawn by boars or sometimes by cats. Freya, like Frigg, possessed a falcon skin which Loki often borrowed when he needed to fly great distances. The Brisingamen necklace, however, was one of her prized possessions and was associated with a story. The aspect of love was often associated with two other members of the Aesinger. Shofen was the one who created relationships that were heterosexual, while Lofen was invoked by those who already had known love but encountered hindrances in obtaining the hand of whom they love. 4.5.8 The Brisingamen Necklace Freya's desire for gold and jewelry often reached the heights of avarice. The dwarves known as the Brisings, named Alfrig de Valen, Berling and Grur, crafted a beautiful golden necklace that Freya desired above all others. She offered the dwarves treasures of gold and various amounts of silver, but this was rejected, as the dwarves had more than enough treasures in their underworld domains. As Freya wept her tears of gold, at her inability to acquire the necklace she so desired, Devalin said that the brothers would give the necklace to Freya, on the condition that she would spend the night with each of the four brothers. Freya, whose material desire overruled her senses, agreed, and after four nights returned to her home, Folkfanger, with the necklace clasped around her neck. Freya's indiscretion was observed by Loki, who wasted no time narrating to Odin the measures Freya had gone to obtain the Brisingamen necklace. Odin ordered Loki to obtain the necklace for him. Loki encountered some difficulty in securing the necklace, as her hall, Sesrumnir, was completely secured and shuttered. He seized his opportunity when he changed into a fly and entered through a gap in the door. Loki saw Freya asleep with the clasp underneath her neck, where Loki changed into a flea and bit Freya, who turned and exposed the clasp. Loki changed back to himself, took the necklace, unlocked the door and left. Odin when confronted with Freya's tears about her loss, reprimanded her for her greed, and only agreed to its return if Freya would create a conflict in Midgard, with the demand that there should be death and blood. Freya, afterward, was to bring those who were slain back to life. Freya then agreed, given her share in the heroic slain, while Odin tasked Heimdall to retrieve the necklace from Loki. 
Another myth that concerns Freya is her love for the male Midgardian otter. 4.5.9 Freya and Otter Otter was among the many men who were smitten by the beauty of Freya, where Freya transformed Otter into a form similar to her boar Hildesvini, and visited the giant seeress Hindla. Freya convinced Hindla, either through cajolery, force, or the use of a magic drink, to reveal the ancestry of Otter, that he may settle a gamble made with another mortal named Angunter. This was an important wager, as it was essential for the Norsemen to recall their lineage, as this was the main means to settle disputes over land and property in their times. Hindler revealed that one of Otter's ancestors was the hero Sigurd, and this assured that Otter would win the wager. After Hindla finished the narration of Otter's ancestors, she requested that Freya leave. However, Freya conjured flames around the giantess and requested that she brew a beer that would enable Otter to remember exactly what was narrated to him, and was able to successfully obtain the said brew. 4.5.10 Idun Idun, sometimes spelled as Idun or Iduna, was described as a goddess with golden hair who was the keeper of the golden apples that restored the youth and vitality of the Aesir. Idun was well known as being the wife of the poetry god, Bragi. Only one myth is associated with Idun, that of her kidnapping by the Rimthurser, Tiasi. 4.6. The Rape of Idun. Odin, his brother Honor, and Loki journeyed to Midgard, where one night they set up camp, slaughtered an ox, and began to roast it. However, no matter the length of time the meat spent on the fire, it remained raw and could not be eaten. A large eagle landed in a nearby tree, and said he could keep the fire burning as long as he shared the food. As the gods agreed, the eagle was able to make the fire hot enough to cook the slaughtered ox. The eagle, however, ate the entire meal. Loki, infuriated, attempted to strike the eagle but was dragged down by its talons instead. Loki was pulled over rocks and thorns until he cried out for mercy. The eagle said that Loki would not be freed until he brought him Idun and his golden apples. Loki agreed and was released back to Odin and Honor. Loki failed to inform them of the terms of their release with the eagle, which he later found out was the giant Tiasi. As Loki was fearful of Tiasi, he hastened to the apple orchard where Idun lived with Bragi. Loki tried to persuade Idun with the fact that he had found apples in Midgard that looked almost as good as the apples on the trees she cared for. He asked Idun to bring her apples that she may compare their qualities with the Midgardian apples. Idun trusted Loki, and she followed him down the Bifrost and into Midgard. Once in Midgard, Tiasi in his eagle form swept down and kidnapped Idun, locking her in the highest towers of his home in Thrymheim. With the loss of Idun's apples, the effects of age became apparent on the Aesir. They then communed to find a solution, save for Loki, which led the gods to believe that Loki had a role in the disappearance of Idun. Once Loki was found, Odin commanded him to bring back Idun and her apples or else have his life forfeited. Loki then borrowed the falcon skin of Freya and flew to Thrymheim. He was fortunate enough to find Idun unguarded, as Tiasi was out fishing, where Loki changed Idun into a nut and carried her back to Asgard. Odin from his perch could see that Loki was being chased by Tiasi. Odin then ordered the Aesir to prepare firewood on the walls, and when Loki flew over the walls of Asgard, the firewood flared up, trapping the eagle and setting him on fire, allowing the Aesir to kill him. Loki restored Idun and she gave her apples to the gods. 4.6.1 Sif Though we mentioned that Sif was not considered part of the Aesinger, she is still included as she is one of the spouses of Thor and did reside in Asgard. Sif was described as Thor's wife, a golden-haired goddess who represented fertility and the mother of Ull. Sif's myth involved Loki cutting off all her hair while she slept and under the threat of Thor, was forced to replace it with a wig made of golden strands that grew like hair. The journey to replace Sif's hair also resulted in the creation of various treasures for the other gods. 4.6.2 Nana Nana was the wife of Baldur and the mother of Forseti. Not much is known about Nana, except that upon the funeral pyre of Baldur she perished due to a broken heart, and her body was laid to rest with Baldur. She accompanied her husband to Hel, and met with Hermod to give gifts for Hermod to bring to Asgard. 
4.6.3. Sin. Sin's name translates to denial, and she was one of the Asinger who played a minor role. Sin was the one who guarded the halls of Sesromnir and was invoked to protect the defendants in the course of a trial. 4.6.4. Snotra. Snotra's name translates to clever, and not much is known about her, save from intelligence and deportment. It is believed that she was a later addition to the Norse pantheon. 4.6.5. Saga. One of the Asinger Saga resided in a hall called Sakvabek, where she often drank mead with Odin. Some accounts state that Saga was not a separate goddess but a title of Frigg, as Saga translated to She Who Knows, an attribute that Frigg shared with Odin as they both could see into the future. 4.6.6. Gefjon. Gefjon, sometimes spelled Gefon, was a fertility goddess often associated with the use of a plow. The myth associated with Gefjon is how she created the island of Zealand in Denmark through the use of four oxen. One day Gefjon disguised as a beggar asked the Swedish king Gilvi for some land. Gilvi told her that she could have any land as long as she was able to farm it within a day and a night. Now an old woman, Gefjon went to look for her four sons. Accounts vary if they were oxen or if she transformed them into giant oxen. Regardless of the magic used, she hitched her sons onto a plow and tore off a piece of Sweden and dragged it into the sea, where it became the island of Zealand. 4.6.7. Jord. Jord, also known as Fjorgen, was translated to mean Earth. She was the daughter of Nott, the giantess of night, and Anner, and the mother of Thor by Odin. Not much is known about her save her importance as an earth goddess by the Norse. 4.7. Conclusion. From what can be seen of the Norse pantheon, the Aesir and the Aesingher had respective stories that were relatable to the lives of the Norsemen. From the patronages of these gods, it can be seen that the Vikings considered knowledge, fertility, safety, war, fate, and love as among the more important concepts that govern their lives, and as such, devoted their worship to the gods that embodied and bestowed these aspects. The gods had their respective destinies laid out for them, with the original generation to be avenged by the second generation of the Aesir by the time Ragnarok draws to a close. There are more stories in the subsequent chapters, particularly the story that led to the Aesir being the more dominant race of gods in the Norse pantheon. 5. The Vanir Earlier, it was mentioned that there arose a conflict between the Aesir and the Vanir as to who would be the more dominant race. This bears similarity to how the Olympians battled the Titans in the Greek story Titanomachia, although the Norse version would be less violent when compared to that of the Greeks. The Vanir were a race of gods who resided in Vanaheim, believed to be more ancient than the Aesir themselves. The domain of the Vanir is related to fertility, as can be seen with Freyr and Freya. The Vanir were generally a peaceful race, and brought tranquility and prosperity to Asgard. The Vanir carried with them the knowledge of Side, the magical forces, and also their witchcraft and sorcery knowledge, and taught the Aesir in the use of these forces. Unlike the Aesir, the worship of the Vanir was more prevalent in these other lands. 5.1. Vanaheim. Vanaheim, to recall from Chapter 2, was the domain of the Vanir and sat atop the uppermost reaches of Yggdrasil, together with the realms of Asgard and Alfheim. Not much is mentioned of Vanaheim, save that it is a peaceful realm. Vanaheim, contemporarily, was said to refer to Tanais, the name of the Don River in southern Russia. 5.2. The War of the Aesir and the Vanir. From what was outlined in Chapter 4, the Aesir were a host of warrior gods who lived in the realm of Asgard. The Vanir was a more ancient race who predated the Aesir and, as earlier stated, were involved with fertility, wisdom, and light, and resided in their realm of Vanaheim, where they blessed the realms with sunlight, rain, and fertile land. The Vanir never knew of the existence of the Aesir, nor had they ever set foot in the fortifications of Asgard. A beautiful witch named Gulwag, other accounts call her Hyde, appeared one day in Asgard, and she became the main reason why the Aesir and Vanir went to war with each other. Gulwag was known for her lust for gold, and could not conduct any conversation without the involvement of her love for gold. This unnerved the Aesir, 
as there was too much greed and wickedness that entered Asgard. Odin was incensed at this and decreed that Gullweig must die. Although Gullweig was hurled into the fire at least three times by the Aesir, she arose more radiant than ever. She proceeded to enter all the Asgardian halls, throwing incantations and, at the same time, teaching magic. She then left to return to the Vanir and narrated the cruelty the Aesir inflicted upon her. An army of the Vanir left to avenge Gullweig's honor. As Odin cast his spear Gingnur over the heads of the Vanir army, the fight began, but it saw no end, as both sides were equally matched where neither one could win nor lose. The two races of gods decided to parley and come to a compromise, with the common ground that they live in eternal peace and that they share a common enemy, the giants. 5.3. The Ritual of Exchange That the peace agreed upon by the Vanir and the Aesir would stand, the members of each race spat into a jar, a customary practice of the Norsemen as they sealed their treaties. From this combined spit arose Kvasir, whose name translates to spittle, and was said to be the wisest of the gods and from whom the mead of poetry was made. To further cement the peace, the Aesir and Vanir exchanged gods. The Aesir sent Honor and Mimir, while the Vanir sent Nord and his twins, Freya and Freyr. Though the Vanir were initially pleased with Honor and appointed him in a leadership position, they came to regret this, as Honor could not make a decision without any counsel from Mimir. The Vanir were hurt. Although they could not harm Honor as he was Odin's brother, they had Mimir beheaded and sent him back to Odin. Wasting no time, Odin successfully resurrected Mimir's head and placed it in a well that thereafter became commonly known as Mimir's Well, located at the root of Yggdrasil. The well became known as a source of wisdom. 5.4. Nerthus Nerthus translates to Earth and was known as an Earth Mother. She was said to be the wife and sister of Nord, and the mother of Freyr and Freya. However, from the resultant ritual of exchange, she was forbidden to accompany her husband and her children to Asgard, as the Aesir frowned upon marriage between siblings. Nerthus was depicted, standing in a wagon hitched to a pair of oxen. Ritual drownings were made in her honor. 5.5. Kvasir Kvasir was formed from the spittle of the Aesir and the Vanir, and from it, he was known to spread his wisdom to those who sought his counsel. His wisdom was renowned that he was murdered by the dwarves, Halar and Galar, who drained his corpse of his blood and combined it with honey to ferment and create the mead of poetry. This mead became the subject of a dispute between the two brothers, as whoever would drink of the mead would become a poet or scholar, as it was made from the wisest of them all. When the gods could not find Kvasir, they were able to identify his last encounter with the dwarves. The dwarves were contemptuous when questioned, and said that Kvasir was too wise for his own good. The dwarves later murdered the giant Gilling by taking him out on his boat, and pushing him overboard a distance away from the shore, as the giant could not swim. Their machinations went further, as when they reported Gilling's death to his wife, they later crushed her to death with a millstone. However Gilling's son Suttung found out what happened, and enraged with how the dwarves engineered his father's death, he seized the brothers and placed them on a low reef with the intention to drown the devious pair. The brothers pleaded, but Suttung remained unmoved by their pleas until the brothers offered him the mead of poetry. Suttung took the mead and decanted it into three separate vats hidden within a mountain called Nitbjorg, which meant pulsing rock, and tasked his daughter Gunlod to guard the special brew. Odin saw what transpired and sought the brew, as not only was it made from one of them, but because of his thirst for knowledge, desired the knowledge it could give him. Odin then disguised himself as Bolverk and went to a field where he saw thralls harvesting hay. Odin offered to sharpen their scythes, to which they agreed as their scythes were dulled and added to their efforts to harvest the hay. Once the scythes were sharpened, the thralls' tasks were made easier, and they offered to purchase the whetstone, where Odin said the price was high. The thralls maintained their interest in the stone at which Odin threw the whetstone over their heads, and in their desire to get to it, slew each other. The thralls worked for Baji, the brother of Suttung, and when Odin approached Baji, he asked to stay the night. Over a meal, Baji confessed that he was nervous about how to harvest all the hay, as his workers mysteriously turned on each other. Odin offered to do all the work in return for a sip of the mead Suttung kept. Though Baji initially said that he had nothing to do with the mead, 
he relented and would accompany Odin to obtain his payment, as long as Odin maintained his promise. Odin swiftly completed the task set by Baji, and together they went to the home of Suttung, where Baji told him the terms of the deal. Suttung had not granted them a sip of the mead, and Baji was ready to go back in defeat. Odin, still in the guise of Bolverk, suggested an alternative means of obtaining their payment. The two went to Nitbjorg, where Odin produced a drill for Baji to drill a hole. To ensure that the hole penetrated the mountain, Odin blew into the hole and had the dust blown back in his face. He asked Baji to continue drilling until the hole did indeed penetrate the mountain. Odin quickly turned into a snake and moved into the hole. Though Baji attempted to catch him, Odin was too fast, and Baji left in anger. Once Odin reached Gunlod, he attempted to seduce her, which succeeded. For each night he spent with her, he agreed to give Odin three shots of mead in return. Although Gunlod knew she was betraying her father's trust, she was enraptured by Odin's charms and allowed the deal to go through. Odin then swallowed the contents of the vats in three gulps, and after changing into an eagle, flew from the mountain. Suttung guessed what happened, and after turning into an eagle too, gave chase to Odin. As Odin approached Asgard, the other Aesir prepared three vats where Odin could spit out the mead that he had swallowed. The mead of poetry then was only given to those men and women Odin deemed worthy of the gift. Some drops of the mead made their way to Midgard, and from these drops came the artists and scholars who practiced their craft in Midgard. 5.6. Conclusion Little detail is given to the worship of the Vanir as a race of gods that predated the Aesir. Hence, the stories that were shown in this chapter narrate the lesser-known myths associated with the members of the Vanir. Kvasir is listed here, as the circumstances of his creation are associated with the aftermath of the war between the two generations of the Viking gods, hence, he could be considered of the Vanir. The next chapter deals with the common enemy with whom the gods chose to stand steadfast against, the giants and those associated with them. 6. The Eternal Enemies of the Heavenly Host, Giants The giants of Norse mythology bore little resemblance to the giants often portrayed in children's tales, save for their humongous stature that befits their name. The giants, or as we should properly call them, the Jotun, were forces of nature, and possessed unique abilities as well, which included the ability to change their shape and use magic that was often within the scope of the abilities of the Aesir. Despite the apparent enmity between the gods and the giants, it must be remembered that the gods are descended from the giants themselves, given that Odin and his siblings had a giantess for their mother. There arises a conflict as to whose worship predates whose. Were the giants revered first? Or had they always been the sources of conflict in Norse mythology? In the creation of the universe, according to the accounts of the Vikings, Ymir was the first creature, a giant formed from the continued interaction of the icy reaches of Niflheim with the animated sparks of Muspelheim. It was from Ymir that the entire race of giants, the Jotun and the Rimthursar, was descended from the sweat of his body, and from whom eventually sprang Besla, mother of Odin, and by extension, the grandmother of the gods. 6.1. Bergelmer, the last frost giant from creation. Bergelmer was the son of one of the Rimthursar, in this case Thrudgelmir, and was descended from Ymir, earlier mentioned as the first giant. There are few myths associated with Bergelmer, save for his importance as the progenitor of the new race of giants. As Odin and his brothers slew Ymir, torrents of his blood overcame and drowned the giants, save for Bergelmer and his wife, who were able to escape on a boat. From them, the giants were descended and perpetuated the eternal enmity between the giants and the gods. In the creation myths however, their escape had not gone unobserved, and subsequently, Bergelmer and his descendants were given the outer reaches of the world to be known as Jutenheim for their home. 6.2 Surt, the ruler of Muspelheim. Surt, also known as Searcher, is the giant who ruled over the realm of Muspelheim. Little is known about the origins of Surt, save that he is a fire giant, and his name is translated to mean black. Surt's role was more apparent in the events of Ragnarok, where he would lead his armies from Muspelheim and would cause the death of Freyr. Surt's final action would be to set all the nine realms ablaze, 
completely incinerating gods, giants, dwarves, the dead, and all other forms of creation that existed, save for a few survivors. More will be elaborated on in the discussion of Ragnarok. 6.3. Thor and Ringnir. In the section with Thor, we narrated how Thor was one of the foremost defenders of the Aesir against the continuous threat of the giants. It is no surprise that most of the myths associated with the giants involve Thor himself, and the need for the giants to take down one of Asgard's best defenders. The myth of Thor and Ringnir began with a simple competition, a horse race set between Odin and Ringnir. Odin first met Ringnir on one of his journeys as he was mounted on Sleipnir, his eight-legged horse. Ringnir was described to be the strongest of the Jotuns, and he then challenged Odin to a horse race that tested the speed of Sleipnir against Ringnir's mount, Golfaxi. Odin agreed and immediately galloped away, with Ringnir behind him. Odin pressed his advantage with Sleipnir, who was familiar with the pathways he needed to go through, which allowed him to easily gallop past Valgrind, the door to Valhalla. Golfaxi too hastened his speed, until Ringnir realized that he was in Asgard itself. Though the giants were enemies of the gods, custom and hospitality dictate that no harm shall befall a guest in their home. Ringnir enjoyed the best of Asgardian hospitality as he was served by Freya, who lent him Thor's drinking horn, as Thor was fighting other giants elsewhere and filled the horn to the brim. This was repeated continuously by Freya, as Ringnir easily emptied the large horn in enormous gulps. The effect of Ringnir's drunkenness became quickly apparent with the amount he imbibed, as he bragged about how he would take Valhalla with him back to Jutenheim, that he may toy with it, and take Freya and Sif along as his wives and as his servants. At his presumption, the Aesir grew outraged, and Odin did his utmost to restrain them from slaying their guest. Thor too heard, as he burst into the hall with Mjolnir, but later agreed to meet him in a duel at Geotunagard, the stony place. Ringnir mounted Golfaxi and returned to Jutenheim with news of his duel with Thor. This made the giants themselves uneasy, though Ringnir was easily known as the strongest of them all. The giants came up with a plan to terrify Thor through the creation of another giant crafted from clay. This creation was given the name Makarkalfi, which meant Mist Calf, who was at least a hundred thousand feet high, the modern equivalent of nine leagues. Within the clay of Makarkalfi beat the heart of a mare, the only one large enough to animate the giant. Ringnir himself had a heart of stone, unique in that it had three sharp edges. The structure of Ringnir was that of stone, from his head to his armor. The sight of the two giants was fearsome as Thor and Tialfi, his servant, approached. Tialfi sought to aid his master with his cunning, as well as with his speed. He sped off to inform Ringnir to shield his lower body, rather than his upper body, in the event that Thor would choose to attack his legs. Ringnir proceeded to stand on his shield and launched his club toward Thor. At the same time, Thor flung his hammer toward Ringnir, where the two weapons collided in midair with a loud crack and a sizzle of lightning. Ringnir's club was shattered by the impact with Mjolnir, where its pieces were entombed within the earth itself. Mjolnir's aim was true, where it struck the giant dead, his body pinning Thor underneath. At the same time, Tialfi easily dispatched the clay monstrosity the giants had created, and sought to free his master. Ringnir's leg was so immense in its size and weight, that even Odin and the other Aesir could not budge the leg. Thor's sole injury was that a piece of whetstone, some say it was Ringnir's, used to deflect Thor's hammer, some accounts provide that it was a piece of Ringnir's shattered club or that of Tialfi's, wedged itself in Thor's head. Magni, Thor's son by Jarnsaxa, came by. Though he was at the time only at the age of three, Magni was large and was easily able to lift Ringnir's leg off his father. As a reward, Thor gave Golfaxi Ringnir's steed to Magni. Though freed, Thor was still injured from the shattered whetstone in his head and sent for the witch Groa. Groa soothed Thor's pain by using incantations and runic magic, whereupon Thor was so relieved that he intended to reward Groa. He notified the witch that he had successfully saved her missing husband, Arvandil and carried him through the poisonous waters of Elevagar. One of Orvandal's fingers froze upon contact with the icy waters, where Thor hurled it upward to turn it into a star. Thor added that Arvandil was secure, and awaited Groa at their home. At this news, Groa was elated that she quickly left for her home, forgetting the spell that would remove the last remnant of the whetstone from Thor's head. As Ringnir was the most powerful of the Jotuns, 
The giants believed that the outcome of their duel would create a change in the enmity between the giants and the gods. With the loss of their greatest champion, the giants abandoned any plans related to the occupation of Asgard. 6.4. Thor and Garrod. The skirmish between Thor and Garrod was a result of an action caused by Loki. Loki took the feathers of a falcon and flew to the house of Garrod, considered one of the evilest of the giants. Garrod saw the falcon whose plumage made it look quite attractive, and set his servants to capture the bird. It took several trolls some time to capture it, as it always managed to escape by hopping onto a different perch. When Loki, in this guise, attempted to fly away, he was barricaded in by an evil enchantment. The falcon captured, he was set before Garrod, who immediately understood that there was more to the bird than what met the eye. Loki, still in his falcon guise, was kept under lock and key without any food or drink to force his hand and reveal who he actually was. Garrod agreed to Loki's freedom on the condition that Loki brings Thor without any of his armaments. Delirious with starvation, Loki rashly promised to return with Thor, and he departed with the idea of a plan. Once safely installed in the fortifications of Asgard, Loki immediately told any of the Aesir who would listen about the wondrous building of Garrod's hall, and how the giant was eager to meet Thor and wanted to introduce him to his two daughters, Yalp and Grape. Loki added that Garrod wanted to entertain Thor if he had the opportunity. With the gossip that abounds, and as Thor could not sense any underhandedness in the gossip, wanted to go and visit his alleged new devotee, Garrod. In preparation for the visit, Loki persuaded Thor to leave without his armory, and thus Thor left without his belt of strength, his iron gauntlets, and more importantly, Mjolnir. With Loki as his guide, Thor made his way to Garrod's hall. Since the distance to Garrod's hall was great, they made an overnight stop at the home of Grid, a kind giantess who favored the Aesir and especially favored Thor. As Loki went to sleep, Grid warned Thor of Loki's and Garrod's plan and lent him her own belt of strength, her iron gauntlets, and another weapon, an enchanted staff. As they departed the next day, Thor and Loki crossed the river known as Vimmer. As the pair forded the river, the waters in the stream continued to rise. Thor used Grid's enchanted staff to anchor himself, and Loki hung on to Thor, so that he would not be swept away by the crimson waters of the rising torrent. Toward the headwaters of the river, Thor saw the giantess Jalp, who caused the river to rise to a torrent with a drop of her menstrual blood. Thor took aim and launched a rock at her which pierced her and sent her away, keening. Thor stood up with the support of one Rowan, henceforth known as Thor's salvation. When they finally got to Gerard's mansion, Thor was being escorted to a small chamber to await his host. He then sat in the lone chair in the chamber, closed his eyes, and dozed. Thor then sensed that he was somehow aloft in the air, and saw that he was already headed toward the roof of the chamber. With the help of Grid's enchanted staff, he pushed against the rafters of the chamber to lower himself, and landed on top of Gerard's giantess offspring. Yalp and Grape were crushed to death by the pressure of Thor's weight, while trying to throw Thor's head to the ceiling. Enraged, Thor sought out Garrod, who welcomed him, and threw a large molten ball of iron toward Thor. Thor caught the ball with the iron gauntlets that Grid lent him, and threw it toward Garrod. There are two accounts of Garrod's death from this point. Garrod was said to have hidden behind a column as the ball was thrown back. However, the molten iron penetrated the column and passed through Garrod's head and destroyed his walls and yard, burying itself beneath the earth. Another account has Thor directly aiming the ball toward Garrod, where the molten iron passed through Garrod's stomach. Regardless of the manner of death, it showed that Thor was able to overcome the treasonous plans of the giants with the help of one of their own grid. 6.5. Utgard Loki Thor was known to actively seek out combats against the giants, and took it upon himself to visit the city of Utgard, the capital city of the realm of Jutunheim. Its ruler, Utgard Loki, was known for his trickery, and so to offset this, Thor took with him the resident god of trickery, Loki. As the day drew to a close, Thor and Loki, in his chariot drawn by his two goats, Taniast and Tangrisner, stopped at a tiny farmhouse. The farmer and his wife were poor, and had little to offer them in the way of hospitality. Thor resolved this with a swing of his hammer that killed his goats, where he had them roasted on a fire to cook. He then asked them to eat to their heart's content, provided that none of the bones of the goats be broken. 
the goat bones were to be placed on the goat skins that Thor laid out on the floor of the farm. This order, however, was disobeyed when Tialfi, the son of the farmer, shattered one of the leg bones that he may feast upon the succulent marrow. As Thor prepared to leave, he waved his hammer over the skin and bones to return the goats to life. Though the goats were resurrected as frisky as they were before, one of them had a pronounced limp, which infuriated Thor as his request was disobeyed. The farmer offered his children, Tialfi and his sister Roskva, as restitution, which Thor accepted, and left the goats in the care of the farmer until he returned from his journey. Thor, Loki, Tialfi and Roskva journeyed until they reached a forest whose tops were obscured by the clouds of the sky. They espied an oddly constructed cabin that had no doors, where they chose to shelter for the night and slept. The four of them were awoken through the tremors felt on the ground, which was then followed by a continuous reverberation and the howls of the wind. This combination was enough to even scare Thor, which made the other three burrow further into a side room in the shelter, Thor with Mjolnir close to him. As dawn broke, Thor went out to identify the noise and saw that the cause of all their fright the previous night was caused by the snores of the biggest giant he had ever seen. Donning the magic belt of strength Grid had loaned him, Thor's grip on Mjolnir tightened, reluctant, as he was about to let go of the best weapon he had. The giant eventually woke up from his slumber and picked up what they thought was a cabin, but was in reality, the glove of the giant. The giant was large enough that all four had to bend their necks to catch the complete sight of him. He introduced himself as Skrymir, whose name meant that he was vast. After they had broken their fast, Skrymir and the four set off, with him in the lead to show the path to the Jotun stronghold, Utgard. As night crept upon them, Skrymir shared his provisions though, try as they may, Thor and the others could not undo the knots that fastened Skrymir's bag, and resolved to resist their starvation as well as the snores that punctuated the night. Unable to take any more of the inhospitable conditions, Thor flung Mjolnir at Skyramir's forehead, who simply brushed off the impact of the mallet and dismissed it, in the thought that it was a leaf that landed on his brow. He promptly fell asleep once more. A second blow with Mjolnir caused the giant to think an acorn landed on his head. Thor then propelled himself on top of the giant, which made the slumbering giant think that a nest of birds landed on his head. He woke, took up his bag, and warned the four to tread carefully once they reached the giant's stronghold, as there were giants of far more superior stature than he. Once they had reached Utgard, they were met by an assembly of giants, who then created contests to test the mettle of the newcomers. Loki stated that he could not be beaten at a contest at who could consume the most food. At this, an enormous platter of food was set before Loki by one of the giants, before the other giant, whose name was Loji, took his place on the other side of the god. The two began to consume copious amounts of food, with their head occasionally nudging each other as they bent over their platters. However, the giant Loji was also able to eat part of the dish as well as all the bones that were on the platter, and he was declared the winner of the contest. Tialfi, the farmer's son, claimed that he was the fleetest of foot among the assembly. The giants of the stronghold summoned a younger giant named Hugi, and identified a track that would serve as the path of the race. Though Tialfi was indeed as swift as he proclaimed, he could not outrun the giant Hugi and lost. Tialfi then sat beside Loki, abashed at his bravado. Thor then pits himself against the assembly of Jotun, and proclaimed his prowess at drinking. Before Thor was set, a large drinking horn, and confidently, Thor put the horn to his lips and drank. However, no matter the amount or the length of time Thor drank, the horn remained resolutely filled to its brim with the liquid. Undeterred, Thor opened his mouth and let the drink pour into his mouth and onto his face. However, the level of the liquid in the horn remained unchanged. After another attempt to empty the Thor, he was forced to concede defeat, to his complete mortification and complete anger. The head of the assembly, the Jotun, Utgard Loki, shook his head in disappointment, and muttered the idea that perhaps Thor was not as mighty as they had heard. It was customary for the giants in Utgard Loki to empty the horn in a single swig. He then proposed a simpler contest. Thor was to lift a cat off the floor of the stronghold. Unsure now, Thor curved his hand around the stomach of the cat in preparation to lift it. The cat, however, seemed to be heavier than it seemed. With both hands now, and all the brawn he could muster, 
Thor was only able to lift the cat, enough for one of its paws to be an inch of the floor, before his strength gave out and he fell to the floor tired. This was cause for amusement on the part of the Jotuns, whereby Thor, after another humiliation, proclaimed that he was the best wrestler of the Aesir and would be able to take on anyone. The giants were doubtful and were unsure who they could pit against Thor, as he seemed weaker than what they thought he was. Utgard Loki then remembered his adoptive mother. Some accounts say she was his nursemaid, an old woman named Eli, and summoned her to take on Thor. Embarrassed at whom he was pitted against, Thor set out to grab the arm of the old woman without the force needed to injure her. To his surprise, the woman easily flung him into the air. The old nursemaid laughed, the giants alongside her. Without restraint Thor grappled with the wizened crone, but no matter what techniques Thor used, Ellie seemed to have bested Thor, until Thor was forced to concede the match and left, humiliated. The next day, Utgard Loki led the four travelers to the gates of the stronghold himself, and unveiled to them that they had employed magical means against them to gain the upper hand. Utgard Loki said that the giant Skrimir, whom they met earlier, was him in disguise. The provisions he had wanted to share with them were intentionally fashioned with iron strands and enforced with troll magic to ensure that they could not open the bag. Thor's earlier attempts to wake the giant were actually Thor smiting Mjolnir against a rock. To corroborate this, Utgard Loki advised Thor to search for a rock with three indentations caused by his hammer. The contests the three men took part in were also rigged with magic. Loki's earlier contest with the giant Loji to see who could consume the most food proved to be an exercise in futility, for in reality, the giant was fire, and he could consume all that was in his path. Tiafi's opponent Hugi was the representation of thought, and no mortal could hope to match the speed at which a person thinks, much less outpace it. As for Thor, the drinking horn was connected to the oceans of the world, and his attempts would have led him to drain the waters, but only caused the formation of tides as Thor paused in his attempts. The cat was simply Jormungand in the guise of a spell. As Jormungand was an enormous serpent whose breadth circled the entire world, Thor could only lift a small portion of it. When Thor thought he lifted the paw of the disguised feline, in reality, he made the serpent's back breach the sky. Lastly, the old woman who wrestled with Thor was the representation of old age, and thus, could never be broken down by anyone, regardless of their might and prowess, as old age would bring anyone down. Angered at the tricks the giants had employed, Thor made to swing his hammer at Utgard Loki. However, the giant and the citadel itself disappeared into thin air. Despite the metaphorical contests that Thor, Loki and Tiafi took part in, it merely served to reinforce that the entire race of Jutenheim still held Thor in fear, as they had resorted to various magical means, trickery, and illusory magic to stave off the potential threat of Thor breaching the strongholds of the Jotuns in Jutenheim. Thor in turn, was assuaged that he was able to create the tides that now form part of the oceans, as well as his show of strength when he created the three large indentations in the rock that he now passed. 6.6. .6. Conclusion One of the main characters in the chapter of giants is Thor, as he is the one who comes into the most contact with the Jotuns, as the best and strongest defender of Asgard and the Aesir. Here, it can be seen that despite Thor's might, he is still subject to the mystical forces that were employed against him, and at times, can actually be tricked, as Loki did with Garrod. Thor was able to overcome these hindrances eventually, and come out victorious, save for the contests in the illusory realm of Utgard Loki. Thor's duel with Ringnur and the subsequent defeat of Ringnur was a blow to the morale of the giants, and it is believed that they no longer sought to storm Asgard until the dawn of Ragnarok, when they fought the gods. 7. The Other Denizens Aside from the men and women of Midgard, the two generations of gods who resided in Asgard and Vanaheim, and their enemies, the giants of Jutenheim, other creatures also resided and formed part of the Nine Realms, such as the dwarves, the dark elves, and those who lived in the cerulean depths of the seas that the Vikings take to. The myths associated with these other inhabitants are in themselves richly detailed and provide additional insight into the stories of the gods that the Vikings had worshipped. 7.1. Nidavellir, the land of dwarves. Contrary to popular portrayal, Nidavellir is not a forge set in space but was set to be deep underground, beneath the roots of Yggdrasil, 
or in other accounts, was not a realm in itself, but was merely a portion of Svartalheim, the same way the domain of Hell was part of Niflheim. The dwarves who inhabited Niflheim were formed from the maggots which were in Ymir's corpse, as Odin and his siblings slew the primordial giant. The maggots were given human-like features, though stunted, and were tasked to watch over the treasures of the earth, such as the precious metals and stones that were found deep within the soil. The dwarves too were endowed with sentience and knowledge. The dwarves were not only renowned for their wisdom, and their love to show off their knowledge as with the myth of Thor and Alvis, but also their reputation as the wondrous workers of metals. Their forges were able to enchant the metals of the earth with magical properties that made their products among the most highly sought-after treasures amongst the Aesir and even the giants. 7.2. The Treasures of the Dwarves The treasures of the dwarves were among the more fabled stories shared by the Vikings in Norse mythology, as it came to show how the gods themselves were able to acquire these magical items. The treasures came to be with the myth of Seif and Loki. Earlier in Chapter 4, we heard the story about how Loki schemed, and one of his schemes involved the shearing off of Seif's golden hair. Distraught at the loss of her hair, Seif told Thor what had happened, whereby Thor was sufficiently enraged and threatened to dismember Loki. Loki, with a remorseful air promising to correct what he had done and make up for the additional distress, brought several more treasures back from Nidavellir. Loki headed toward the realm of the dwarves, deep underground. Earlier, it was mentioned that the dwarves, as they watched over the metals in the earth, grew to be known for their talent in the shaping of metal. Loki first went to the cave where Ivaldi's dwarf children lived. He narrated his request to the brothers, about how he needed an object that would be similar to Seif's hair. Listening to Loki's request, the two brothers cast the gold into their forge and created a wig made of golden thread, spun so fine that it was light enough to resemble hair. The enchantments that were woven into the wig allowed the wig to grow similarly to natural hair. As the heat of the forge still burned hotly, the dwarves sought to curry favor with the gods, and they used the heat to create more treasures for Loki to take back with him to Asgard. From the heat, the two brothers created the magical ship Skidbladnir, which would be given to Freyr. The ship was said to be able to carry the entire host of the Aesir, and was always known to receive the most favorable breezes that enabled it to sail over various terrains. The most important magical property of the ship was its portability, in that it could be folded up and stored in a pocket for ready transport. The last item that the brothers were able to forge from the heat of their furnace was the spearhead of Gingnur, which would be given to Odin, who would mount it on a body carved from the wood of Yggdrasil. The spear would be imbued with the property of accuracy in that when it is thrown at a target, it would never miss its mark. Bearing gifts, Loki made his way back to Asgard, but on a whim, decided to stop by the cave of the brothers Brock and Eitri. Upon showing the two brothers the treasures that the sons of Ivaldi had crafted for the Aesir, Loki, who saw an opportunity to win more favors from the Aesir, slyly convinced the brothers to take part in a contest, to see who would be able to create better treasures for the Aesir. To add to the stakes of the contest, Loki rashly staked his head as the prize to whoever would win. Loki attempted to sabotage the brothers' effort, as he turned himself into a gadfly and stung Brock. Despite this the dwarves were able to create Gullenbrusti, a boar whose bristles and crest were gilded with gold that Loki would later give to Freyr as his mount. The enchanted ring, Dropnir, came from the fires of the same forge. This ring dripped an octet of new rings every nine days, symbolic of limitless wealth and power. The last item the forge made was the enchanted mallet, Njalnir. In the realization that he was about to lose the wager that he rashly made with the brothers, Loki continued to sting relentlessly as the handle of the hammer was shaped. As blood trickled down and momentarily blinded Brock who let the fire cool, the handle was left short as it could no longer be shaped by the heat of the fire. It can be recalled that the hammer had the magical properties of unerring accuracy when it is aimed at its targets and would always return to the hands of its wielder, later the god Thor. Back at Asgard, Loki presented the crafted treasures to the Aesir, who marveled at the wonders that Loki had returned with. It was a consensus that Mjolnir was the best treasure, as this would prove to be useful against the threat of the giants. As a result, 
Brock won the wager and demanded Loki's head as the subject of the rashly made wager. Loki then attempted to negate the agreement and taunted Brock to catch him. Brock merely asked Thor if he could seize Loki, which the god did. Loki attempted to negotiate his way out of the wager he made, stating, just as the dwarf was about to behead him, that the agreement only stated that Loki's head would be forfeit, not his neck nor any other part of his body. Annoyed, Brock chose to sew Loki's lips shut with the use of Eitri's awl, which was enough to create passages through which Brock could thread a thong that he used to silence Loki in his deceptions. As for Seif, the main victim of the story, she was delighted with how the wig grew like natural hair, and was often used by the Vikings as a simile to gold. 7.3. The Other Beings of Norse Mythology Aside from the reputation of the dwarves as master craftsmen, this section narrates the stories of the other creatures, whose roles are too prevalent to pass over in a discussion of Norse mythology. If one will recall, the Vikings paid homage to the sea and were skilled sailors in themselves. Though Nord was the patron of sailors and fishermen and was often invoked by them, he held no sway over the tempests that arose far from the Viking shores, save for the ability to calm them. This was the purview of the god and goddess of the oceans and their depths, Agar and his wife Ran. 7.4. Agar and Ran, the Dwellers of the Deep. Agar, sometimes spelled as Eager, was a Jotun, whose domain was the sea, and whose home was said to be situated in the Kattegat Strait off Denmark. Agar was said to be one of the forces of nature, and his existence was believed to predate the two generations of gods. Agar was often depicted in mythology as an elderly man with white hair and fingers that were perpetually snarled as claws. As Nord would calm the sea, Agar only rose as a force of destruction and often caused shipwrecks and caused a myriad of capsized ships. For this very reason, sacrificial rites to Agar involved the sacrifice of a human prisoner in the name of the god to ensure that the Vikings who were in expeditions were granted a safe passage toward their homesteads. Though Agar was initially hostile to the Aesir, given his Jotun relationship, Agar was known to throw feasts in his underwater hall, he'll see inside a cave constructed of corals, and lit not with candles, but with the gleam of the gold from the sea. Ran was the sister and spouse of Agar, who represented the variances that the sea exhibited. At times she was benevolent to the Vikings, and at times she raged and seethed and was a force of destruction. A possession of Ran's was her net, which she cast upon sailors and dragged them beneath the depths of the sea. They were not drowned however, but were regaled by Ran and Agar in their subsurface hall. A trait associated with Ran is her love for all gold, and as sailors curried the favor of Agar with human sacrifices, sailors who sought to appease Ran often pocketed gold to ensure that they gained her favor. 7.5. The Children of Loki For this discussion, the children of Loki, who are to be presented here, are the brood he had fathered with the frost giantess Angerboda. His children with the goddess Sigyn played relatively minor roles. 7.5.1. Angerboda. Angerboda, sometimes spelled as Angerboda, literally translates as she who brings distress. There are two accounts as to what Angerboda really was. Some myths portray her as a female ogre, and some myths portray her as a frost giantess. She was known to be the mistress of Loki the father of lies, and with him, was the matriarch of a brood that terrified the gods, with the notion that if these were left to grow, they would potentially threaten the existence of the universe, and took steps to contain these potential threats. A group of gods took the initiative and broke into the residence of Angerboda, secured her with bonds, and made sure that she could not speak, and took her and her monstrous brood to Asgard. Though the children were initially dealt with, Odin knew that this was merely a stopgap measure, that would protect the world until the dawn of Ragnarok. Her offspring were such that Odin used their potential threat as the rationalization as to why he chose the bravest warriors to perish and form part of his Ain Harriar. 7.6. Hel. Hel, also known as Hela, was the goddess of death and the ruler of the underworld, the domain which bears her name and which was carried over into Christianity and became its basis for the afterlife reserved for those who led wicked lives. Hell is often described as a terrifying entity to behold, whose body was representative of the balance of life and death. Half of her body took the form of a normal human being, 
with an appearance that resembled human flesh. The other half of her body bore the tinge of death, mottled greenish-black, where the flesh was similar to that of a corpse in the throes of decomposition, and a countenance that was at once grim, forbidding, and melancholic. Hell was described to be draconian in the way she ruled her domain, and her greed for the souls of humanity was unmatched and possessive of those who fell under her purview. When Odin banished Hell into the underworld, this would prove to be a grave error. Hell was given the responsibility to rule over all those who had died, the souls of the wicked, those who have died of misery, disease, and old age. Subsequently, Hell was able to wield this power over Odin, which made her influence stronger than his when she was able to keep Balder and Nana within her domain, despite the might of Odin. When the world of the Vikings was beset with pestilence and famine, Hel was believed to have temporarily left her deathly domain so that she may travel throughout Midgard on her mount, a steed with three legs. Then she may reap the souls of those who survive these events and return to the underworld with their souls, swept before her with a broom. Information about the domain of Hel can be found in Chapter 2, where Hel forms part of Niflheim and has its own unique geography that sets it apart from the icy mists that emanate from Niflheim. 7.7 Fenris. The Fenris wolf is sometimes known by the name Fenrir and was one of the monstrous children of Angerboda, sired by Loki. The Fenris wolf is said to be immense, that his mouth formed a gaping maw. The roof of his mouth breached the vault of the heavens, while his lower jaw scraped the surface of the earth. Once Odin and the other gods were able to break into Angerboda's residence and made the decisions as to the fate of the brood, the fate of Fenrir initially remained uncertain as he was still a cub when he was captured by the Aesir. With this dilemma, the Aesir resolved to raise the cub in Asgard itself. However, the appearance of Fenrir, though still a cub, was still fearsome, as the beast was still large and hairy. The gods remained fearful of him, and only Tyr was the one courageous enough to nourish the wolf with the slabs of meat. This meal caused the wolf to grow to such an immense size that the gods could not bear to have the wolf within their realm. Additionally, the Norns had informed Odin that to harbor the beast in their midst was to court his own death, as the wolf was prophesied to be the downfall of Odin. Though the gods knew that eventually the wolf would have to be dealt with, they could not countenance the need for bloodshed within their hallowed realm. The gods then decided to bind the wolf rather than slay him. Fenris was gifted a chain, where the Aesir proposed a form of amusement for him. Fenris would be bound to the chain, and he would try to break the chain as a test of his strength. The wolf was disdainful of the durability of the chain, but went on with the proposed game. The moment he was bound with the first chain, lading, Fenris playfully struggled and easily broke the chain. A second chain called Dromir was forged, whose bonds were stronger than lading, and offered it to Fenris with the same term. Fenris initially thought that this chain would be harder to break from, and thus wanted to prove his might to the gods. The wolf accepted the terms of the game, and consented to another round of the game. When he was bound with Dromir, Fenrir initially struggled, but was able to escape from his magically enforced restraints and reveled in this feat of strength. The gods began to worry that no chain would ever be strong enough to bind the wolf, and pinned their hopes on the ability of the dwarves, whom we earlier said were master craftsmen, to forge the most elaborate chain that was ever made. Skirner was dispatched to narrate the request of the Aesir to the dwarves, and how important the chain was to maintain the safety of the cosmos. The dwarves produced the magical chain, Gleipnir, whose composition was outlined in Chapter 4 under the myth of Tyr. Summarily, the chain was composed of abstract and non-existent concepts, which metaphysically, cannot be broken by any means as they never existed. Fenrir was then bound with the chain in the middle of an isolated island, set in the middle of a lake. The wolf was presented with a silken cord, which puzzled the beast. Though Fenrir thought that there was more to the cord than what it seemed, he could not back down from the game without the knowledge that he would be called a coward. The beast agreed, with the condition that one of the gods would put a hand in between the jaws of the wolf as a promise that there was no deception between them. Tyr volunteered his hand, and so the wolf was bound with the silken thread. Fenris struggled mightily to overcome the bounds, but found out that the cord would not break and bit off Tyr's hand. The chain was then looped through another chain, which in turn was looped through boulders so that Fenris may be secured. As Fenris tried to bite the gods for their betrayal, 
The sword was thrust between both halves of his jaw so that it may remain open. The wolf was finally bound, eternally howling, with spit produced in such great volumes that it gushed forth from his maw. This was not to last, as the wolf would eventually break free from his bonds, and with his immense mouth, swallow Odin. 7.8. Jormungand. Jormungand was an immense serpent, whose body was large enough to circle the entire world, and was often depicted in Norse mythology as a serpent with its tail in its mouth. As the Fenris wolf was destined to be the one who fells Odin, Jormungand was prophesied to cause the death of Thor and to fall by his hands as well. Once Angerboda and her children were brought to Asgard, Odin banished Hel to the underworld and threw Jormungand into the ocean, where the snake grew large enough that the oceans were not enough to contain him. Despite his size and potential to end the cosmos, Jormungand did not figure into a lot of mythology. Apart from his role in Ragnarok, the serpent appeared once more in the ill-timed fishing expedition of Thor and Hymir, which we touched on in Chapter 4. The use of the ox head as bait for the serpent, and which injured it, only irritated the enmity it had over Thor. 7.9. Valhalla, the Valkyries and the Ain Harriar. On a lighter note, after a journey into the recesses of the earth where we touched on the dwarves who dwelt deep within the cavernous interiors of Midgard, and even lower where we spoke about the grim goddess Hel, and her equally terrifying siblings, the Fenris Wolf and Jormungand, we head heavenwards toward the other residents of the Nine Realms. The Valkyries are a popular icon in Norse mythology, but one misconception must be corrected, they never wore horned helmets. Horned helmets were never part of the armory of a Viking, and can be taken as part of literary license when it was first depicted in an opera written by Richard Wagner. Despite this misconception, the Valkyries, regardless of their portrayal, maintained the same function, in that they were the handmaidens of Odin. 7.10. Valkyries. The Valkyries, sometimes called the Valkyrior, literally translate to, they who choose the slain. Valkyries were originally depicted in more sinister tones, as their presence augured death in the battlefield, an inevitability, and marked the fate of those they chose in the name of Odin, that they may spirit these warriors away to the halls of Valhalla. Later developments in Norse mythology softened the sinister interpretation of the Valkyrie, and reinvented them as the handmaidens of Odin, described as shield maidens, possessed of hair that shimmered like spun gold, virginal in appearance, with their skin that resembled the freshly fallen snow, who served the glorious dead in Valhalla. Later depictions saw the Valkyrie take the form of women, suitably attired in armor, who soared over the battlefield mounted on swans or horses, an interpretation straight from the pages of the Nibelungenlied, where one of the Valkyries, Brynhild, was known to be a fallen Valkyrie. Once a battle took place, the Valkyries swept down from Valhalla and kept watch over the warriors they had chosen from the battle, in keeping with their translation of their name. Valkyries were oddly named, not with traditional names such as Brynhild, as earlier stated, but with descriptive names such as Shrieking, Screaming, She Who Raises Storms, She Who Bears Spears, and various other names in deference to their darker origins as choosers of the dead. The Valkyries were not limitless in number, as they were believed to number anywhere from between six to a dozen of them. They were the handmaidens of Odin, and thus Odin himself commanded the Valkyries, who could be considered as an extension of his will. To defy Odin's command was to court banishment from the halls of Valhalla. Other accounts include the goddess Freya, who was the warrior leader of the Valkyries and was allowed to choose her own warriors, separate from those who would make up the Ain Harriar, to be brought to her hall in Sesramnir, in her domain of Folkvang instead of in Valhalla. The women who comprised the Valkyries were various goddesses descended from the members of the Aesir. Some of them were the daughters of Odin. The Valkyries, in rare occasions, were permitted by Odin to take the form of swan maidens. There was a condition that if a Valkyrie was seen by a mortal, without her swan plumage, she would lose her immortality and would never return to ferry the souls of the warriors to Valhalla. Other accounts however state that most can bind these maidens to them by hiding their swan plumage. Should the Valkyrie discover her hidden plumes, only then may she regain her memories and return to the place from where she came. Aside from their rather glorious purpose, the Valkyries did give in to certain desires however, and were often the consorts of humans in Midgard. 
To those whom the Valkyries had pledged their devotion, their lovers were often gifted certain advantages, either with the Valkyrie by their side, or with the foreknowledge of the events that would unfold in the battle. 7.11. The Ain Heriar. The Ain Heriar, when interpreted from the Nordic languages, means those who fight alone. However, this runs contrary to their description as the host of the glorious dead destined to fight alongside Odin in Ragnarok. The Ain Heriar often referred to those who have died gloriously, which we touched on in the section on Valhalla. To be part of the Ain Heriar, an important prerequisite is that a warrior would have to be chosen by Odin himself through the actions of his Valkyries. This brings to mind a debated topic, however, with how one gains entrance into the afterlife of the Vikings. This can be thought of in a comparison, where Valhalla is synonymous with the idea of heaven in Christianity, whereas hell is a parallel of hell in the same religion. However, the requirements for entry, as narrated earlier on in this book, about the fact that it is not a requisite for the warrior to have lived virtuously in his mortal life before he is selected by Odin to be part of his heavenly host of warriors. The requirements are dependent upon the circumstances of death, where the warrior was to have died in battle, and had perished with courage in his heart. Regardless of the circumstance of death, those who were chosen by the Valkyries to be part of the Ain Heriar experienced the same paradise. Once in Valhalla, the spirit of the warrior still encounters various obstacles to test their mettle, until they manage to reach the door Valgrind. Once there, they are met by either Hermod or Bragi, who would conduct them to the foot of Odin's throne in Valhalla, this is a different throne from Halidskalf. For the bravest of warriors, it is Odin himself who welcomes the warrior into the Viking paradise. There, the warriors could engage themselves in mock skirmishes as a form of practice before the final battle. Any wounds that were inflicted were healed at the end of the day, and those who had perished were resurrected, so that they may feast on the endless supplies of mead poured by the Valkyries from their drinking horns, and consume the inexhaustible supply of boar meat from Serumner, stewed by the Valhallen cook, Andrumner, in a large cauldron known as Eldrumner. Unlike most concepts of heaven and paradise in various mythologies and religions, the warriors of the Ain Heriar are merely suspended in a temporary state. It must be remembered that the idea of cyclical concepts was important to the Viking, as with life must come death. Therefore it can be seen that once Ragnarok dawns, the host of the Ain Heriar is destined to fall alongside their commander, and be annihilated in Ragnarok. 7.12. Conclusion It must be noted that while other creatures also resided in the other realms of Norse mythology, such as the elves and dark elves, or even the various spirits who composed the various elements that the Viking encountered, their stories are too minor when compared to the gods, giants and other members that they have been overshadowed by the more prominent of the other entities in Norse mythologies. The skilled craftsmanship of the dwarves, for instance, takes prominence, as the items forged by them have turned the tide in favor of the gods on numerous occasions, such as the use of Mjolnir to slay giants, among other treasures. Second, the other sea deities, Ran and Aegir, are a crucial part, as not only was it in their domain did Loki reveal his true character, but the sea, which forms part of the life of the seafarer Norsemen, was an integral part of their existence. The children of Loki were explicitly mentioned as they have their respective roles to play, not only in Ragnarok but also in the afterlife to which the Vikings may head toward. The Valkyries contrast them, as they are the heavenly maidens who presage death, but in such a manner that death is glorious rather than ignominious in itself, and thus, death becomes a means to free a soul to fight for a better world when Ragnarok comes. In chapters 4, 5, 6, and 7 of this book, it can be seen that various details of Viking life are interwoven into the lives of the Norse gods, which made them more relatable to the Norsemen who worshipped them. The gods were not entirely omnipotent, as Thor could be duped by Loki's duplicitousness, they were not omniscient, since Odin himself sought out other sources of knowledge, nor were they omnipresent, as Frigg herself had overlooked the mistletoe as she sought to protect her son. Immortality was a foreign concept, as the gods themselves were subject to death, as seen when Hel exerted her authority and kept Balder after his death, despite the relative power Odin possessed. They were subject to human foibles and were capable of emotions, despite their divinity. 
The next section would deal with the sagas that the Norsemen passed on the most. 8. The Stories of the Norsemen One of the more important aspects in the life of the Vikings was their need to chronicle their histories and exploits for the next generation. It must be recalled that before the invention of the runic alphabet in the older and younger forms of the Futhark, the Vikings had originally passed on these stories by word of mouth. It was only with the introduction of the Futhark did the Vikings earnestly begin to write down the stories that became part of a past time, that it was able to endure time to be interpreted into the stories that they are now. In this book, we touch on two concepts, the story of Sigurd, said to be one of the bravest champions of the Norsemen, and the story of Ragnarok, the culmination of all the myths that were narrated in the earlier chapters and the one that would close the stories of Norse mythology. Book 3 The Stories of the Norsemen 9. The Story of Signy and Sigurd The story of Sigurd originates from the saga, The Song of the Volsungs, one of the more elaborate versions of the story where he is the main character. Sigurd, sometimes known as Siegfried, had a name that translated to one who guards victory, or even one who is destined to victory. Regardless of the interpretation, the involvement of victory seems to be in his favor. Sigurd was said to be the descendant of Odin, and was a member of the Volsungs, from which the name of the saga is derived from. He was the equivalent of the idealized version of a hero to the Norsemen, where Sigurd was believed to be able to slay wyverns, liberate those who were unjustly imprisoned, who were able to wield magic, and a warrior whose prowess in the battlefield was unparalleled. There is the question of whether or not the details narrated in the tale were historical, but because of the fantastical elements interwoven, for the purposes of the story, this is considered as a myth. Before we head into the story of Sigurd, it is important to know what brought about the circumstances of the curse that doomed the champion of the Vikings. 9.1. The Curse of Anvari Odin, Loki and Honor, disguised as men, were on an expedition in Midgard, as they followed the meander of a river, which led them to a waterfall. On the rocks by the waterfall, the three gods saw an otter devouring a freshly caught salmon. Loki slew the otter with a well-aimed rock, and the three gods took the carcasses of the otter and the salmon with them. As the night drew closer, the three gods sought hospitality at the house of a nearby farmer. In exchange for the farmer, Rymar's hospitality, the three showed the carcasses of the otter and the salmon. When Reedmar saw the corpse of the otter, he summoned his sons Fafnir and Regin and informed them that the men who sought shelter within their walls had killed their brother and asked what should be done to them. Reedmar and his sons were enraged, as the otter was the son of the farmer. The otter was Otter, a skilled fisherman who could change into an otter. The farmer and his sons began to sharpen their weapons to avenge the death of their brother. However, Odin proposed a means by which they could settle all the wealth that they could ever want from the Aesir. Reedmar seemed to consider this as a reasonable compromise, and flayed the skin off the otter, with the instructions that the men give him enough wealth to cover the otter pelt, within it, and on its exterior. Loki was chosen to go to the realm of the dwarves for the gold needed for the settlement. In a nearby river he saw the dwarf, Anvari, in the form of a fish. Loki snared Anvari and held him ransom for all the gold that he had. Anvari agreed, and took Loki to where he stored his cache of gold. Anvari gave all his gold to Loki, save for one ring which he attempted to hide from him. Loki noticed, and remarked, that their agreement in exchange for his freedom was all the gold that was in the dwarf's possession. In frustration, Anvari gave Loki a ring but cast a curse on it, that henceforth, the ring would be the cause of the death of whoever possessed it. Loki was amused at this, and despite the curse, he pocketed the ring. It must be noted that Loki believed in the potency of the curse, and gloried in the potential misfortune that was to befall Reedmar when he was to be given the ring. The amount of gold was enough to cover the otter skin that Reedmar provided, and Odin noticed the ring, as it was exquisitely crafted, and pocketed the ring for himself. As the three gods presented the otter skin to Reedmar, an onerous task in itself, as the skin had the magical ability to stretch itself and thus accommodate an immense amount of gold, Reedmar examined the skin and disapproved. Though the amount of gold completely covered the expanded pelt, there was a whisker that was left exposed. 
Odin regretfully took the ring from his pocket and tossed it onto the pile, and it proved sufficient enough to cover the exposed whisker. At this, Odin remarked that they had provided the restitution that was requested for, and kept up their end of the bargain, and asked if they could leave. Reedmar assented and unbound the gods from their fetters. As the three gods gathered their supplies and weapons, Loki left a parting statement and informed Reedmar about the curse that was laid upon the ring. No sooner had the three departed, had Regin and Fafnir appeared and informed their father that a portion of the gold was due to them. Reedmar ridiculed their presumption and revealed his intention that he was never going to let them partake in the newly acquired wealth. At this statement, the two brothers slew their father, and thus was the first death attributed to the curse of Anvari. Fafner attempted to abscond with the treasure, Regin was able to snare his brother and informed him that the fairest means was to split the treasure into equal portions. Fafner objected to the idea, and remarked that this treasure was enough for him to kill his father, and that there was no likelihood that he would ever share the wealth with Regin. Fafner bade Regin leave him alone, lest he suffers the same fate as their father. To ensure that Regin never followed him, Fafner fled to an isolated and uninhabited field where he hid the treasure in a cave. To guard this, Fafner took on the form of a worm that crawled on its belly, and there he watched over his treasure, unknowing that he too would later fall victim to the curse that struck down his father. 9.2. The Saga the story of Sigurd begins with the monarch, Sigmund, descended from Ririr, who in turn was the son of Sigi, one of the numerous offspring of Odin. Sigmund was able to obtain the hand of Hajordis, a princess renowned for her beauty, in marriage. For Sigmund to be deemed worthy of her hand, he had to fight innumerable battles and overcome various hindrances that beset him throughout his lifespan. Sigmund, however, was an old man when he won the hand of Hajordis, which was among the many accomplishments attributed to his reputation. He was not the only one who fought for the hand of Hajordis, as she too was wooed by another ruler named Lingvi, who was far younger than Sigmund and less accomplished given his relative lack of experience. Hajordis chose Sigmund to wed, as she felt that he was able to prove himself through his valor and accomplishments in battle. However, Lingvi did not take his loss well, and arranged to pit his forces against Sigmund that he may take the bride that he felt was his by right. During the skirmish, Sigmund found himself in the presence of a man with tall stature, who was possessed of a single eye, visible beneath the broad brim of his hat. This man attacked the old monarch with his spear, but Sigmund fought him off with his sword. However, the sword was not a conventional weapon, as it was given to him by Odin when Sigmund was in his prime and could cut through metal like cloth. The sword, however, despite its divine origins, was not a match for the spear wielded by Odin, the stranger who faced Sigmund. The spear struck the sword and cleaved the blade in half, and proved to be the blow that would end the old king's life. Odin then vanished, to prepare for the arrival of Sigmund in Valhalla. Hajordis found her husband in the throes of death on the battlefield, and did what she could to stem the flow of blood from the grievous wound. Sigmund outlined her face and then told her she was pregnant. This child would grow to be a magnificent warrior, and he shall be the one to avenge his father's death. He asked Hajordis to keep the pieces of the shattered sword, as it would be reforged into a stronger weapon than it was before. The sword was to be given the name Graham, and it would be wielded by their son, who would achieve deeds that many would believe were impossible to do. His name would always be known, as long as songs are still sung from the lips of humanity. With this he told his wife that he was now ready to meet with those who came before him, and there, the monarch finally breathed his last. After a few months, Hajordis was under the protection of another king, Hjalprek. While under his protection, she birthed a boy. Hjalprek was in awe at the eyes of the boy, described to be piercing, and foretold that the boy would become a man with no equal. Hajordis then gave him the name Sigurd. To raise Rymar's son, Regin became Sigurd's foster father. Regin provided instruction on various types of activities that promoted his athleticism and honed his skill in melee combat. Aside from the physical aspect, Regin trained Sigurd too, to be a linguist as well as the ability to write with the runic alphabet lessons, which were usually taught to the sons of kings. The time came for Sigurd to choose a mount for himself. Being in the forest, he came across a man with only one eye and a long beard. 
The man advised Sigurd that in his search for the right steed, which he put to the horses, he would encounter a test, where he instructed Sigurd. Sigurd, with these instructions, then drove the horses into a raging river, and then observed to see which horse was courageous enough to swim across the river, and not falter and turn back the pathway from which they came. All the horses fled the side of the river except for one horse, a young, attractive grey stallion whom Sigurd immediately chose. The old man approved of his choice and informed Sigurd that this horse who was named Granny, was descended from Sleipnir, Odin's eight-legged horse. The old man then disappeared after imparting this information. When Sigurd returned with Granny to the house of his foster father, Regin remarked that Sigurd finally found a horse as fine as Sigurd himself. However, Sigurd still lacked in material wealth for someone of his ancestry and appearance. Regin then disclosed that he knew where Sigurd would obtain a source of wealth and at the same time achieve fame. Regin then narrated the story of his father, Reedmar, who was murdered by Regin's brother, Fafnir, who took the gold of Reedmar and cached the stolen wealth in a cave, where he watched over it in the shape of a dragon. Sigurd expressed sympathy with Regin's loss and stated that Fafnir behaved reprehensibly toward Regin. He then swore to correct this by fighting Fafnir and avenging Regin's honor. He first asked Regin, however, that he must fulfill the prophecy foretold by Sigmund and reforge the pieces of his father's sword. After Sigurd got the pieces of his father's sword from Hajordas, it was quickly forged again. Sigurd tested the sword and easily cleaved the blacksmith's anvil on which the sword was forged and split in two, a tuft of wool that was set to encounter the sword downstream. Regin remarked that he had fulfilled his part. Now it was time for Sigurd to fulfill his. Sigurd promised to fulfill his vow to Regin, but before that, it was time to fulfill what his father had foretold, his role as his father's avenger. King Hjalprek equipped Sigurd with the armies and ships that he would need to take over the lands of Lingvi, the rival king who murdered his father. As the ships made their way to the land, they faced a storm that threatened to tear asunder the sails of the ships. Once the ships had passed by a crag, a man called out to them and queried as to who led the flotilla of ships. After being told that it was Sigurd who led the flotilla, the man asked to join their journey, and when asked his name, he narrated many of the titles associated with Odin. Once the man was on the boat, the storm ceased, and the man disappeared the moment they landed ashore in the domain of Lingvi. From the very moment Sigurd and his army landed ashore, they promptly pillaged the villages that were in their path. The survivors of the slaughter informed their king as to who led the army toward his kingdom. When Lingvi was told that it was Sigurd, the murderous king turned ashen, as he believed that he had ended the line of Sigmund and ended the familial line of the Volsungs. The king was obstinate and refused to be cowed, and summoned his own army to face the son of Sigmund. When the confrontation came there was a lot of bloodshed. As arrows flew from various directions, the wooden shields were readily split by sharply honed axes, swords pierced the hearts and clubs smashed the heads of the warriors. Never had there been a battle of such savagery. Through all this, Sigurd waded through the ranks of the enemies, easily carving a path with Graham through all the men, armor and swords in his way. Sigurd came face to face with his father's murderer, and though it took a long time to happen, the battle was brief, as Graham easily split the king with one stroke, and not only cleaved his body but his armor in half. The same fate befell Lingvis' brother, who attempted to rush Sigurd. Just as Lingvi sought to end the line of the Volsungs, Sigurd ended the line of Lingvi, when he gathered his sons and slew them, and proceeded to decimate the remnants of the army of the fallen king. He took Lingvi's gold as his prize, refreshed himself, and returned home with the spoils of war. Sigurd was honored when he returned to Hjalprek's court, and next sought to fulfill his promise to Regin that he would slay his perfidious brother, Fafnir. After a few days, Regin and Sigurd made their way to the valley where Regin said that Fafnir lay over his cache of stolen wealth. It was not hard to find, as the dragon cut a large path from the pond where he refreshed himself to the cave where he resided. Sigurd commented that he was made to think that Fafnir was about the same size as a Midgardian snake, but the size of the path seemed to suggest otherwise. Regin evaded the question and began to issue instructions as to how Sigurd can take advantage of the beast. Sigurd was to dig a trench that would lie across the pathway made by the dragon, crouch in the trench, and then stab the creature in the heart when he was able to. Should Sigurd accomplish this, he would be able to achieve the reputation that he needed. 
Sigurd asked if he would not drown should the blood of the dragon fill the ditch. Regin simply implied that Sigurd seemed fearful, and perhaps was not as bold of heart as his kinsmen before him. Sigurd then proceeded to do what Regin instructed. However, Regin, who feared Fafnir, rode away. A one eyed old man then drew near towards Sigurd and questioned what Sigurd was doing, and when hearing his answer, the old man disapproved and noted that instead of a singular ditch, Sigurd should create a network of them, so that the blood of the dragon would not inundate him, and he may safely kill Fafnir. Sigurd considered this to be a wonderful idea, and when he tried to express his gratitude to the man, the man disappeared. Sigurd did as he was advised, and sat in the trenches to await the dragon. Tremors were felt on the ground, and the dragon began to spout venom as he made his way to the pond for his drink. As the dragon's heart was directly over its head, Sigurd dug the beast through its underside and plunged the sword in deep. As blood poured from the wound, Sigurd pulled the sword out and escaped from the pit. The tremors became more violent, as the dragon was in full agony, still with the ability to destroy everything around it. As Fafnir lay dying, he saw Sigurd and asked who Sigurd was and from which family he came. When Sigurd replied as to his pedigree, the dragon remarked that his treasure would be of no match for his line, as it was cursed to bring death to whoever owned it. Sigurd then remarked that would be true of all wealth, as it is sought after by many, until the time that others would kill the person to take it for their own. He added that the treasure was now his, and that the dragon would head to hell. The dragon then died. Regin resurfaced and saw that the beast had fallen and congratulated Sigurd, though Regin remarked that Sigurd had killed Regin's brother. Sigurd was then asked by Regin to roast the heart of the dragon for Regin to consume. Sigurd complied, and when he tasted the heart to see if it was sufficiently roasted, Sigurd found that he could understand the twittering of the birds above him. In the nearest tree, a group of them chirped, and one of the birds remarked on the possibility that if only Sigurd knew what the effects of consuming the heart himself would have, that he would become the wisest of men, he would surely consume the heart for himself. The other bird remarked that would be true, and if he knew that Regin would kill him, Sigurd would most likely kill Regin too. It would be doubtful that Regin would let Sigurd free after Sigurd had killed Fafnir. A third bird further added that if Sigurd was clever enough, he would take the gold for himself, and travel to the mountain known as Hinderfell, where Brynhild, the Valkyrie, was kidnapped to teach him more in the ways of the wise. At this wisdom from the birds, Sigurd decided that Regin would meet the same fate as his brother, and slew his foster father. Sigurd then consumed part of Fafnir's heart and kept the rest before he went to explore the hidden treasures of Fafnir. The cavern was secured by two iron doors which were left agape, and in them were enough gold and treasures to fill up two large chests. Granny was able to bear this burden without any strain, and with that, Sigurd left to follow the advice he had obtained from the birds. Sigurd had his first peak of Hinderfell, after he had traversed various terrains and forded numerous raging rivers. The mountain was lit up like a beacon, whose light was directed heavenwards. At the summit of the mountain, Sigurd encountered a fortification made of shields with a banner mounted atop of it. Inside the fortification of shields lay a person wearing armor. As Sigurd took off his helmet he realized that it was not a man, for before him lay a woman. The armor was securely fastened to the woman's body, as though her body strained against it. With that Sigurd pulled his sword from its scabbard and cut the woman free of her armor. He bade her awaken, as she had slept for a long time. The woman began to awaken, and in the throes of her awakening she glanced at Sigurd and queried if he was the son of Sigmund, as it was he who was predestined to arouse her from her slumber. Sigurd affirmed her question, and the woman then narrated how she came to be in Midgard. She described herself to be one of those who chose the slain, the ones who determined the outcome of a battle, and among those who served Odin. Two kings fought, and Odin sought to grant victory to one king, but she transgressed her bounds and granted victory to the king's opponent. In retaliation, Odin dragged her and kept her imprisoned in an enchanted sleep. Sigurd then asked, now that she had awoken from her slumber, perhaps he may acquire some of the wisdom she was foretold to impart to him. Brynhild, the name of the woman, got up and poured them both drinks and began to impart what she knew to Sigurd. After their exchange, Sigurd gazed deeply into Brynhild's eyes and said that he had never met anyone as wise as her or as beautiful as her, 
and swore that he would marry her. Brynhild remarked that if she were given a choice of any man to wed, she would choose Sigurd. Neither of them knew of the directions that fate was to take them. The pair descended from the mountain where Sigurd brought Brynhild to Beckhilds, her sister Hall, who was wed to Hamir, a chieftain. By this time, the exploits of Sigurd and how he vanquished Fafnir had spread, and as a result, he was warmly welcomed and thrown into a sumptuous feast by the locals. The locals marveled over Brynhild, in that she was able to yield herself unto a man, when she was reputed to have spurned the advances of many. Gudrun, the daughter of a powerful monarch named Juki, arrived after a few days, morose and unable to express any joy. Brynhild approached her, whereby Gudrun confessed to Brynhild that she was plagued by nightmares. Gudrun knew that Brynhild could interpret dreams and so sought her counsel. Brynhild asked her to narrate the events of her dream. Gudrun narrated that in her dream, she had entered a forest, and she came upon a stag, who was mighty in appearance and had a regal bearing. The coat of the stag was golden, as it shone in the sunlight that filtered through the forest canopy. Gudrun narrated that the stag was desired by both her and Brynhild, and both pursued it, but Gudrun was the only one able to capture it. After that, Brynhild fired an arrow at its chest, where it fell dead. Gudrun was disturbed at the death of the stag. Grim-faced, Brynhild interpreted the dream and said that Gudrun would obtain Sigurd, the man who pledged himself to Brynhild, as her husband, but Brynhild herself would ensure that Gudrun would not have him for long, as she would be the cause of his death. Gudrun was aggrieved at this interpretation, and left for the court of her father. Shortly after that, Sigurd's exploits set him on the path toward Gudrun's father. A watchman who espied Sigurd's approach hastened to his king, and informed him that a man who resembled the gods approached the gates. The man was clad in gold, and his weapons were of the finest craftsmanship, with a horse that was far superior to other horses, and the size of the man was unlike any other man. The king and some of his attendants went out to meet Sigurd, and when they faced each other, the king asked who the man was, and stated that no man might enter his castle without the consent of his sons, who were veterans of countless battles. Sigurd proclaimed that it was he, Sigurd, the son of Sigmund. Juki, overjoyed, warmly welcomed him and told him to help himself to what he wanted. Sigurd was treated well by the inhabitants of the kingdom and stayed for some time. He frequently rode horses and engaged in sports with Gunnar and Hogni, who were sons of the king, where despite their skillfulness and might, Sigurd still bested them at every competition. Grimhald, the queen of the realm, was able to observe that Sigurd loved Brynhild due to his manner of speech when he referred to her. However, Grimhald was wily, and noted how Sigurd would be more useful to her family were he to wed Gudrun instead. Sigurd was a capable, attractive, and accomplished man, and was descended from a royal line and had accumulated enough wealth. Grimhald then connived to ensure that Sigurd would marry into her family, rather than fulfill his pledge to Brynhild. Grimhald had to her advantage not only her royal status but also her skills as a sorceress. She seized her advantage one day when she passed on to Sigurd a drinking horn, whose contents were bewitched to make Sigurd forget his promise to Brynhild. Sigurd imbibed from the horn, and when she was sure that the potion took its desired effect, Grimhald told Sigurd that he seemed to be happy in her realm. Why not join it, and take his father Juki and his brothers Gunnar and Hogni, and make Gudrun his wife? Gudrun made her way to Sigurd, and honored him with drink libation. Sigurd noticed her winsomeness and elegance and agreed with Grimhide's proposition. Sigurd pledged an oath to Gunnar and Hogni that he would treat them as brothers. Feasting took place, and at the culmination of the feast, Sigurd and Gudrun were wed. Sigurd, Gunnar and Hogni traveled far and wide, and their exploits became legendary as they accumulated more wealth and riches than anyone before them. Grimhald then approached Gunnar and asked him to obtain the hand of Brynhild, as she would be the one best suited for him, and allowed that Sigurd would endorse the suggestion. Gunnar agreed, and when he told Sigurd, Sigurd himself approved of the plan and readied himself to accompany Gunnar and speak for him. Sigurd, Gunnar and Hogni made their way to the Hall of Budli, the king who was Brynhild's father. The three men were a splendid sight, as they were finely garbed and possessed finely crafted weapons. Then they outlined that Gunnar wanted to ask for Brynhild's hand, but Brynhild was distressed. Sigurd was the first and only man she had ever desired, and pledged himself to her atop the mount, and now was endorsing another man to wed her. She refused the proposition, 
which Gunner did not take kindly, as he swore to slay everyone and incinerate the hall if his wishes were not acquiesced to. Budley attempted to reason with Brynhild, who refused to see the advantages that a wedded alliance would have, and who instead offered to lead an army against King Juki. Budley disagreed with the idea, and said that if she insisted on this course of action, she would forfeit her legacy and favor. Brynhild knew that she had to make a decision, and devised a plan that involved a series of tests to see who would gain her hand in marriage. The tests would craft in such a way that Sigurd himself would succeed at them. She set her plan into motion by returning to her hall and enclosing it in a circle of fire, and said that whoever braved the fiery wall would be the one to claim her hand in marriage. Gunnar was unable to brave the flames, but with the shape-shifting skills passed on by Grimhold, persuaded Sigurd to take on his shape and rescue Brynhild. Sigurd, in the shape of Gunnar, mounted on Granny and rode into Brynhild's manor. Brynhild was stunned as she realized it was Gunnar and not Sigurd the one riding the flames. Sigurd, still in Gunnar's form, informed her that he had passed the test she set, and now that he had her father's permission, he asked her permission for her hand in marriage. Brynhild remarked that she was used to war rather than the domestic arts, at which Sigurd reminded her that she pledged to marry the man who would brave the wall of flame. Trapped by her own promise, Brynhild pledged herself to Sigurd in Gunnar's form. For three nights Sigurd in Gunnar's form lay with Brynhild but placed his sword Gram between them. When Brynhild questioned this, Sigurd remarked that a witch foretold that he would die should he not defer the consummation of his vows. Brynhild agreed, as this was in her favor, and the two were wedded in Hindarfell, where Sigurd woke Brynhild from her sleep, and there Sigurd gave her a ring that came from Fafnir's treasures, in exchange for the ring cursed by Anvari the dwarf. Juki and Grimhald, the monarchs, prepared a feast in welcome for the returning party. Sigurd and Gunnar both rode separately, where they resumed their usual forms, and once back in the hall, Brynhild stole longing glances at Sigurd, who by then was beginning to realize what had happened when the enchantment employed by Grimhold began to fade. A few days after Brynhild and Gudrun bathed in a nearby river, where the conversation turned to who had the greater husband. Brynhild goaded Gudrun, that Gunnar was the only one courageous enough to brave the circle of fire. Gudrun returned that a man like Gunnar would have never crossed the wall of flame to win her. Gudrun drove home the point. Then she said that it was Sigurd, in Gunnar's form who braved the fire, lay with her and gave her a ring, and as proof Gudrun tossed Brynhild the ring that Sigurd exchanged with Brynhild. Brynhild was aghast and returned to her room. As Gunnar tried to console her, she attempted to murder Gunnar, at which he and Hogni restrained her and pleaded that he didn't want to imprison her. Brynhild sneered and vowed that she would never be happy in his house and wailed and screamed throughout the hall. Gudrun asked Sigurd to speak with Brynhild, that he may tell why he did what he had done. He reminded her that he did it not out of cruelty, but because of love, and the fact that he forgot his pledge to her was not of his doing, but was his greatest regret. Brynhild refused to listen to the explanation, and said that she loathed Sigurd. Brynhild added that she no longer wished to live. When Gunnar next saw her, Brynhild presented him with two choices, that she left and returned to her father, or that Gunnar kill Sigurd. Both choices, Gunnar knew, would court dishonor upon his name. Gunnar and Hogni, who both swore oaths of brotherhood to Sigurd, were prohibited from harming Sigurd. They turned to their younger brother, Guttorm, to carry out the murder. To nourish his strength and rage, Gunnar and Hogni fed Guttorm with both snake and wolf meat, and thereby fed, Guttorm allowed himself to carry out his plan. Later that night, Guttorm walked into Sigurd's room, sword in hand. He watched Sigurd asleep with Gudrun wrapped in his arms. Even asleep, Sigurd still possessed a formidable aura. Guttorm quailed at this and left. A second attempt saw Guttorm's courage falter once more. A third attempt in the same night saw Guttorm finally stab Sigurd through his chest. As Guttorm attempted to flee from the room, Sigurd hurled Graham and cut Guttorm in half before Sigurd finally died. Gudrun woke up, covered in her beloved's blood, and screamed while Brynhild cackled from her room. Brynhild's moment of joy was short-lived as she later broke down into sobs. Though Gunnar attempted to console her and convince her to live, Brynhild refused and instructed instead that the servants gather all the gold and treasures to be placed in front of her. She screamed that should anyone desire the treasure, to just take it, as she did not want it. Brynhild took up a dagger and stabbed herself underneath her arm. Before she died, 
Brynhild quietly told them about their fate, for her family was going to suffer terribly, and that their family was bound to die with them. She made one final petition, that when Sigurd's body was burned on a funeral pyre, her body would be placed next to his, so that they could be together, perhaps, not in the way she had originally imagined. After this request she died, and all that she foretold came to pass. 10. The Twilight of the Gods, Ragnarok This chapter deals with the culmination of all the stories of the Aesir, and all the creatures that dwelt in the Nine Realms. Ragnarok is referred to by many names, but regardless of the translation, it carries the same interpretation in that it portrays the ultimate fate of the gods. The gods themselves knew that they could not forestall the inevitability of Ragnarok, and sought to reassure themselves through the use of omens and portents. The threat of Ragnarok remained a palpable threat, and the gods could do little but to prepare for the battle that was to come. 10.1. The Beginning of the End There are various signs indicative of the start of Ragnarok, but most sources of mythology concur that the events that led to Ragnarok commenced upon the death of Baldr, the Aesir who embodied innocence and light, all that was good in the world, and where all the good was extinguished, so the world began its descent into degeneracy. 10.2. Baldr's Death and a Promise from All of Creation It is perhaps prudent to start at the death of Baldr, as this was the first event that precipitated Ragnarok. Baldr, as he grew into his adolescence, was then plagued by nightmares that appeared to portend his death. None of the Aesir could properly give importance to the dreams that Baldr had, and his uneasiness cast a pall over the happiness that was in Asgard. Odin, determined to identify the cause of the nightmares of his son, mounted Sleipnir and made his way to the icy realm of Niflheim. Once there at the domain of Hel, Odin called up the spirit of a prophetess, one of the Valva. When she ascended from her eternal slumber, Odin said that he was Wegtam, a wanderer descended from Valtam. Odin asked the prophetess about why the domain of Hel was set for a feast, as it was bedecked in gold. The prophetess replied that Hel prepared to welcome the spirit of Baldr. When Odin asked the prophetess who would slay Baldr, she replied that it would be Hodor who would launch the fateful projectile that would kill his brother. Odin then queried if Baldr's death would be avenged, at which the prophetess replied that, as a son, would be born to Odin by Rhind Valley, who would avenge Baldr's death when he is barely a night old. Odin questioned as to who would decline to mourn for Baldr, at which point the prophetess realized that Wegtam was Odin in disguise and refused to answer more questions until such time that Loki broke free from his bonds. Frigg then realized that Baldr was in mortal peril, and dispatched her messengers throughout all corners of creation to ensure that nothing would harm Baldr. Inanimate objects, the forces of nature, the animals of the land and sea, the plants and various creatures that crawled the earth, and every single creature swore not to harm Baldr save for one, the mistletoe, which grew on an oak. This was deemed insignificant by Frigg, as it was quite frail. The Aesir found amusement in the news that Baldr was rendered invulnerable, with the promises extracted by Frigg from all creation. The younger generation of gods made a sport of throwing items at Baldr, and watching these items rebound from Baldr's body, in response to their promise to ensure that he would not be harmed. Though this practice may seem disrespectful, it is believed that Baldr took heart from this, as did the other gods who made sport of this, and believed that the launching of weapons at Baldr was a tribute to his invincibility, made possible by the love of his mother. Frigg, however, in her ready dismissal of the significance of the mistletoe, would prove to be a costly mistake. Loki was discontent and intent to discover Baldr's weakness, Loki disguised himself as an old woman and made his way into Frigg's domain. He pretended to be amazed at the audacity of the gods to make light of Baldr's fate. Loki wheedled the information he needed from Frigg, as he asked her, while in disguise, if there was one object in the realms whose oath she did not seek to harm her son. Frigg replied that she did not ask the mistletoe, as she thought that it was a small, frail object, that she believed it could not inflict any form of harm upon Baldr. Loki was gleeful at the information that he found out. Loki hastened to pluck a branch of the mistletoe, and it is here that some myths differ. Some myths state that Loki crafted a spear from the mistletoe, some myths state that Loki made a dart out of the mistletoe, and other sources of Baldr's myth state that a sprig of mistletoe was used. Regardless of the form of the mistletoe, 
they all had the same devastating effect. Loki, with the mistletoe, made his way to the fields of Idaval where the gods were at play, save for Hoder, who could not see and could not take part. Hoder was approached by Loki, and asked why he did not take part. When Hoder explained about his blindness, Loki offered to help him, as it seemed that Hoder was not honoring the invincibility bestowed by Frigg upon his brother, and presented him with the branch of mistletoe. Loki then guided his arm, and Hoder threw the mistletoe branch which pierced Balder and killed him. Hoder had not known what took place, as he heard the sound of the item in his hand striking its mark, a scream of pain, and the sounds of a body falling. The gods realized what had happened, and began to cry out laments at the death of Balder. The gods would have killed Hoder, had it not been for the fact that the law does not allow bloodshed in Idaval. Hoder left the camp and wept, alone. Odin realized what the death of his son meant, and that this would be the event that was a precursor to Ragnarok. Frigg remarked that the spirit of her son was sure to be within the domain of Hell, with the others who had died. It must be noted here that though Balder was a god, he was not immediately granted passage to Valhalla, as he had not died in battle. It is here that Odin's banishment of Hell into the underworld proved to be his folly, as he gave her a power that surpassed his, and it was she who had the power to keep the dead with her. Frigg said that should there be a god brave enough to venture into the domain of Hell, and discuss a means by which Balder may be returned to them, that God would earn her eternal love and respect. Hermod, one of the gods assembled, volunteered for the task, and though stricken with grief at the death of Balder, Hermod was resolute in his desire to perform the task that Frigg asked of the gods. Odin lent Hermod, the swift-legged Sleipnir, that he may hasten over the realm of Niflheim and make his way to the domain of Hell. As Hermod made his way into the misty realm of Niflheim, arrangements had to be made for the deceased. As was customary with Viking tradition, a grand ceremony to dispatched Balder into the afterlife. The ship as the gods prepared to launch it would not move an inch. Even Thor's tremendous strength was not enough to move the ship from the banks where it rested. Eager to get the ceremony underway, the assembly called upon the giantess Hyrokin, whose name meant one who was withered by fire. Hyrokin was a giantess who was renowned for her strength, and upon receipt of the summons, she rode forth from Jutenheim, mounted on a wolf with a harness of serpents. When the giantess arrived, it took four gods to properly subdue her mount. Hyrokin then went to the ship, and heaved so mightily that the ship that borne Baldur's body was launched into the water, and the earth shook from the effort expended by the giantess. Thor, the scourge of the giants, believed Hyrokin to have bad intentions, and would have struck her down had he not been held back by the assembled host. Balder was laid to rest on the ship that would serve as his funeral pyre, with tapestries, food, items of clothing, various weapons and treasures, as was customary with Viking practice. Nana Balder's wife was so stricken with grief that she died and was laid to rest beside him. A fire was then lit beneath the remains of Balder and Nana, where Thor consecrated the flame as it began to burn away at the wood beneath it. During the consecration rite, a dwarf named Lit made the mistake of crossing Thor's path, and the dwarf was swiftly dispatched into the flames of the ship. Baldur's mount and hounds were slain and laid alongside him, which Baldur may not want for anything. Lastly, Odin took off Dropnir, the enchanted ring that dripped eight others like it every nine nights, and laid it over Baldur's body, and whispered words into Baldur's ear. The solemn ceremony was witnessed not only by the gods themselves, but also by the dwarves, the elves, and even the giants. The fire that Thor blessed slowly consumed the boat, and from it, a grim black plume arose, along with the scent of the flesh being burned by the fire. As the gathered assembly watched the boat disappear, the flame that was Baldur's funeral pyre at last, sank beneath the waves of the sea. In the realization that the light and goodness had gone from the world, Odin realized that the end was soon to come and that with Baldur's death, the world would grow to become a darker place, and with it, would begin the loss of virtue and goodness. It would be the start of the world's descent into wickedness, and immorality. As though with this realization, nature itself came to a standstill, unnatural in its silence. Hermod was dispatched to bargain with Hel to return Baldur's soul to Asgard. As he accomplished his mission, he could not attend the funeral rites of his fallen brother. The journey to Niflheim and the domain of Hell lasted for nine days and nights. As the world grew darker around him, Hermod found that he could not rely on his senses any longer, 
and instead relied on the keener senses of Sleipnir, who was more accustomed to the environment. Through the darkness came a glimmer of gold. Hermod had reached the golden bridge that lay suspended over the river Joel. Here was the boundary that separated Niflheim from the grim domains of the goddess of death. Once Hermod, still mounted on Sleipnir, began to traverse the bridge, he was at once stopped by the guardian of Hell's domain, Modgud. Some accounts state that Modgud was a giant, others a giantess. Modgud's name translated to the fierceness of battle, and in keeping with the name, questioned who Hermod was and what was he to seek entrance into the underworld. Modgud added that the equivalent of five armies had marched across the bridge into the underworld, yet despite their immense number, they had not caused the bridge to shake as Hermod did just then. Modgud also remarked that Hermod looked more alive than the usual subjects who entered the deathly world. Hermod replied that he was sent to search for his brother Balder, who was believed to be in hell. He asked the guardian if he had seen Balder, to which Modgud replied that Balder had passed through a few days ago, and that Hermod may pass and continue his quest. Once across the bridge, Hermod reached the gate of hell. However, the gate was barred shut, and resisted all attempts to open it. The height of the wall to which the gate was attached was no obstacle for Sleipnir, however, who easily vaulted over the boundary, with Hermod mounted on his back. Once within the gates, Hermod made his way to Eliadner, the Hall of Hell, leaving Sleipnir outside. Once inside the Grim Hall, Hermod immediately spotted Balder, who had a stony expression, and was ashen, as he was seated to the immediate right of the sickbed, the throne where Hell sits. After a night in Hell's domain, Hermod presented his reasons for the incursion into the underworld, that he may seek the return of Balder, as the entirety of creation wept, as he was no longer with them. Hell grimly listened to the pleas of Hermod, and nodded her assent with a condition. Hell consented only if all creation wept for Balder, as Hermod had earlier proclaimed that all the creation wept for Balder. Hell sought to prove the claim that Hermod had made, but if there was one blade of grass or a single stone or anything in creation that would not shed a tear, Balder would stay within the realm of Hell. Hermod agreed to the terms that Hell had set, and thanked the grim goddess for her disposition to compromise. Hermod prepared to return to Asgard, and Balder gave Hermod the enchanted ring, Dropnir, the same ring that Odin had placed on his son's funeral pyre, so that Odin may remember Balder, and Nana, gave him jewelry and items of clothing that Hermod may take back with him to Frigg. Hermod returned with this condition. The gods wasted no time to convince every inhabitant of all the nine realms to ensure that all creation wept for Balder. By the time that they were done with their task, every human and god, the inhabitants of Alfheim and Nidavellir, the heavenly bodies and the waterways, the flora and fauna, and every earthly landform, shed tears for the fallen god. There was a glimmer of hope that Balder may be restored to the gods. However, they encountered the one object who would refuse to shed a tear for the fallen god. All the creation wept to save for a giantess named Thok, who was hard-hearted and remarked that Balder did nothing for her, and said that Hel should keep what belonged to her, as the giantess had no tears for Balder. In some accounts, Thok was believed to be Loki in disguise, and the fact that Thok refused to find enough sadness within her cold heart would ensure that the bright god remained enshrouded within the misty realms of Hel. With this news, Odin and Frigg knew that Balder would not return to them. Later on, Odin fulfilled the prophecy with Vali, who came to Asgard when he was barely a night old, and slew Hoder. 10.3. The Twilight Dawns The gods resolved to punish the perpetrator of the crime, Loki. While at a feast thrown by Aegir, Loki gate-crashed the assembly and began to insult the gods and goddesses who were present. Loki then ended his barrage of insults against the gathered assembly when he stabbed Femafeng, one of the attendants of Aegir. Thor threatened to smite Loki with Mjolnir for his audacity, at which Loki departed, bitter. Odin saw this as another portent that the end of the gods was to come soon. Loki had traversed beyond his purview of lies and tricks, and had progressed to acts that were just malevolent in nature. Loki must have made the same realization as he knew that the Aesir sought retribution for the death of Balder, and fled. Loki isolated himself in a hut with four doors that he may easily escape, hidden deep within the mountains. In the daytime, Loki changed himself into a salmon and swam in the nearby rivers. By night, Loki mended a fishing net, believed to have belonged to the sea goddess Ran. 
After several days of fruitless searches, Odin finally found Loki's hiding place from his perch in Halidskalf and led a host of gods to capture the recalcitrant trickster. Once at the hut that Loki had built to shelter himself, they found it empty save for a mended fishing net left upon the floors of the hut. Kvasir, who was among the host and was the wisest of the assembly, stated that the net Loki had left could be used to capture him, and the net was cast into the stream. Loki, in the shape of a salmon, attempted to evade the gods with his leaps. As the gods cast the net that Loki had mended into the river, Loki tried to perform his escape. He was then captured by Thor, who caught him by the tail as he attempted to leap past the net. Loki was then seized and bound by the gods in a dark cave, with the intestines of his son Narvi, who was killed by Vali, a different one, Loki's son with Sigyn, changed by the gods into a wolf. Once the intestines were wrapped around Loki's limbs, they were changed into iron and threaded through stones to ensure that Loki would remain bound. Skadi fastened a venomous snake to drip poison onto Loki's face. Sigyn remained with Loki to catch the venom that fell, save for the times that she went to empty the cup, and Loki caused earthquakes as the venom fell on his face. There he would remain until the end of time. With the death of Baldr, crimes and wars began to proliferate in Midgard, and death between brethren became commonplace, while the world began to descend into immorality. Ragnarok was presaged with the presence of the Fimble Winter, sometimes called the Fimble Vetter, the winter that would end all winters. The Fimble Vetter turned the world into a bitter and cold place, and spread darkness and chill throughout the realms. It was a time for death and famine, of despair and the loss of all that was good in the world. Skoll and Hattie came forth from the Ironwood Forest, where the two wolves finally caught up with their prey, and the sun and moon were swallowed, the blood of their drivers falling upon the earth alongside the stars, and thus was the Nine Realms plunged into complete darkness. 10.4. Ragnarok The earth was beset with tremors, and from his isolated prison, the Fenris wolf finally broke free of Gleipnir and sought retribution for the gods who had deceived him. Loki followed his offspring, and he too broke his bonds. Loki was to set sail on Nagfar, a ship made of the fingernails and toenails of the dead, and would lead the host of giants to the plains of Vigrid. Loki's daughter, Hel, arose from her banishment with her own army of the inglorious dead, and she too marshaled her forces on the plain. Her hound Garm was set loose, and thus was evil and the forces of destruction let loose upon the earth. Egther, who was a guardian of the Jotuns, played a note on his harp, which caused the rooster Halar to crow in fright. Gullenkambi, a rooster who perched outside Valhalla, began to crow, as did the unnamed sooty red rooster who perched in hell. These three roosters were the ones who warned the giants, gods, and the dead of the battle that was to come. Heimdall, the watchman of the gods, blew into the Yallerhorn, and thus the Aesir, who had prepared for this moment, galloped, fully armored toward the battle that had awaited them. In a last bid to prepare for the battle, Odin set off on Sleipnir to consult with Mimir's head and returned without any reassurance. The veiled faces of the Norns followed Odin, as the tapestry that they had woven over the years was rend. Odin took his place at the head of the army and charged with his spear, Gungnir. The seas began to froth and seethe as Jormungand, the serpent that Odin banished into the depths, surfaced and slithered toward land, his venom devastating the land. The grim ship Nogfar carried a host of giants, and Loki himself sailed toward the plains of Vigrid, along with the dead from Hel's domain. Hel left her domain and took with her Garm, the hound who guarded her domain, and the serpent Nidhogg, ready for the consumption of corpses for his nourishment. Loki led the forces of darkness, and once they trod upon Bifrost, the prismatic bridge shattered, but only after the terrible host had, at last, made their way to Vigrid. The fire giants of Muspelheim joined Loki's army, and were themselves led by Surt, who wielded his twilight sword and managed to devastate the realm of Asgard. The two sides of the army met at the field of Vigrid, believed to be the size of a hundred leagues. The giants stood with the monstrous brood of Loki. The Aesir and the Ain Harriar stood on the other side of the field with Odin. 10.5. The battle begins. Odin is the head of the gods and the forces of good, charged first and attacked the monstrous Fenris wolf, whose jaws gaped wider as they scraped the heavens and the earth, and the Allfather was swallowed by the gaping maw of the wolf. Vidar strode forward and with his iron-shod foot, ripped the wolf in half to avenge the death of his father. 
Thor was unable to come to the aid of Odin as he was engaged in battle with Jormungand. After years of mutual enmity, which festered between Thor and the snake, Thor was able to slay the immense serpent, but staggered only nine paces before he died from the effects of the potent venom the snake exuded. Loki and Heimdall, who had a score to settle, both fell into each other's hands. Tyr fought Garm the Hound of Hell, where both fell in battle. Vigrid at this time was a mass of corpses, with streams of blood and venom from those who had fallen. Freyr went up against Searcher and sorely missed his weapon, which he pledged as the bride price for Gerda, and easily fell at the hands of the fire giant. With the death of most of the combatants, Surt raised his sword and set the Nine Realms ablaze as he flung fire throughout the cosmos. The seas were boiling and the earth collapsed into the foaming sea. 10.6. Conclusion Ragnarok's story draws a full circle into the idea that not even the gods of the Norsemen were immune to the power of death, and this bolsters the cyclical construct of time that the Norsemen believed in. However, the same idea of Ragnarok draws us to the linear aspect of time, in that each event that had transpired in the past had culminated in the catastrophic battle of Ragnarok. Fenrir avenged the trickery that was played upon him, whereas Jormungand was able to get back at Thor after what Thor did to him on Hymir's fishing trip. Freyr realized his folly when he rashly promised his enchanted sword, which would have aided him in his battle when he had nothing to defend himself with, save the antler of a stag. Loki and Heimdall fell, their enmity resultant of the times that Heimdall thwarted Loki's schemes when he stopped the theft of Freya's Brisingamen necklace. The fates of the gods were part of a linear time, where each event builds up, until all the effects come together in the Battle of Ragnarok, which draws us to all the foreshadowed portents revealed in all of these myths, and concludes that fate was even stronger than all the powers of the divine. We see here now all the aspects in play death, fate, and time, and how these played a crucial aspect in how Ragnarok came to be, and why these were central concepts to the Vikings. 11. A New Beginning a common trait shared by the Norse myths with other religions would be the scenario of a catastrophic battle, and the world that comes after the apocalyptic battle. There are few sources of Norse mythology that discuss the aftermath of Ragnarok after Surt sets the cosmos ablaze with a single swing from his fiery blade. 11.1. The Aftermath of Ragnarok We go back to the concept that was outlined in Chapter 2 of this book, and what now comes to play in the concept of time as it relates to the Norsemen. We have taken note that to the Vikings, there is a cyclical approach to time, in that for every death, there is a rebirth, for every event that comes to pass, another will surpass it. Earlier in this book, we have spoken of the Vikings' idea of the afterlife, where the courage and valor of a person are the determinants to see which of the afterlives the soul of the deceased would head to. In this new world, the afterlife has been reimagined, with a true paradise and an underworld reserved for the truly wicked and not for those who have died thus ignominiously. With the occurrence of Ragnarok and the destruction of Valhalla by the forces of Loki, we would wonder now what happens in the new world that would rise from the ashes of Ragnarok. We touch upon first the fate of humanity, the inhabitants of Midgard, and perhaps the unwitting victims of the devastation that occurred in Ragnarok. 11.2. Leif and Lithrasser. Before Ragnarok took place, a man and woman safely secured themselves in the branches of Yggdrasil, which survived the onslaught of Surt's flame. This man and woman were named Leif, whose name was the Old Norse word for life, and his mate, Lithrasser, whose name meant she who is eager for life. They were destined by Norns to survive the catastrophe of Ragnarok, safely hidden within the boughs of the cosmic ash tree. They would remain untouched by the fires of Muspelheim, and they would be nourished by the dew that glistened from the leaves of Yggdrasil. They are believed to witness the entire process of birth, as they see the heavenly bodies reborn as the previous world crafted by Odin and his siblings sinks, while a new one rises. Once the cataclysm had subsided, Leif and Lithrasser were to emerge from the boughs of Yggdrasil, destined to repopulate the world and so restore the race of humans that Odin and his brothers had created. 11.3. The Norse Gods After Ragnarok In the previous section, we have touched upon the repopulation of humanity with Leif and Lithrasser. In this section, we now delve into the fates of the survivors of Ragnarok. Vidar, 
the son of Odin and the kindly giantess Grid, an ally of the gods, was among the survivors of Ragnarok, and it was he who avenged the death of his father when he strode through the carnage and ripped the Fenris wolf in half. Together with Vidar was his half-brother, Vali, the son of Odin, and the Ruthenian princess Rind, the subject of the prophecy that identified who would arise to even the score of the demise of Baldur. Mjolnir, the enchanted mallet, and the scourge of the giants remained intact after its master fell due to the wounds inflicted from his battle with Jormungand. Mjolnir was now borne by two masters, the sons of Thor by Jarn Saxa, Modi, and Magni. Odin's brothers had survived the catastrophe, Honor, Vili, and Lothar, they, the survivors of the first generation of the Aesir and the only ones who are directly descended from Bor and Besla. In what is perhaps the most bittersweet moment for Odin and Frigg, as no myth seems to detail what happened to the goddesses who formed part of the Aesinger, Baldur leading his blinded brother Hodor by the hand, walked at last once more in the new realm, resurrected from death. Before fate decreed her consumption by the wolves, Saul gave her mantle to a daughter who was to be more resplendent than her, and it was she who took up her mother's task and drove the new sun across the heavens to shine light upon the resurrected world. With this new light that shone upon the world, the darkness that pervaded the world since the death of Baldur finally vanished, and the new world became a paradise, a verdant vale where grain sprouted without the need for toil. The grass that sprouted upon the plains of Idaval, one of the remnants of Asgard, now trod upon by the survivors of Ragnarok. From the remnants of Asgard the survivors built a manor that was named Gimli, whose roof was inlaid with gold. Gimli was to be where the gods assembled at the end of the world, an assembly hall if you will, where all those who would reign over the new world lived in peace. Bramir was another mansion that rose in a place named Okolnir, where the cold never touched the world. From the mountains of Nidifjall, a land described as one that managed to survive Ragnarok's destruction, emerged the Sindri Hall. Sindri was translated to mean spark, and it is described as a gleaming gilded hall wherein dwells the good and the righteous, who shall be known by the name of their dwelling. The underworld still exists, on the shore lined with corpses, Nistrand, in the realm of Niflheim, all its entrances were constructed toward the north, where it welcomed the icy winds that blew over the land. The walls of this grim hall were composed of snakes, whose heads projected into the hall's interior to form a river of poison that gushed throughout the hall. This was a land reserved for those who employed murder and theft, and their ultimate fate was to be fodder for the serpent Nidhogg, who had survived Ragnarok. The surviving gods found in the grass of Idaval game pieces, crafted of gold, the same ones that the earlier generation of Aesir had once used to amuse themselves in their halls. It is from this point that they realized that they are now truly in a world of peace, without the threat of giants to tear this hard-won tranquility asunder. It is here that the aftermath of Ragnarok shares more similarities with other religions, as it is believed that from the heavens will descend a mighty god, an omnipotent one, who shall rule over the new earth and usher in an eternal time where justice and virtuousness are the norms for life. 11.4. Conclusion Without due comparison to the messianic appearance of a new god at the end of times, after an apocalyptic battle, it is observed that this scene sees various interpretations, such as the return of King Arthur from the land of Avalon, the rise of Kalkun in Hindu myth, among other comparisons, and even the Book of Revelation in Christianity. Here, it can be observed that the cyclical aspect of time now applies to the Norsemen, as after the death of a previous world, there would come a time where there is the resurrection, and thus, a time for rebirth. In this new world, however, we find very little detail about the myths that abound, in the likelihood, that the stories may have been lost over the centuries past, or simply because the time predicted by these myths has yet to come to pass. However you can visualize it now, a fertile and verdant land, where peace reigns above all, where there are no more battles and no more bloodshed. However, with the presence of the new underworld, the possibility arises that there are less than virtuous inhabitants in the new world, and that their destiny is to be consumed by a serpent. This changes the perspective of the afterlife, as many similarities to the domain of hell are thrown away, as without the need for the Ain Harriar anymore, and subsequently Valhalla, it can be assumed now that those who would perish but have led virtuous lives can now enjoy a true paradise in this new world, with the underworld being the afterlife of those who were truly wicked. Baldur in this chapter has at last been resurrected, 
and in some myths, it was said that he would rule over the new Asgard that arose from the ashes of Ragnarok. Other myths believe that this new and more powerful god, as stated in the earlier section, would be the one to rule over the new world. Regardless of the account, the Vikings believe that it is then that peace and justice become the laws of the land, and there would be no more suffering in this new world. 12. Conclusion Throughout the three sections of this book, we have taken you on a journey that explores the fascinating lives of the Vikings. We've examined how their practices and beliefs, as deduced from archaeological expeditions in Scandinavia, have carried on into modern society. We've delved into their portrayal of women, as well as the names they gave to our days of the week. We've even encountered familiar words that are now part of the English language, which were originally the names of the deities that the Vikings revered. Through our exploration, we've come to truly grasp how far the Viking culture spread throughout the world, and the impetus that drove them to traverse unknown worlds in pursuit of knowledge, much like Odin himself. We've discovered that far from being merely battle-born warriors, they were also capable of creating structures and myths that explain the forces of nature, such as seasonal changes and other events that shape their world. Our journey has taken us throughout the Nine Realms, where we've heard the stories of its inhabitants and their roles in Ragnarok. From the builders of weapons that aided the gods in their victories, to the fulfillment of prophecies, and the betrayals that led to the loss of weapons and alliances, we've gained a deep understanding of the Viking way of life. Thank you for choosing to read my book. Your support and interest in this subject matter are greatly appreciated and it encourages me to continue growing and exploring the rich history of the Vikings.